Section 1 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2 by Robert Burton. Section 1. The Second Partition. The Cure of Melancholy. Partition 2, Section 1, Member 1. Unlawful Cures Rejected. Inveterate melancholy, howsoever it may seem to be a continuate, inexorable disease, hard to be cured, accompanying them to their graves, most part, as Montanus observes, yet many times it may be helped, even that which is most violent, or at least, according to the same author, it may be mitigated and much eased. Nil desperandum. It may be hard to cure, but not impossible for him that is most grievously affected, if he but willing to be helped. Upon this good hope I will proceed, using the same method in the cure, which I have formerly used in the rehearsing of the causes. First general, then particular, and those according to their several species. Of these cures some be lawful, some again unlawful which though frequent, familiar, and often used, yet justly censured, and to be controverted. At first, whether by these diabolical means which are commonly practised by the devil and his ministers, sorcerers, witches, magicians, etc., by spells, cabalistic words, charms, characters, images, amulets, ligatures, filters, incantations, etc., this disease and the like may be cured, and if they may, whether it be lawful to make use of them, those magnetical cures, or for our good to seek after such means in any case. The first, whether they can do any such cures, is questioned amongst many writers, some affirming, some denying. Valesius, Malleus Maleficarum, Hernius, Caelius, Del Rio, Wierus, Libanius, Lavater, Holbrenner the Lutheran in Pistorium, Polydor, Tandlerus, Lemnius, Hippocrates, and Avicenna amongst the rest deny that spirits or devils have any power over us, and refer all with Pomponatius of Padua to natural causes and humours. Of the other opinion are Bodinus de Monomantiae, Arnoldus, Marcellus Empiricus, Pistorius, Paracelsus, Agrippa, Marcilius Vicinus, Galliotus, Jovianus Pontanus, Strabo, Leo Suavius, Goclenius, Oswaldus Crollius, Ernestus Burgravius, etc. Cardan brings many proofs out of Ars Notoria, and Solomon's decayed works. Old Hermes, Artefius, Costaban Luca Picatrix, etc., that such cures may be done. They can make fire it shall not burn, fetch back thieves or stolen goods, show their absent faces in a glass, Make serpents lie still, stanch blood, salve guts, epilepsies, biting of mad dogs, toothache, melancholy, et omnia mundi mala. Make men immortal, young again, as the Spanish Marquis is said to have done by one of his slaves, and some which jugglers in China maintain still, as Tregaltius writes, that they can do by their extraordinary skill in physic, and some of our modern chemists by their strange limbecks, by their spells, philosopher's stones, and charms. Many doubt, saith Nicholas Torellus, whether the devil can cure such diseases he hath not made, and some flatly deny it. Howsoever, common experience confirms to our astonishment that magicians can work such feats, and that the devil without impediment can penetrate through all the parts of our bodies, and cure such maladies by means to us unknown. Danaeus, in his tract De Sortiariis, subscribes to this of Torellus. Erastus de Lamiis maintaineth as much, and so do most divines, out of their excellent knowledge and long experience, they can commit agentes compatientibus, colligeri semina rerum, eaqua materiae applicare, as Augustine infers de Civitate Dei, et de Trinitatis, Book 3, Chapters 7 and 8 they can work stupendous and admirable conclusions. 
we see the effects only, but not the causes of them. Nothing so familiar as to hear of such cures. Sorcerers are too common, cunning men, wizards, and white witches, as they call them, in every village, which if they be sought unto, will help almost all infirmities of body and mind. Servatores in Latin, and they have commonly St. Catherine's wheel printed in the roof of their mouth, or in some other part about them. Resistant in cantorum prestigiis, Vesardus writes, morbus astagis motus propulsant, etc. That to doubt of it any longer, or not to believe, were to run into that other sceptical extreme of incredulity, saith Torellus. Leo Suavius, in his comment upon Paracelsus, seems to make it an art, which ought to be approved. Pistorius and others stiffly maintain the use of charms, words, characters, etc. Ars vera est, sed pauci artifices reperiuntur. The art is true, but there be but a few that have skill in it. Marcellius Donatus proves out of Josephus eight books of antiquities, that Solomon so cured all the diseases of the mind by spells, charms, and drove away devils, and that Eleazar did as much before Vespasian. Langius holds Jupiter Menecrates, that did so many stupendous cures in his time, to have used this art, and that he was no other than a magician. Many famous cures are daily done in this kind. The devil is an expert physician, as Godelman calls him, and God permits oftentimes these witches and magicians to produce such effects, as Lavater chapter 3, book 8, part 3, chapter 1, Del Rio and others admit. Such cures may be done, and as Paracelsus stiffly maintains, they cannot otherwise be cured but by spells, seals, and spiritual physic. Arnoldus, Liber de Sigillis, breaks down the making of them. So does Rolandus and many others. Hoc posito, they can effect such cures. The main question is, whether it be lawful in a desperate case to crave their help, or ask a wizard's advice. Tis a common practice of some men to go first to a witch, and then to a physician. If one cannot, the other shall. Flecteri si nequiant superos acheronta movabunt. It matters not, saith Paracelsus, whether it be God or the devil, angels or unclean spirits cure him, so that he be eased. If a man fall into a ditch, as he prosecutes it, what matter is it whether a friend or an enemy help him out? And if I be troubled with such a malady, what care I whether the devil himself or any of his ministers by God's permission redeem me? He calls a magician, God's minister and his vicar, applying that of vos estis dii profanely to them, for which he is lashed by Erastus, part 1, folium 45. And elsewhere he encourageth his patients to have a good faith, a strong imagination, and they shall find the effects. Let divines say to the contrary what they will. He proves and contends that many diseases cannot otherwise be cured. Incantatione orti, incantatione curari debent. If they be caused by incantation, they must be cured by incantation. Constantinus, book 4, approves of such remedies. Bartolus, the lawyer, Peter Erodius, Salicatus Godefridus, with others of that sect, allow of them. Modo sint ad sanitatem quae a magis fiunt, secus non. So they be for the party's good, or not at all. But these men are confuted by Remigius, Bodinus, Godelmanus, Vieras, Del Rio, Erastus. All are divines, schoolmen, and such as write cases of conscience are against it. The scripture itself absolutely forbids it as a mortal sin. Leviticus chapters, chapters 18, 19, 20, Deuteronomy 18, etc., Romans 8, 19. Evil is not to be done that good may come of it. Much better it were for such patients that are so troubled to endure a little misery in this life than to hazard their soul's health for ever. And as Del Rio counselleth, much better die than be so cured. Some take upon them to expel devils by natural remedies, 
and magical exorcisms, which they seem to approve out of the practice of the primitive church, as that above cited of Josephus, Eleazar, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Augustine. Eusebius makes mention of such, and magic itself hath been publicly professed in some universities, as of old in Salamanca in Spain, and Krakow in Poland, but condemned, anno 1318, by the Chancellor and University of Paris. Our pontifical writers retain many of these adjurations and forms of exorcisms still in the church, besides those in baptism used. They exorcised meats, and such as are possessed, as they hold, in Christ's name. Read Hieronymus Mengus, chapter 3, Petrus Tereus, part 3, chapter 8. What exorcisms they prescribe, besides those ordinary means of fire, suffumigations, lights, cutting the air with swords, cap 57, herbs, odours, of which Tostatus treats, 2, chapter 16, Quaestio 43. You shall find many vain and frivolous superstitious forms of exorcisms among them, not to be tolerated or endured. End of section 1《ヴォルム2》Anatomy Volume of Melancholy, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2, by Robert Burton. Section 2. Partition 2, Section 1, Member 2. Lawful Cures, First from God. Being so clearly evinced, as it is, all unlawful cures are to be refused. It remains to treat of such, as are to be admitted, and those are commonly such which God has appointed, by virtue of stones, herbs, plants, meats, and the like, which are prepared and applied to our use, by art and industry of physicians, who are the dispensers of such treasures for our good, and to be honoured for necessity's sake. God's intermediate ministers, to whom in our infirmities we are to seek for help. Yet not so that we rely too much, or wholly upon them. A Joe Principium, we must first begin with prayer, and then use physic, not one without the other, but both together. To pray alone and reject ordinary means is to do like him in Aesop, that when his cart was stalled, lay flat on his back, and cried aloud, Help Hercules! But that was to little purpose, except, as his friend advised him, Rotis tute ipse anitaris. He whipped his horse's whistle, and put his shoulder to the wheel. God works by means, as Christ cured the blind man with clay and spittle. Orandum est, ut sit mens sana in corpore sano. As we must pray for health of body and mind, so we must use our utmost endeavours to preserve and continue it. Some kind of devils are not cast out, but by fasting and prayer, and both necessarily required, not one without the other. For all the physic we can use, art, excellent industry, is to no purpose without calling upon God. Nil juvat immensos cratero promittere montes. It is in vain to seek for help. Run, ride, except God bless you. Non siculi tapes, dulcem elaborabunt saporem, non animum citerave cantus, non domus et fundus, non eris acervus et auri, ae grotto possunt, domino deducere febris. With house, with land, with money, and with gold, the master's fever will not be controlled. We must use our prayer and physic both together, and so, no doubt, but our prayers will be available, and our physic take effect. Tis that Hezekiah practised, Second Kings 20. Luke the Evangelist, and which we are enjoined. Colossians 4, not the patient only, but the physician himself. Hippocrates, a heathen, required this in a good practitioner, and so did Galen in that tract of his. This a rule, 
which he does inculcate, and many others. Hyperius, in his first book, speaking of that happiness and good success which all physicians desire and hope for in their cures, tells them that it is not to be expected, except with a true faith they call upon God, and teach their patients to do the like. The Council of Lateran, Canon twenty second, decreed they should do so. The fathers of the church have still advised as much. Whatsoever thou takest in hand, says Gregory, let God be of thy counsel, consult with him, that healeth those that are broken in heart. Psalm one hundred forty and seven three, and bindeth up their sores. Otherwise, as the prophet Jeremiah, chapter forty six, eleven, denounced to Egypt, in vain shalt thou use many medicines, for thou shalt have no health. It is the same counsel which Comineus, that politic historiographer, gives to all Christian princes, upon occasion of that unhappy overthrow of Charles, Duke of Burgundy, by means of which he was extremely melancholy and sick to death, insomuch that neither physic nor persuasion could do him any good, perceiving his preposterous error belike, adviseth all great men in such cases, to pray first to God with all submission and penitency, to confess their sins, and then to use physic. The very same fault it was, which the prophet reprehends in Asa king of Judah, that he relied more on physic than on God, and by all means would have him to amend it. And it is a fit caution to be observed of all other sorts of men. The prophet David was so observant of this precept, that in his greatest misery and vexation of mind, he put this rule first in practice. Psalm 77, 3 When I am in heaviness, I will think on God. Psalm 86, 4 Comfort the soul of thy servant, for unto thee I lift up my soul. And verse 7 In the day of trouble will I call upon thee, for thou hearest me. Psalm 54, 1 Save me, O God, by thy name, etc. Psalm 82, Psalm Twenty, and it is the common practice of all good men. Psalm fifty seven thirteen. When their heart was humbled with heaviness, they cried to the Lord in their troubles, and he delivered them from their distress, and they have found good success in so doing, as David confesseth. Psalm thirty twelve. Thou hast turned my mourning into joy, thou hast loosed my sackcloth, and girded me with gladness. Therefore he advised all others to do the like. Psalm thirty one twenty four All these that trust in the Lord be strong, and he shall establish your heart. It is reported by Sudas, speaking of Hezekiah, that there was a great book of old, of King Solomon's writing, which contained medicines for all manner of diseases, and lay open still as they came into the temple. But Hezekiah, king of Jerusalem, caused it to be taken away, because it made the people secure to neglect their duty in calling and relying upon God, out of a confidence on those remedies. Minutius, that worthy consul of Rome, in an oration he made to his soldiers, was much offended with them, and taxed their ignorance, that in their misery called more on him than upon God. A general fault it is all over the world, and Minutius' speech concerns us all. We rely more on physic, and seek oftener to physicians than to God himself. As much faulty are they that prescribe, as they that ask, respecting wholly their gain, and trusting more to their ordinary receipts and medicines many times, than to him that made them. I would wish all patients in this behalf, in the midst of their melancholy, to remember that of Cyrocides, Ecclesiastes, one eleven and twelve. The fear of the Lord is glory and gladness and rejoicing. The fear of the Lord maketh a merry heart, and giveth gladness and joy and long life, and all such as prescribe physic, to begin in nomine dei, as Mesue did, to imitate Laelius Afonte Eugubinus, that in all his consultations still concludes with a prayer for the good success of his business. 
and to remember that of Credo, one of their predecessors, Fuge avaritium, et sine orationes, et invocationes dei, nihil facies, avoid covetousness, and do nothing without invocation upon God. End of section 2 Section 3 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2, by Robert Burton, Section 3 Partition 2, Section 1, Member 3 Whether it be lawful to seek to saints for aid in this disease. That we must pray to God, no man doubts. But whether we should pray to saints in such cases, or whether they can do us any good, it may be lawfully controverted. Whether their images, shrines, relics, consecrated things, holy water, medals, benedictions, those divine amulets, holy exorcisms, and the sign of the cross, be available in this disease. The papists on the one side stiffly maintain how many melancholy, mad, demoniacal persons are daily cured at St. Anthony's Church in Padua, at St. Vitus's in Germany, by Our Lady of Loreto in Italy, Our Lady of Sichem in the Low Countries. Quae et caecis lumen, aegris salutem, mortuis vitam, claudis gressum reddit, omnes morbos corporis, animi curat, et in ipsos demones imperium exercet. She cures halt, lame, blind, all diseases of body and mind, and commands the devil himself, saith Lipsius. Twenty-five thousand in a day come thither, quis nisi numen in illum locum sic induxit, who brought them? In oribus, in oculis omnium gesta, novae novitia, new news lately done, our eyes and ears are full of her cures, and who can relate them all? They have a proper saint, almost for every peculiar infirmity, for poison, gouts, agues, petronella, St. Romanus for such as are possessed, Valentine for the falling sickness, St. Vitus for madmen, etc., and as of old Pliny reckons up gods for all diseases, febri fanum de calcum est, Lilius Giraldus repeats many of her ceremonies, all affections of the mind were heretofore accounted gods, love and sorrow, virtue, honour, liberty, contumely, impudency, had their temples, tempests, seasons. Crepitus ventris, Deo vacuna, Deo cloacina. There was a goddess of idleness, a goddess of the draught, or jakes, prema, primunda, priapus, bawdy gods, and gods for all offices. Varro reckons up thirty thousand gods. Lucian makes Podagra the gout, a goddess, and assigns her priests and ministers, and melancholy comes not behind, for as Augustine mentioneth, book 4, De Civitate Dei, chapter 9, there was of old Angerona Dea, and she had her chapels and feasts, to whom, saith Macrobius, they did offer sacrifice yearly, that she might be pacified as well as the rest. Tis no new thing, you see this of papists, and in my judgment that old doting Lipsius might have fitter dedicated his pen after all his labours to this our goddess of melancholy than to his Virgo Halensis, and been her chaplain. It would have become him better, but he, poor man, thought no harm in that which he did, and will not be persuaded but that he doth well. He hath so many patrons and honourable precedents in the like kind that justify as much, as eagerly, and more than he there saith of his lady and mistress. Read but superstitious Costa, and Gretz's tract de Cruque, Laurentius Arcturus Dantius Bellamine, Del Rio, Gregorius Tolosanus, Strozius Cicognia, Tyreus, Hieronymus Mengus, and you shall find infinite examples of cures done in this kind, by holy waters, Relics, crosses, exorcisms, amulets, images, consecrated beads, etc. Baradius the Jesuit boldly gives it out that Christ's countenance and the Virgin Mary's would cure melancholy, 
if one had looked steadfastly on them. P. Morales, the Spaniard, in his book, confirms the same out of Carthusianus, and I know not whom, that it was a common proverb in those days for such as were troubled in mind to say, Iamus ad videndum filium mariae, let us see the son of Mary, as they now do post to St. Anthony's in Padua, or to St. Hilary's at Poitiers in France. In a closet of that church, there is at this day St. Hilary's bed to be seen, to which they bring all the madmen in the country, and after some prayers and other ceremonies, they lay them down there to sleep, and so they recover. It is an ordinary thing in those parts to send all their madmen to St. Hilary's cradle. They say the like of St. Tuberi in another place. Giraldus Cambrensis tells strange stories of St. Curicius's staff that would cure this and all other diseases. Others say as much, as Hospinian observes, of the three kings of Cologne, their names written in parchment and hung about a patient's neck with the sign of the cross will produce like effects. Read Lippomanus, or that golden legend of Jacobus de Voragine. You shall have infinite stories, or those new relations of our Jesuits in Japan and China, of Matthias, Riccius, Acosta, Loyola, Xavierus's life, etc. Jasper Belga, a Jesuit, cured a madwoman by hanging St. John's Gospel about her neck, and many such. Holy water did as much in Japan, etc. Nothing so familiar in their works as such examples. But we, on the other side, seek to God alone. We say with David, Psalm 46, 1, God is our hope and strength, and help in trouble, ready to be found. For their catalogue of examples, we make no other answer, but that they are false fictions, or diabolical illusions, counterfeit miracles. We cannot deny but that it is an ordinary thing on St. Anthony's Day in Padua, to bring diverse madmen and demoniacal persons to be cured. Yet we make a doubt whether such parties be so affected indeed, but prepared by their priests, by certain ointments and drams, to cozen the commonalty. As Hildesheim well says, the like is commonly practised in Bohemia, as Matthiolus gives us to understand in his preface to his comment upon Dioscorides. But we need not run so far for examples in this kind. We have a just volume published at home to this purpose. A declaration of egregious popish impostors to withdraw the hearts of religious men under the pretence of casting out devils, practised by Father Edmunds, alias Weston, a Jesuit, and diverse Romish priests, his wicked associates, with the several parties' names, confessions, examinations, etc., which were pretended to be possessed. But these are ordinary tricks only to get opinion and money, mere impostures. Aesculapius of old, that counterfeit god, did as many famous cures. His temple, as Strabo relates, was daily full of patients, and as many several tables, inscriptions, pendants, donaries, etc., to be seen in his church, as at this day Our Lady of Loretto's in Italy. It was a custom long since. Suspendisse potenti, Vestimenta Maris Deo, Horace, Odes, Book One, Ode Five. To do the like, in former times they were seduced and deluded as they are now. Tis the same devil still, called heretofore Apollo, Mars, Neptune, Venus, Aesculapius, etc., as Lactantius, Book Two, the Origine Erroris, Chapter Seventeen, observes. The same Jupiter and those bad angels are now worshipped and adored by the name of St. Sebastian, Barbara, etc. Christopher and George are come in their places. Our Lady succeeds Venus, as they use her in many offices. The rest are otherwise supplied, as Lavater writes, and so they are deluded. And God often winks at these impostures, because they forsake his word, and betake themselves to the devil, as they that do seek after holy water, crosses, etc. Bieris, Book 4, Chapter 3. What can these men plead for themselves more than those heathen gods? The same cures done by both, the same spirit that seduceth. But read more of the pagan gods' effects in Augustine de Civitate Dei, Book 10, Chapter 6, and of Aesculapius especially in Ticonia, Book 3, Chapter 8. 
or put case they could help, why should we rather seek to them than to Christ himself, since that he so kindly invites us unto him? Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will ease you. Matthew 11. And we know that there is one God, one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2, 5. Who gave himself a ransom for all men. We know that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. 1 John 2, 1. That there is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved, but by his, who is always ready to hear us, and sits at the right hand of God, and from whom we can have no repulse. Solis vult, solis potest, curat universos tanquam singulus, et unum quemque nostrum et solum. We are all as one to him, he cares for us all as one, and why should we then seek to any other but to him? End of section 3《Section Section Four of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume Two, by Robert Burton. Section Four. Partition Two, Section One, Member Four. Subsection One. Physician. Patient, physic. Of those diverse gifts which our Apostle Paul saith God hath bestowed on man, this of physic is not the least, but most necessary, and especially conducing to the good of mankind. Next, therefore, to God, in all our extremities, for of the Most High cometh healing, Ecclesiasticus 38, 2, we must seek to and rely upon the physician who is Manus Dei, saith Hierophilus, and to whom he hath given knowledge, that he might be glorified in his wondrous works. With such doth he heal men, and take away their pains. Ecclesiasticus 38, 6, 7 When thou hast need of him, let him not go from thee. The hour may come that their enterprises may have good success. Versiculum 13 it is not therefore to be doubted that if we seek a physician as we ought, we may be eased of our infirmities, such a one I mean as is sufficient and worthily so called, for there be many mountebanks, quacksalvers, empirics, in every street almost, and in every village, that take upon them this name, make this noble and profitable art to be evil spoken of and contempt, by reason of these base and illiterate artifices. But such a physician I speak of, as is approved, learned, skilful, honest, etc., of whose duty Wecker, Crato, Julius Alexandrinus, Hiernius, etc., treat at large. For this particular disease, him that shall take upon him to cure it, Paracelsus, will have to be a magician, a chemist, a philosopher, an astrologer. Thernesiris, Severinus the Dane, and some other of his followers, require as much. Many of them cannot be cured but by magic. Paracelsus is so stiff for those chemical medicines that in his cures he will admit almost of no other physic, deriding in the meantime Hippocrates, Galen, and all their followers. But magic, and all such remedies I have already censured, and shall speak of chemistry elsewhere. Astrology is required by many famous physicians, by Ficinus, Crato, Fernelius, doubted of and exploded by others. I will not take upon me to decide the controversy myself. Johannes Hercertus, Thomas Bodirius, and Maginus, in the preface to his mathematical physic, shall determine for me. Many physicians explode astrology in physic, saith he. There is no use of it. Unam artem a quasi temerarium insectantur, a gloriam sibi ab eus imperitia occupari. But I will reprove physicians by physicians that defend and profess it, Hippocrates, Galen, Aficena, etc., that count them butchers without it, homicidas medicos astrologiae ignaros, etc. 
Paracelsus goes farther, and will have his physician predestinated to this man's cure, this malady, and time of cure, the scheme of each geniture inspected, gathering of herbs, of administering, astrologically observed, in which Thernisiris and some iathromathematical professors are too superstitious in my judgment. Hellebore will help, but not always, not given by every physician, etc., but these men are too peremptory and self-conceited, as I think. But what do I do, interposing in that which is beyond my reach? A blind man cannot judge of colours, nor I peradventure of these things. Only thus much I would require, honesty in every physician, that he be not over-careless or covetous, harpy-like to make a prey of his patient. Carnificis namque est, as Wecker notes, inter ipsos cruciatus, ingens precium ex poscere, as a hungry surgeon often produces, and wire draws his cure, so long as there is any hope of pay. Non mesura cutem, nisi plena curus hirudo. Many of them, to get a fee, will give physic to every one that comes, when there is no cause, and they do so irritare silentum morbum, as Hiernius complains, stir up a silent disease, as it often followed out, which by good counsel, good advice alone, might have been happily composed, or by rectification of those six non-natural things otherwise cured. This is naturae bellum infer, to oppugn nature, and to make a strong body weak. Arnoldus, in his eight and eleven aphorisms, gives cautions against, and expressly forbiddeth it, a wise physician will not give physic but upon necessity, and first try medicinal diet, before he proceed to medicinal cure. In another place he laughs those men to scorn that think longus syrupis expugnare demones et animi phantasmata. They can purge fantastical imaginations and the devil by physic. Another caution is that they proceed upon good grounds, if so be there be need of physic, and not mistake the disease. They are often deceived by the similitude of symptoms, saith Hiernius, and I could give instance in many consultations wherein they have prescribed opposite physic. Sometimes they go too perfunctorily to work in not prescribing a just cause of physic. To stir up the humour and not to purge it doth often more harm than good. Montanus inveighs against such perturbations, that purge to the halves, tire nature, and molest the body to no purpose. Tis a crapped humour to purge, and as Laurentius calls this disease the reproach of physicians, Bizardus flagellum medicorum, their lesh, and for that cause more carefully to be respected. Though the patient be averse, said Laurentius, desire help and refuse it again, though he neglect his own health, it behoves a good physician not to leave him helpless. But most part they offend in that other extreme. They prescribe too much physic, and tire out their bodies with continual potions, to no purpose. Atheus, Tetra Biblos, second chapter, ninety, will have them by all means therefore to give some respite to nature, to leave off now and then. And Lilius a fonte Eugubinus, in his consultations, found it, as he there witnessed, often verified by experience, that after a deal of physic to no purpose, left to themselves, they have recovered. Tis that which Nicholas Piso, Donatus Automarus, still inculcate, dare requiem naturae, to give nature rest. Subsection 2. Concerning the Patient. When these precedent cautions are accurately kept, and that we have now got a skilful, an honest physician to our mind, if his patient will not be conformable, and content to be ruled by him, all his endeavours will come to no good end. Many things are necessarily to be observed and continued on the patient's behalf. First, that he be not too niggardly miserable of his purse, or think it too much he bestows upon himself, and to save charges and dangerous health. The Abderites, when they sent for Hippocrates, promised him what reward he would, all the gold they had, if all the city were gold, he should have it. Naaman the Syrian, when he went into Israel to Elisha to be cured of his leprosy, took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, 
and ten changes of raiment. Two kings five. Another thing is that out of bashfulness he do not conceal his grief. If aught trouble his mind, let him freely disclose it. Stultorum incurata pudor malus ucracelat. By that means he procures to himself much mischief, and runs into a greater inconvenience. He must be willing to be cured, and earnestly desire it. Pars sanitatis velle sanare fuit. Seneca. It is a part of his cure to wish his own health, and not to defer it too long. Qui blandiendo dulce nutrivit malum, so recusat fere cot subiit jugum. He that by cherishing a mischief doth provoke, too late at last refuseth to cast off his yoke. Helleborum frustra cum jam cutis aegra tumebit, poscentes vidias, venienti ocurite morbo. When the skin swells, to seek it to appease, with hellebore is vain, meet your disease. By this means, many times, or through their ignorance in not taking notice of their grievance and danger of it, contempt, supine negligence, extenuation, wretchedness and peevishness, they undo themselves. The citizens, I know not of what city now, when rumour was brought their enemy were coming, could not abide to hear it, and when the plague begins in many places, and they certainly know it, they command silence and hush it up. But after they see their foes now marching to their gates and ready to surprise them, they begin to fortify and resist when it is too late. When the sickness breaks out and can be no longer concealed, then they lament their supine negligence. It is no otherwise with these men. And often out of prejudice, a loathing and distaste of physic, they had rather die or do worse than take any of it. Barbarous immanity, Melanchthon terms it, and folly to be deplored, so to contemn the precepts of health, good remedies, and voluntarily to pull death and many maladies upon their own heads. Though many again are in that other extreme too profuse, suspicious, and jealous of their health, too apt to take physic on every small occasion, to aggravate every slender passion, imperfection, impediment. If their finger do but ache, run— ride, send for a physician, as many gentlewomen do, that are sick without a cause, even when they will themselves upon every toy or small discontent, and when he comes they make it worse than it is, by amplifying that which is not. Hieronymus Capivaccius sets it down as a common fault of all melancholy persons to say their symptoms are greater than they are, to help themselves, and which Mercurialis notes, Concilium 53, to be more troublesome to their physicians than other ordinary patients, that they may have change of physic. A third thing to be required in a patient is confidence, to be of good cheer, and have sure hope that his physician can help him. The Mascon, the Arabian, requires likewise in the physician himself that he be confident he can cure him, otherwise his physic will not be effectual, and promise withal that he will certainly help him, make a belief so at least. Galeotus gives this reason— because the form of health is contained in the physician's mind, and as Galen holds confidence and hope to be more good than physic, he cures most in whom most are confident. Axiochus, sick almost to death, at the very sight of Socrates, recovered his former health. Paracelsus assigns it for an only cause why Hippocrates was so fortunate in his cures, not for any extraordinary skill he had but because the common people had a most strong conceit of his worth. To this of confidence we may add perseverance, obedience, and constancy, not to change his physician, or dislike him upon every toy, for he that so doth, saith Janus Damascan, or consults with many, falls into many errors, or that useth many medicines. It was a chief caveat of Seneca to his friend Lucilius, that he should not alter his physician, or prescribe physic, Nothing hinders health more. A wound can never be cured that has several plasters. Crato, Concilium 186, taxeth all melancholy persons of this fault. It is proper to them, if things fall not out to their mind, and that they have not present ease, to seek another, and another, as they do commonly that have sore eyes, 
twenty one after another, and they still promise all to cure them, try a thousand remedies. And by this means they increase their malady, make it most dangerous and difficult to be cured. They try many, saith Montanus, and profit by none. And for this cause, Concilium 24, he enjoins his patient before he take him in hand, perseverance and sufferance, for in such a small time no great matter can be effected, and upon that condition he will administer physic. Otherwise all his endeavour and counsel would be to small purpose. And in his thirty-first counsel for a notable matron, he tells her, if she will be cured, she must be of a most abiding patience, faithful obedience, and singular perseverance. If she remit or despair, she can expect or hope for no good success. Concilium 230, for an Italian abbot, he makes it one of the greatest reasons why this disease is so incurable, because the parties are so restless and impatient, and will therefore have him that intends to be eased to take physic not for a month, a year, but to apply himself to their prescriptions all the days of his life. Last of all, it is required that the patient be not too bold to practice upon himself, without an improved physician's consent, or to try conclusions if he read a receipt in a book. For so, many grossly mistake, and do themselves more harm than good. That which is conducing to one man, in one case, the same time is opposite to another. An ass and a mule went laden over a brook, the one with salt, the other with wool. The mule's pack was wet by chance. The salt melted, his burden the lighter, and he thereby much eased. He told the ass, who, thinking to speed as well, wet his pack likewise at the next water, but it was much the heavier, he quite tired. So one thing may be good and bad to several parties, upon diverse occasions. Many things, saith Penotus, are written in our books, which seem to the reader to be excellent remedies, but they that make use of them are often deceived, and take for physic poison. I remember in Valeriola's observations a story of one John Baptist, a Neapolitan, that finding by chance a pamphlet in Italian, written in praise of Hellebore, would needs adventure on himself, and took one dram for one scruple, and had not he been sent for, the poor fellow had poisoned himself. From whence he concludes, out of the Messina's second and third aphorisms, that without exquisite knowledge to work out of books is most dangerous. How unsavoury a thing it is to believe writers, and take upon trust, as this patient perceived by his own peril. I could recite such another example of mine own knowledge, of a friend of mine, that finding a receipt in Brasevola, would needs take hellebore and substance, and try it on his own person. But had not some of his familiars come to visit him by chance, he had by his indiscretion hazarded himself. Many such I have observed. These are those ordinary cautions which I should think fit to be noted, and he that shall keep them, as Montanus saith, shall surely be much eased, if not thoroughly cured. Subsection 3. Concerning Physic. Physic itself in the last place is to be considered, for the Lord hath created medicines of the earth, and he that is wise will not abhor them. Ecclesiasticus 38, 4, Versiculus 7. Of such doth the apothecary make a confection, etc. Of these medicines there be diverse and infinite kinds, plants, metals, animals, etc., and those of several natures, some good for one, hurtful to another, some noxious in themselves, corrected by art, very wholesome and good, simples, mixed, etc., and therefore left to be managed by discreet and skilful physicians, and then supplied to man's use. To this purpose they have invented method, and several rules of art, to put these remedies in order for their particular ends. Physic, as Hippocrates defines it, is naught else but addition and subtraction, and as it is required in all other diseases, so in this of melancholy it ought to be most accurate, it being, as Mercurialis acknowledges, so common an affection in these our times, and therefore fit to be understood. Several prescripts and methods I find in several men, some take upon them to cure all maladies with one medicine, severally applied, as that panacea, aurum potabile, so much controverted in these days, herba solus, etc. 
Paracelsus reduceth all diseases to four principal heads, to whom Severinus, Ravelascus, Leo Suavius, and others adhere and imitate. Those are leprosy, gout, dropsy, falling sickness, to which they reduce the rest. As to leprosy, ulcers, itches, furfurs, scaps, etc. To gout, stone, colic, toothache, headache, etc. To dropsy, eggs, jaundice, cachexia, etc. To the falling sickness belong palsy, vertigo, cramps, convulsions, incubus, apoplexy, etc. If any of these four principal be cured, saith Ravalescus, all the inferior are cured, and the same remedies commonly serve. But this is too general, and by some contradicted. For this peculiar disease of melancholy, of which I am now to speak, I find several cures, several methods and prescripts. They that intend the practic cure of melancholy, said Duretus, in his notes to Hilarius, set down nine peculiar scopes or ends. Savanarola prescribes seven especial canons. Elianus Montaltus, chapter 26, Faventinus in his Empirics, Hercules de Saxonia, etc., have their several injunctions and rules, all tending to one end. The ordinary is threefold, which I mean to follow. Diatetica, Pharmaceutica, and Chirurgica. Diet or living, Apothecary, Surgery, which Wecker, Crato, Guianarius, etc., and most prescribe, of which I will insist and speak in their order. End of section 4《セクション5 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Anatomy of Melancholy by Robert Burton. Section 5. Partition 2, Section 2, Member 1, Subsection 1. Diet rectified in substance. Diet. Diaetetica, victus, or living, according to Fuxius and others, comprehends those six non-natural things which I have before specified, are special causes, and being rectified, a sole or chief part of the cure. Johannes Arculanus, chapter 16 in 9 Rasis, accounts the rectifying of these six a sufficient cure. Guianerius, Tractatus 15, Chapter 9, calls them Propriam et Primam Curam, the principal cure. So doth Montanus, Crato, Mercurialis, Altomarus, etc., first to be tried. Lemnius names them the hinges of our health, no hope of recovery without them. Reinerus Solenander, in his seventh consultation for a Spanish young gentlewoman, that was so melancholy she abhorred all company, and would not sit at table with her familiar friends, prescribes this physic above the rest, no good to be done without it. Aretus, Book 1, Chapter 7, an old physician, is of opinion that this is enough of itself, if the party be not too far gone in sickness. Crato, in a consultation of his for a noble patient, tells him plainly that if his highness will keep at a good diet, he will warrant him his former health. Montanus, Concilium 27, for a nobleman of France, admonisheth his lordship to be most circumspect in his diet, or else all his other physic will be to small purpose. The same injunction I find verbatim in Julius Caesar, Claudinus, Scotii, Trallianus. Lilius, a fonte aegubinus, often brags that he hath done more cures in this kind by rectification of diet than all other physic besides. So that in a word I may say to most melancholy men, as the fox said to the weasel, that could not get out of the garner, Macra cavum repetes, quem macra supisti. The six non-natural things caused it, and they must cure it. Which, howsoever I treat of, as proper to the meridian of melancholy, yet nevertheless, that which is here said with him in Tully, though writ especially for the good of his friends at Tarentum and Sicily, yet it will generally serve most other diseases, and help them likewise, if it be observed. Of these six non-natural things, the first is diet, 
properly so called, which consists in meat and drink, in which we must consider substance, quantity, quality, and that opposite to the precedent. In substance, such meats are generally commended, which are moist, easy of digestion, and not apt to engender wind, not fried, nor roasted, but sod, saith Velasquez, Altomarus, Piso, etc., hot and moist, and of good nourishment. Crato, Consilium 21, Book 2, admits roast meat, if the burnt and scorched superficies, the brown we call it, be pared off. Salvianus, Book 2, Chapter 1, cries out on cold and dry meats. Young flesh and tender is approved, as of kid, rabbits, chickens, veal, mutton, capons, hens, partridge, pheasant, quails, and all mountain birds, which are so familiar in some parts of Africa, and in Italy, and as Dublinius reports, the common food of boors and clowns in Palestine. Galen takes exception at mutton, but without question he means that rammy mutton, which is in Turkey and Asia Minor, which have those great fleshy tails, of forty-eight pounds weight, as Vertomanus witnesseth. The lean of fat meat is best, and all manner of broth, and pottage, with borage, lettuce, and such wholesome herbs, are excellent good, especially of a cock boiled, all spoon meat. Arabians commend brains, but Laurentius, chapter 8, accepts against them, and so do many others. Eggs are justified as a nutritive wholesome meat. Butter and oil may pass, but with some limitation. So Crato confines it, and to some men sparingly at set times, or in sauce, and so sugar and honey are approved. All sharp and sour sauces must be avoided, and spices, or at least seldom used and so saffron sometimes in broth may be tolerated. But these things may be more freely used, as the temperature of the party is hot or cold, or as he shall find inconvenience by them. The thinnest, whitest, smallest wine is best, not thick nor strong, and so of beer the middling is fittest. Bread of good wheat, pure, well purged from the bran, is preferred. Laurentius, chapter 8, would have it kneaded with rain-water, if it may be gotten. Water Pure, thin, light water by all means use, of good smell and taste, like to the air in sight, such as is soon hot, soon cold, and which Hippocrates so much approves, if at least it may be had. Rain-water is purest, so that it fall not down in great drops, and be used forthwith, for it quickly putrefies. Next to it, fountain-water that riseth in the east, and runneth eastward, from a quick running spring, from flinty, chalky, gravelly grounds, and the longer a river runneth, it is commonly the purest, though many springs do yield the best water at their fountains. The waters in hotter countries, as in Turkey, Persia, India, within the tropics, are frequently purer than ours in the north, more subtle, thin, and lighter, as our merchants observe, by four ounces in a pound, pleasanter to drink, as good as our beer, and some of them, as Coespis in Persia, preferred by the Persian kings before wine itself. Clitorio quicunque sitim defunte levarit, vina fugit gaudetque meris abstemius undis. Many rivers, I deny not, are muddy still, white, thick, like those in China, Nile in Egypt, Tiber at Rome, but after they be settled two or three days, defecate and clear, very commodious, useful and good. Many make use of deep wells, as of old in the Holy Land, lakes, cisterns, when they cannot be better provided, to fetch it in carts or gondolas as in Venice, or camel's backs, as at Cairo in Egypt. Ratzevillius observed eight thousand camels daily there, employed about that business. Some keep it in trunks, as in the East Indies, made four square with descending steps. And tis not amiss, for I would not have any one so nice as that Grecian Callis, sister to Nicephorus, emperor of Constantinople, and married to Dominicus Silvius, duke of Venice, that out of incredible wantonness, communu aqua uti nolebat, would use no vulgar water. But she died tanta, said mine author, fertidissimi puris copia, of so fulsome a disease that no water could wash her clean. Plato would not have a traveller lodge in a city that is not governed by laws, or hath not a quick stream running by it. Illud enum animum hoc corrumpit valetudinum. One corrupts the body, the other the mind. 
but this is more than needs. Too much curiosity is not, in time of necessity any water is allowed. Howsoever, pure water is best, and which, as Pindar's holds, is better than gold. An especial ornament it is, and very commodious to a city, according to Vegetius, when fresh springs are included within the walls, as at Corinth. In the midst of the town almost there was Arx Altissima Scatens Fontibus, a goodly mount full of fresh water springs. If nature afford them not, they must be had by art. It is a wonder to read of those stupid aqueducts, and infinite cost has been bestowed in Rome of old, Constantinople, Carthage, Alexandria, and such populous cities, to convey good and wholesome waters. Read Frontinus, Lipsius, Plinius, Book Three, Chapter Eleven. Strabo in his geography. That aqueduct of Claudius was most eminent, fetched upon arches fifteen miles, every arch one hundred and nine feet high. They had fourteen such other aqueducts, besides lakes and cisterns, seven hundred as I take it. Every house had private pipes and channels to serve them for their use. Peter Gillius, in his accurate description of Constantinople, speaks of an old cistern which he went down to see, three hundred and thirty-six feet long, one hundred and eighty feet broad, built of marble, covered over with archwork, and sustained by three hundred and thirty-six pillars, twelve feet asunder, and in eleven rows, to contain sweet water. Infinite cost in channels and cisterns, from Nilus to Alexandria, hath been formerly bestowed to the admiration of these times. Their cisterns, so curiously cemented and composed, that a beholder would take them to be all of one stone. When the foundation is laid, and cistern made, their house is half built. That Segovian aqueduct in Spain is much wondered at in these days, upon three rows of pillars, one above another, conveying sweet water to every house. But each city, almost, is full of such aqueducts. Amongst the rest, he is eternally to be commended that brought that new stream to the north side of London at his own charge. And Mr. Otho Nicholson, founder of our water-works, an elegant conduit in Oxford. So much have all times attributed to this element, to be conveniently provided of it. Although Galen hath taken exceptions at such waters which run through leaden pipes, ob cerusam que in is generatur, for that unctuous cerus which causeth dysenteries and fluxus. Yet, as Alzarius Crucius of Gana well answers, it is opposite to common experience. If that were true, most of our Italian cities, Montpellier in France, with infinite others, would find this inconvenience, but there is no such matter. For private families, in what sort they should furnish themselves, let them consult with Petrus Crescentius, De Agricultura, Book 1, Chapter 4, Pamphilius, Hirelacus, and the rest. Amongst fishes, those are most allowed of that live in gravelly or sandy waters, pikes, perch, trout, gudgeon, smelts, flounders, etc. Hippolytus Salvianus takes exception at carp, but I dare boldly say with Dubravius, it is an excellent meat, if it come not from muddy pools, that it retain not an unsavoury taste. Enarchius Marinus is much commanded by Oribatius, Aetius, and most of our late writers. Crato, Concilium 21, Book 2, censures all manner of fruits as subject to putrefaction, yet tolerable at some times, after meals, at second course, they keep down vapours and have their use. Sweet fruits are best, as sweet cherries, plums, sweet apples, permains, and pippins, which Laurentius extols as having a peculiar property against this disease, and Plater magnifies omnibus modis appropriata conveniunt, but they must be corrected for their windiness. Ripe grapes are good, and raisins of the sun, muskmelons well corrected, and sparingly used. Figs are allowed, and almonds blanched. Tralianus discommends figs, Salvianus olives and capers, which others especially like of, and so of pistic nuts. Montanus and Mercurialis, out of Avanzar, admit peaches, pears, and apples baked after meals, only corrected with sugar and any seed, or fennel seed, and so they may be profitably taken, because they strengthen the stomach and keep down vapours. The like may be said of preserved cherries, plums, marmalade of plums, quinces, etc., but not to drink after them. Pomegranates, lemons, oranges are tolerated if they be not too sharp. Crato will admit of no herbs but borage, bugloss, endive, fennel, aniseed, balm, 
Calenius and Arnoldus tolerate lettuce, spinach, beets, etc. The same Crato will allow no roots at all to be eaten. Some approve of potatoes, parsnips, but all corrected for wind. No raw salads, but as Laurentius prescribes, in broth. And so Crato commends many of them, or to use borage, hops, baum, steeped in their ordinary drink. Avenzar magnifies the juice of a pomegranate if it be sweet, and especially rose water, which he would have to be used in every dish, which they put in practice in those hot countries about Damascus, where, if we may believe the relations of Vetamanus, many hogsheads of rose water are to be sold in the market at once. It is in so great request with them. Subsection 2. Diet rectified in quantity. Man alone, saith Cardan, eats and drinks without appetite, and useth all his pleasure without necessity, animae vitio, and thence come many inconveniences unto him. For there is no meat whatsoever, thought otherwise wholesome and good, but if unseasonably taken, or immoderately used, more than the stomach can well bear, it will engender crudity, and do much harm. Therefore Crato adviseth his patient to eat but twice a day, and that at his set meals, by no means to eat without an appetite, or upon a full stomach, and to put seven hours' difference between dinner and supper. Which rule, if we did observe in our colleges, it would be much better for our health. But custom, that tyrant, so prevails, that contrary to all good order and rules of physic, we scarce admit of five. If after seven hours' tarrying he shall have no stomach, let him defer his meal, or eat very little at his ordinary time of repast. This very counsel was given by Prosper Calenus to Cardinal Cassius, labouring of this disease, and Platerus prescribes it to a patient of his to be most severely kept. Guianerius admits of three meals a day, but Montanus ties him precisely to two, and as he must not eat overmuch, so he may not absolutely fast, for as Celsus contends, Book 1, Jacinus 15, in Nine Rases, repletion and inanition may both do harm in two contrary extremes. Moreover, that which he doth eat must be well chewed, and not hastily gobbled, for that causeth crudity and wind, and by all means to eat no more than he can well digest. Some think, said Trincavelius, the more they eat, the more they nourish themselves. Eat and live, as the proverb is, not knowing that only repairs man which is well concocted, not that which is devoured. Melancholy men most part have good appetites, but ill digestion, and for that cause they must be sure to rise with an appetite, and that which Socrates and Desarius the physicians and Macrobius so much require, St. Hiram enjoins Rusticus to eat and drink no more than will satisfy hunger and thirst. Lessius, the Jesuit, holds twelve, thirteen, or fourteen ounces, or in our northern countries sixteen at most, for all students, weaklings, and such as lead an idle sedentary life, of meat, bread, etc., a fit proportion for a whole day, and as much or little more of drink. Nothing pesters the body and mind sooner than to be still fed, to eat and ingurgitate beyond all measure, as many do. By overmuch eating and continual feasts, they stifle nature and choke up themselves, which, had they lived coarsely, or like galley slaves been tied to an oar, might have happily prolonged many fair years. A great inconvenience comes by variety of dishes, which causeth the precedent distemperature, than which, saith Avicenna, nothing is worse, to feed on diversity of meats, or overmuch, sartorius-like, in lucum cenare, and as commonly they do in Muscovy and Iceland, to prolong their meals all day long, or all night. Our northern countries offend especially in this, and we in this island, Ampliter viventes in prandiis et canis, as Polydor notes, are most liberal feeders, but are our own hurt. Persicos odi puer apparatus, excessive meat breatheth sickness, and gluttony causeth choleric diseases. By surfeiting many perish, but he that dieth it himself prolonged his life. Ecclesiasticus, thirty seven, twenty nine, thirty. We account it a great glory for a man to have his table daily furnished with variety of meats. But here the physician, he pulls thee by the ear as thou sittest, and telleth thee that nothing can be more noxious to thy health than such variety and plenty. Temperance is a bridle of gold, and he that can use it aright, 
Ego non sumis viris cum paro, sed similimum deo judico, is liker a god than a man. For as it will transform a beast to a man again, so it will make a man a god. To preserve thine honour, health, and to avoid therefore all those inflations, torments, obstructions, crudities, and diseases that come by a full diet, the best way is to eat sparingly of one or two dishes at most, to have ventrum bene moratum, as Seneca calls it, to choose one of many, and to feed on that alone, as Crato adviseth his patient. The same counsel Prosper Calenus gives to Cardinal Cassius to use a moderate and simple diet, and though his table be jovially furnished by reason of his state and guests, yet for his own part to single out some one savoury dish and feed on it. The same is inculcated by Crato, Concilium 9, Book 2, to a noble personage affected with this grievance. He would have his highness to dine or sup alone, without all his honourable attendants and courtly company, with a private friend or so, a dish or two, a cup of Rhenish wine, etc. Montanus, Concilium 24, for a noble matron, enjoins her one dish, and by no means to drink between meals. The like, Concilium 229, or not to eat till he be in hungry, which rule Berengarius did most strictly observe, as Hilbertus writes in his life, Cui non fuit unquam ante sitim potus, nec cibus ante famem, and which all temperate men do constantly keep. It is a frequent solemnity still used with us when friends meet or to go to the alehouse or tavern. They are not sociable otherwise, and if they visit one another's houses, they must both eat and drink. I reprehend it not moderately used, but to some men nothing can be more offensive. They had better, I speak it with St. Ambrose, pour so much water in their shoes. It much avails likewise to keep good order in our diet, so eat liquid things first, broth, fish, and such meats as are sooner corrupted in the stomach. Harder meats of digestion must come last. Crato would have the supper less than the dinner, which Cardan disallows and that by the authority of Galen, and for four reasons he will have the supper biggest. I have read many treatises to this purpose. I know not how it may concern some few sick men, but for my part generally for all, I should subscribe to that custom of the Romans to make a sparing dinner and a liberal supper. All their preparation and invitation was still at supper, no mention of dinner. Many reasons I could give, but when all is said pro and con, Cardin's rule is best, to keep that we are accustomed unto, though it be naught, and to follow our disposition and appetite in some things is not amiss. To eat sometimes of a dish which is hurtful, if we have an extraordinary liking to it. Alexander Severus loved hares and apples above all other meats, as Lampridius relates in his life. One pope pork, another peacock, etc. What harm came of it? I conclude, our own experience is the best physician. That diet which is most propitious to one is often pernicious to another. Such is the variety of palates, humours, and temperatures. Let every man observe, and be a law unto himself. Tiberius, in Tacitus, did laugh at all such, that thirty years of age would ask counsel of others concerning matters of diet. I say the same. These few rules of diet he that keeps shall surely find great ease and speedy remedy by it. It is a wonder to relate that prodigious temperance of some hermits, anchorites, and fathers of the church. He that shall but read their lives, written by Hiram, Athanasius, etc., how abstemious heathens have been in this kind, those curae and Fabritiae, those old philosophers, as Pliny records, Book 11, Xenophon, Book 1, De Vita Socrates, emperors and kings, as Nicephorus relates of Mauritius, Ludovicus Pius, etc., and that admirable example of Ludovicus Cornarus, a patrician of Venice, cannot but admire them. This have they done voluntarily and in health. What shall these private men do that are visited with sickness, and necessarily enjoined to recover, and continue their health? It is a hard thing to observe a strict diet, et qui medici vivit, misere vivit, as the saying is, quale hoc ipsum eret vivere, his si privatus fueris as good be buried as so much the bard of his appetite. Excessit medicina malum. The physic is more troublesome than the disease, so he complained in the poet, so thou thinkest. Yet he that loves himself will easily endure this little misery, to avoid a greater inconvenience. 
e malis minimum, better do this than do worse. And as Tully holds, better be a temperate old man than a lascivious youth. Tis the only sweet thing, which he adviseth, so to moderate ourselves, that we may have senectutem in juventute, et in juventute senectutem. Be youthful in our old age, state in our youth, discreet and temperate in both. End of section 5《セクション6 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2, by Robert Burton. Section 6. Partition 2, Section 2, Member 2. Retention and Evacuation Rectified. I have declared in the causes what harm costiveness hath done in procuring this disease. If it be so noxious, the opposite must needs be good, or mean at least, as indeed it is, and to this cure necessarily required. Maxima conducit, saith Mantaltus, chapter 27. It very much avails. Altomaus, chapter 7, commends walking in a morning into some fair green pleasant fields. But by all means, first, by art or nature, he will have these ordinary excrements evacuated. Piso calls it beneficium ventris, the benefit, help, or pleasure of the belly, for it doth much ease it. Laurentius, chapter 8, Crato, Concilium 21, book 2, prescribes it once a day at least. Where nature is defective, art must supply, by those lenative electuaries, suppositories, Condite prunes, turpentine, clisters, as shall be shown. Prosper Calinus, liber de atra bile, commends clisters in hypochondriacal melancholy, still to be used as occasion serves. Peter Namanda, in a consultation of his pro hypochondriaco, will have his patient continually lose, and to that end sets down there many forms of potions and clisters. Mercurialis, Concilium 88, If this benefit come not of its own accord, prescribes clisters in the first place. So doth Montanus, Concilium 24, Concilia 31 and 229, he commends turpentine to that purpose. The same he ingeminates, Concilium 230, for an Italian abbot. It is very good to wash his hands and face often, to shift his clothes, to have fair linen about him, to be decently and comely attired, for so does Fiziant. Nastiness defiles and dejects any man that is so voluntarily, or compelled by want. It dulleth the spirits. Baths are either artificial or natural. Both have their special uses in this malady, and as Alexander supposeth, Book 1, Chapter 16, yield as speedy a remedy as any other physic whatsoever. Aetius would have them daily used, as Sedua Balnea. Galen cracks how many several cures he hath performed in this kind by use of baths alone, and Rufus pills, moistening them which are otherwise dry. Rasis makes it a principal cure, tota cura sit in humectando, to bathe and afterwards anoint with oil. Jason Pretensis, Laurentius, chapter 8, and Montanus set down their peculiar forms of artificial baths. Crato, Concilium 17, book 2, Commands mallows, chamomile, violets, borage to be boiled in it, and sometimes fair water alone, and in his following counsel, balneum aqua dulcis solum sepissime profuisse compertum habemus. So doth Fuchsius, Book 1, Chapter 33, Frisimilica, 2, Concilium 42, in Trincavelius. Some beside herbs prescribe a ram's head and other things to be boiled. Fernelius, Concilium 44, will have them used ten or twelve days together, to which he must enter fasting and so continue in a temperate heat, and after that frictions all over the body. Lelius Igubinus, Concilium 142, and Christophorus Ereris, in a consultation of his, hold once or twice a week sufficient to bathe, the water to be warm, not hot, for fear of sweating. Felix Plata, Observationis Liber 1, For a melancholy lawyer, will have lotions of the head still joined to these baths, and with a lay wherein capital herbs have been boiled. 
Laurentius speaks of baths of milk, which I find approved by many others. And still after bath, the body to be anointed with oil of bitter almonds, of violets, new or fresh butter, capon's grease, especially the backbone, and then lotions of the head, and brocations, etc. These kinds of baths have been in former times much frequented, and diversely varied, and are still in general use in those eastern countries. The Romans had their public baths very sumptuous and stupend, as those of Antoninus and Diocletian. Pliny, Book 36, said there were an infinite number of them in Rome, and mightily frequented, some bathed seven times a day, as Commodus the emperor is reported to have done, usually twice a day, and they were after anointed with most costly ointments. Rich women bathed themselves in milk, some in the milk of five hundred she-asses at once. We have many ruins of such baths found in this island, among those paritains and rubbish of old Roman towns. Lipsius, Rosinus, Scott of Antwerp, and other antiquaries tell strange stories of their baths. Gilius reckons up 155 public baths in Constantinople, of fair building. They are still frequented in that city by the Turks of all sorts, men and women, and all over Greece, and those hot countries, to absturge belike that fulsomeness of sweat to which they are there subject. Bespequius, in his epistles, is very copious in describing the manner of them, how their women go covered, a maid following with a box of ointment to rub them. The richer sort have private baths in their houses. The poorer go to the common, and are generally so curious in this behalf that they will not eat nor drink until they have bathed, before and after meals some, and will not make water, but they will wash their hands, or go to stool. Leo Afer, Book 3, makes mention of one hundred several baths at Fez in Africa, most sumptuous, and such as have great revenues belonging to them. Buxtorf, Chapter 14, Synagoga Judaica, speaks of many ceremonies amongst the Jews in this kind. They are very superstitious in their baths, especially women. Natural baths are praised by some, discommended by others, but it is in a diverse respect. Marcus consulted about baths condemns them for the heat of the liver, because they dry too fast, and yet by and by, in another counsel for the same disease, he approves them, because they cleanse by reason of the sulphur, and would have their water to be drunk. Aretheus, chapter 7, commends alum baths above the rest, and Mercurialis, Considium 88, those of Luca in that hypochondriacal passion. He would have his patient tarry there fifteen days together, and drink the water of them, and to be bucketed, or have the water poured on his head. John Baptista, Sylvaticus, 64, commands all the baths in Italy, and drinking of their water, whether they be iron, alum, sulphur, so doth Hercules of Saxonia. But in that they cause sweat and dry so much, he confines himself to hypochondriacal melancholy alone, excepting that of the head and the other. Trincavelius, Concilium 14, Book 1, prefers those Perectan baths before the rest, because of the mixture of brass, iron, alum, and Concilium 35, Book 3, for a melancholy lawyer, and Concilium 36, in that hypochondriacal passion, the baths of Aquaria, and 36 Concilium, the drinking of them. Frisimilica, consulted amongst the rest in Trincavilius, Concilium 42, Book 2, prefers the waters of Epona, before all artificial baths whatsoever in this disease, and would have one nine years affected with hypochondriacal passions fly to them as to a holy anchor. Of the same mind is Trincavelius himself there, and yet both put a hot liver in the same party for a cause, and sent him to the waters of St. Helen, which are much hotter. Montanus Concilium 230 magnifies the Caldirinian baths, and Concilia 237 and 239 he extorted to the same, but with this caution, that the liver be outwardly anointed with some coolness, that it be not overheated. But these baths must be warily frequented by melancholy persons, or if used, to such as are very cold of themselves. For as Cabelius concludes of all Dutch baths, and especially of those of Baden, they are good for all cold diseases, not for choleric, hot and dry, and all infirmities proceeding of choler, inflammations of the spleen and liver. Our English baths, as they are hot, must needs incur the same censure. But D. Turner of old and D. Jones have written at large of them. Of cold baths I find little or no mention in any physician, 
some speak against them. Cardan alone out of Agathinus commands bathing in fresh rivers and cold waters, and advises all such as mean to live long to use it, for it agrees with all ages and complexions, and is most profitable for hot temperatures. As for sweating, urine, bloodletting by hemorrhoids, or otherwise, I shall elsewhere more opportunely speak of them. Immoderate Venus, in excess, as it is a cause, or in defect, so moderately used to some parties an only help, a present remedy. Peter Forestus calls it aptissimum remedium, a most apposite remedy, remitting anger and reason that was otherwise bound. Avicenna, or Abasius, contend out of Ruffus and others, that many madmen, melancholy, and labouring of the falling sickness, have been cured by this alone. Montaltus, chapter 27, the Melancholica, will have it drive away sorrow and all illusions of the brain, to purge the heart and brain from ill smokes and vapours that offend them, and if it be omitted, as Velescus supposeth, it makes the mind sad, the body dull and heavy. Many other inconveniences are reckoned up by Mercatus and by Rodericus a Castro in their tracts the Melancholia Virginum et Monialium, Obseminis retentionem savium sepe moniales et virgines. But as Platerus adds, Si nubant sanantur, they rave single, and pine away, much discontent, but marriage mends all. Marcellus Donatus tells a story to confirm this out of Alexander Benedictus, of a maid that was mad. Ob mensus inhibitos, cum in officinam mirituriam incidisset, a quindecem viris eadem nocte compressa, mensium largo profluvio, quod pluribus annis ante constiterat, non sine magno pudore mane menti restituta discessit. But this must be warily understood, for, as Arnoldus objects, quid coitus ad melancholicum succum? What affinity have these two? Except it be manifest that superabundance of seed or fullness of blood be a cause, or that love or an extraordinary desire of Venus have gone before, or that, as Lodovicus Mercatus accepts, they be very flatuous, and have been otherwise accustomed unto it. Montaltus, chapter 27, will not allow of moderate Venus to such as have the gout, palsy, epilepsy, melancholy, except they be very lusty and full of blood. Lodovicus Antonius, in his chapter of Venus, forbids it utterly to all wrestlers, ditchers, labouring men, etc. Vicinus and Marsilius Cognatus puts Venus, one of the five mortal enemies of a student. It consumes the spirits and weakeneth the brain. Haliabas, the Arabian, and Jason Pretensis make it the fountain of most diseases, but most pernicious to them who are cold and dry. A melancholy man must not meddle with it, but in some cases. Plutarch, in his book, De Sanitate Tuenda, accounts of it as one of the three principal signs and preservers of health, temperance in this kind, to rise with an appetite, to be ready to work, and abstain from venery. Tria saluperima are three most healthful things. We see their opposites, how pernicious they are to mankind, as to all other creatures they bring death and many feral diseases. Immodicis brevis est aetos et rara senectus. Aristotle gives instance in sparrows, which are parum vivacus obsalacitatem, short-lived because of their salacity, which is very frequent, as Scopius and Priapus will better inform you. The extremes being both bad, the medium is to be kept, which cannot easily be determined. Some are better able to sustain, such as are hot and moist, phlegmatic, as Hippocrates insinuateth, some strong and lusty, well fed like Hercules, Proculus the Emperor, lusty Laurence, Prostibulum Feminae Messalina, the Empress, that by philters and such kind of lascivious meats use all means to enable themselves, and brag of it in the end, Confori mutas enim oxidi vero paucas per ventrum vidisti, as that Spanish Celestina merrily said, others impotent, of a cold and dry constitution, cannot sustain those gymnics without great hurt done to their own bodies, of which number, though they be very prone to it, are melancholy men for the most part. End of section 6 
Section 7 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2, by Robert Burton. Section 7. Partition 2, Section 2, Member 3, Part 1. Air Rectified, with a Digression of the Air. As a long-winged hawk, when he is first whistled off the fist, mounts aloft, and for his pleasure fetcheth many a circuit in the air, still soaring higher and higher, till he be come to his full pitch, and in the end, when the game is sprung, comes down amain, and stoops upon a sudden, so will I, having now come at last into these ample fields of air, wherein I may freely expatiate and exercise myself for my recreation, a while rove, wander round the world, mount aloft to those ethereal orbs and celestial spheres, and so descend to my former elements again. In which progress I will first see whether that relation of the friar of Oxford be true concerning those northern parts under the pole, if I meet Obiter with the wandering Jew, Elias Artifex, or Lucian's Icaromenippus, they shall be my guides, whether there be such four Euripes, and a great rock of lodestones, which may cause the needle in the compass still to bend that way, and what should be the true cause of the variation of the compass, is it a magnetical rock, or the pole star, as Cardan will, or some other star in the bear, as Marsilius Ficinus, or a magnetical meridian, as Maurolicus, well situs in Vena Terrae, as Agricola, or the nearness of the next continent, as Cabeus will, or some other cause, as Scaliger, Cortesius, Conimbricenses, Peregrinus contend, why at the Azores it looks directly north, otherwise not. In the Mediterranean or Levant, as some observe, it varies seven degrees by and by twelve, and then twenty-two, in the Baltic seas, near Raskeburg in Finland, the needle runs round if any ships come that way, though Martin Ridley write otherwise, that the needle near the pole will hardly be forced from his direction. Tis fit to be inquired whether certain rules may be made of it, and that which is more prodigious, the variation varies in the same place. Now taken accurately, tis so much, after a few years, quite altered from that it was, Till we have better intelligence, let our Dr. Gilbert and Nicholas Cabeus the Jesuit, that have both written great volumes of this subject, satisfy these inquisitors. Whether the sea be open and navigable by the pole arctic, and which is the likeliest way, that of Bartison the Hollander, under the pole itself, which for some reasons I hold best, or by Freytum Davis, or Nova Zembla, whether Hudson's discovery be true of a new-found ocean, any likelihood of Button's Bay in fifty degrees, Hubbard's Hope in sixty, that of Ut Ultra near Sir Thomas Rowe's welcome in northwest Fox, being that the sea ebbs and flows constantly there, fifteen foot in twelve hours, as our new cards inform us that California is not a cape but an island, and the west winds make the neap tides equal to the spring, or that there be any probability to pass by the Straits of Anian to China, by the promontory of Tabin. If there be, I shall soon perceive whether Marcus Polus the Venetian's narration be true or false, of that great city of Kinsay or Cambalu, whether there be any such places. As Matthaeus Riccius the Jesuit hath written, China and Cataya be all one, the great Cham of Tartary and the king of China be the same. Shuntain and Kinsai, and the city of Kambalu, be that new Peking, or such a wall four hundred leagues long to part China from Tartary, whether Presbyter John be in Asia or Africa. Marcus Polus Venetus puts him in Asia. The most received opinion is that he is emperor of the Abyssines, which of old was Ethiopia, now Nubia, under the equator in Africa, whether Guinea be an island or part of the continent, or that hungry Spaniard's discovery of Terra Australis Incognita, or Magellanica, 
be as true as that of Mercurius Britannicus, or his of Utopia, or his of Lucinia. And yet in likelihood it may be so, for without all question it being extended from the Tropic of Capricorn to the Circle Antarctic, and lying as it doth in the temperate zone, cannot choose but yield in time some flourishing kingdoms to succeeding ages, as America did unto the Spaniards. Shelton and Le Maire have done well in the discovery of the Straits of Magellan, in finding a more convenient passage to Mare Pacificum. Methinks some of our modern Argonauts should prosecute the rest. As I go by Madagascar, I would see that great bird, Rook, that can carry a man and horse or an elephant, with that Arabian phoenix described by Adricomius, see the pelicans of Egypt, those Scythian griffies in Asia, and afterwards in Africa examine the fountains of Nilus, whether Herodotus, Seneca, Pliny, Book 5, Chapter 9, Strabo, Book 5, give a true cause of his annual flowing, Pagafeta discourse rightly of it, or of Niger and Senegal, examine Cardan, Scaliger's reasons, and the rest. Is it from those Etesian winds, or melting of snow in the mountains under the equator, for Jordan yearly overflows when the snow melts in Mount Libanus, or from those great dropping perpetual showers which are so frequent to the inhabitants within the tropics, when the sun is vertical, and cause such vast inundations in Senegal, Maranyan, Orinoco, and the rest of those great rivers in Zona Torida, which have all commonly the same passions at set times, and by good husbandry and policy hereafter, no doubt may come to be as populous, as well tilled, as fruitful, as Egypt itself, or Cochin China. I would observe all those motions of the sea, and from what cause they proceed, from the moon, as the vulgar hold, or earth's motion, which Galileus, in the fourth dialogue of his system of the world, so eagerly proves and firmly demonstrates, or winds, as some will. Why, in that quiet ocean of Zur, in Mari Pacifico, it is scarce perceived, in our British seas most violent, in the Mediterranean and Red Sea so vehement, irregular, and diverse? Why the current in that Atlantic Ocean should still be in some places from, in some again towards the north, and why they come sooner than go, and so from Moabar to Madagascar in that Indian Ocean, the merchants come in three weeks, as Scaliger discusseth, they return scarce in three months, with the same or like winds, the continual current is from east to west whether Mount Athos, Pelion, Olympus, Ossa, Caucasus, Atlas, be so high as Pliny, Solinus, Mela, relate, above clouds, meteors, ubi nec aurae nec venti spirant, insomuch that they that ascend die suddenly very often, the air is so subtile. Twelve hundred and fifty paces high, according to that measure of Dicaearchus, or seventy-eight miles perpendicularly high, as Jacobus Mazonius expounding that place of Aristotle about the Caucasus, and as Blancanus the Jesuit contends out of Clavius and Nonius demonstrations de crepusculis, or rather thirty-two stadiums, as the most received opinion is, or four miles, which the height of no mountain doth perpendicularly exceed, and is equal to the greatest depths of the sea, which is, as Scaliger holds, fifteen hundred and eighty paces, others one hundred paces. I would see those inner parts of America, whether there be any such great city of Manoa or El Dorado, in that golden empire, where the highways are as much beaten, one reports, as between Madrid and Valladolid in Spain, or any such Amazons as he relates, or gigantic Patagones in Chica, with that miraculous mountain Ibu Yapab in the northern Brazil, cuius jugum sternitur in amoinissimam planitiam, etc., or that of Pariacaca, so high elevated in Peru. The peak of Tenerife, how high it is, seventy miles, or fifty, as Patricius holds, or nine, as Snellius demonstrates in his Eratosthenes. See that strange Tsirknitz Zerxi lake in Carniola, whose waters gush so fast out of the ground that they will overtake a swift horseman, and by and by with as incredible celerity are supped up. 
which Lazius and Venerus make an argument of the Argonauts sailing underground, and that vast den or hole called Esmelon in Muscovia, quae visitur horiendo hiatu, etc., which, if anything casually fall in, makes such a roaring noise that no thunder or ordnance or warlike engine can make the like. Such another is Gilbert's cave in Lapland, with many the like. I would examine the Caspian Sea, and see where and how it exonerates itself, after it hath taken in Volga, Yaxares, Oxus, and those great rivers, at the mouth of Obi, or where? What vent the Mexican lake hath, the Titicacan in Peru, or that circular pool in the Vale of Terapeia, of which Acosta, Book 3, Chapter 16, hot in a cold country, the spring of which boils up in the middle twenty foot square, and hath no vent but exhalation, and that of Mare Mortuum in Palestine, of Thrasymene at Perusium in Italy, the Mediterranean itself, for from the ocean at the Straits of Gibraltar there is a perpetual current into the Levant, and so likewise by the Thracian Bosphorus out of the Euxine or Black Sea, besides all those great rivers of Nile, Po, Rhone, etc. How is this water consumed, by the sun or otherwise? I would find out with Trajan the fountains of Danube, of Ganges, Oxus, see those Egyptian pyramids, Trajan's bridge, Grotto de Sibylla, Lucullus's fish-ponds, the temple of Nidrose, etc., and if I could, observe what becomes of swallows, storks, cranes, cuckoos, nightingales, redstarts, and many other kind of singing birds, waterfowls, hawks, etc. Some of them are only seen in summer, some in winter, some are observed in the snow, and at no other times. Each have their seasons. In winter not a bird is in Muscovy to be found, but at the spring, in an instant, the woods and hedges are full of them, saith Herbastein. How comes it to pass? Do they sleep in winter, like Gesner's alpine mice, or do they lie hid, as Olaus affirms, in the bottom of lakes and rivers, spiritum continentes, often so found by fishermen in Poland and Scandia, two together, mouth to mouth, wing to wing, and when the spring comes they revive again, or if they be brought into a stove, or to the fireside, or do they follow the sun, as Peter Martyr, Legat Babylonica, Book 2, manifestly convicts, out of his own knowledge? For when he was ambassador in Egypt, he saw swallows, Spanish kites, and many such other European birds, in December and January, very familiarly flying, and in great abundance, about Alexandria, ubi floridae tunc arbores ac viridaria. Or lie they hid in caves, rocks, and hollow trees, as most think, in deep tin mines or sea cliffs, as Mr. Carew gives out. I conclude of them all, for my part, as Munster doth of cranes and storks. Whence they come, whither they go, in compertum ad hoc, as yet we know not. We see them here, some in summer, some in winter. Their coming and going is sure in the night. In the plains of Asia, saith he, the storks meet on such a set day. He that comes last is torn in pieces, and so they get them gone. Many strange places, Isthmi, Euripi, Chersonese, creeks, havens, promontories, straits, lakes, baths, rocks, mountains, places and fields, where cities have been ruined or swallowed, battles fought, creatures, sea monsters, remora, etc., minerals, vegetals. Zoophytes were fit to be considered in such an expedition, and amongst the rest that of Harbastein's tartar lamb, Hector Boethius's goose-bearing tree in the orchards, to which Cardan, Book 7, Chapter 36, De Rerum Varietate, subscribes. Vertomanus's wonderful palm, that fly in Hispaniola, that shines like a torch in the night, that one may well see to write those spherical stones in Cuba, which nature hath so made, and those like birds, beasts, fishes, crowns, swords, saws, pots, etc., usually found in the metal mines in Saxony, about Mansfield, and in Poland, near Nokau and Palukia, as Munster and others relate. Many rare creatures and novelties each part of the world affords, 
Amongst the rest, I would know for a certain whether there be any such men, as Leo Suavius, in his comment on Paracelsus, De Sanitate Tuenda, and Gaginus records in his description of Muscovy, that in Lucomoria, a province in Russia, lie fast asleep as dead all winter from the 27th of November, like frogs and swallows, benumbed with cold, but about the 24th of April, in the spring, they revive again, and go about their business. I would examine that demonstration of Alexander Picolomineus, whether the earth's superficies be bigger than the seas, or that of Archimedes be true, the superficies of all water is even. Search the depth, and see that variety of sea monsters and fishes, mermaids, seamen, horses, etc., which it affords, or whether that be true which Jordanus Brunus scoffs at, that if God did not detain it, the sea would overflow the earth by reason of his higher sight, and which Josephus Blancanus, the Jesuit, in his interpretation on those mathematical places of Aristotle, foolishly fears, and in a just tract proves by many circumstances, that in time the sea will waste away the land, and all the globe of the earth shall be covered with waters. Resum teniatis amici? What the sea takes away in one place, it adds in another. Methinks he might rather suspect the sea should in time be filled by land, trees grow up, carcasses, etc., that all devouring fire, omnia de warans et consumens, will soon cover and dry up the vast ocean with sand and ashes. I would examine the true seat of that terrestrial paradise, and where Ophir was whence Solomon did fetch his gold from Peruana, which some suppose, or that Aurea Cersonesus, as Dominicus Niger, Arias, Montanus, Goropius, and others will. I would censure all Plinys, Salinuses, Strabo's, Sir John Mandeville's, Olaus Magnus's, Marcus Polus's lies, correct those errors in navigation, reform cosmographical charts, and rectify longitudes, if it were possible not by the compass, as some dream, with Mark Ridley in his treatise of magnetical bodies, chapter 43, for, as Cabeus fully resolves, there is no hope thence. Yet I would observe some better means to find them out. I would have a convenient place to go down with Orpheus, Ulysses, Hercules, Lucian's Menippus, at St. Patrick's Purgatory, at Trophonius's Den, Hecla in Iceland, Etna in Sicily, to descend and see what is done in the bowels of the earth. Do stones and metals grow there still? How come fir-trees to be digged out from tops of hills, as in our mosses and marshes all over Europe? How come they to dig up fish-bones, shells, beams, ironworks, many fathoms underground, and anchors in mountains far remote from all seas? Anno 1460, at Bern in Switzerland, Fifty fathom deep a ship was digged out of a mountain, where they got metal ore, in which were forty-eight carcasses of men, with other merchandise. That such things are ordinarily found in tops of hills, Aristotle insinuates in his meteors, Pomponius Mella in his first book, De Numidia, and familiarly in the Alps, saith Blancanus the Jesuit, the like is to be seen. Came this from earthquakes, or from Noah's flood, as Christians suppose, or is there a vicissitude of sea and land, as Anaximenes held of old? The mountains of Thessaly would become seas, and seas again mountains. The whole world belike should be new-moulded, when it seemed good to those all-commanding powers, and turned inside out, as we do haycocks in harvest, top to bottom, or bottom to top, or, as we turn apples to the fire, move the world upon his centre. That which is under the poles now should be translated to the equinoctial, and that which is under the torrid zone to the circle arctic and antarctic another while, and so be reciprocally warmed by the sun. If the worlds be infinite, and every fixed star a sun, with his compassing planets, as Brunus and Campanella conclude, Cast three or four worlds into one, or else of one world make three or four new, as it shall seem to them best. To proceed, if the earth be 21,500 miles in compass, its diameter is 7,000 from us to our antipodes, and what shall be comprehended in all that space? What is the centre of the earth? 
Is it pure element only, as Aristotle decrees, inhabited, as Paracelsus thinks, with creatures whose chaos is the earth, or with fairies, as the woods and waters, according to him, are with nymphs, or as the air with spirits? Dionysiodorus, a mathematician in Pliny, that sent a letter ad superos, after he was dead, from the centre of the earth, to signify what distance the same centre was from the superficies of the same, viz. 42,000 stadiums, might have done well to have satisfied all these doubts. Or is it the place of hell, as Virgil in his Aenides, Plato, Lucian, Dante, and others poetically describe it, and as many of our divines think? In good earnest, Antony Ruska, one of the society of that Ambrosian College in Milan, in his great volume, De Inferno, Book 1, Chapter 47, is stiff in this tenet, tis a corporeal fire-toe, as he there disputes. Whatsoever philosophers write, saith Surius, there be certain mouths of hell, and places appointed for the punishment of men's souls, as at Hecla in Iceland, where the ghosts of dead men are familiarly seen, and sometimes talk with the living. God would have such visible places, that mortal men might be certainly informed, that there be such punishments after death, and learn hence to fear God. Crantius subscribes to this opinion of Surius, so doth Colorus, chapter 2, Liber de Immortalitate Animae, out of the authority belike of St. Gregory, Durand, and the rest of the schoolmen, who derive as much from Etna in Sicily, Lipari, Hera, and those sulfurious Vulcanian islands, making Terra del Fuego, and those frequent volcanoes in America, of which Acosta, Book 3, Chapter 24, that fearful Mount Hecklebirg in Norway, an especial argument to prove it, where lamentable screeches and howlings are continually heard, which strike a terror to the auditors. Fiery chariots are commonly seen to bring in the souls of men in the likeness of crows, and devils ordinarily go in and out. Such another proof is that place near the pyramids in Egypt by Cairo, as well to confirm this as the resurrection mentioned by Cornmanus, Camerarius, Bredenbachius, and some others, where once a year dead bodies arise about March and walk, after a while hide themselves again. Thousands of people come yearly to see them, but these and such like testimonies others reject as fables, illusions of spirits, and they will have no such local known place, more than Styx or Phlegethon, Pluto's court, or that poetical Infernus where Homer's soul was seen hanging on a tree, etc., to which they ferried over in Charon's boat, or went down at Hermione in Greece, compendiaria ad Infernos via, which is the shortest cut, quia nullum a mortuis naulum eu loci exposcunt, saith Gerbelius, and besides there were no fees to be paid. Well then, is it hell, or purgatory, as Bellamine, or Limbus Patrum, as Galucius will, and as Rusca will, for they have made maps of it, or Ignatius's parlour. Virgil, sometimes Bishop of Saltburg, as Aventinus, anno 745, relates, by Bonifacius, Bishop of Mentz, was therefore called in question, because he held Antipodes, which they made a doubt whether Christ died for, and so by that means took away the seat of hell, or so contracted it, that it could bear no proportion to heaven, and contradicted that opinion of Austin, Basil, Lactantius, that held the earth round as a trencher, whom Acosta and common experience more largely confute, but not as a ball, and Jerusalem, where Christ died, the middle of it, or Delos, as the fabulous Greeks feigned, because when Jupiter let two eagles loose, to fly from the world's ends east and west, they met at Delos. But that scruple of Bonifacius is now quite taken away by our latter divines. Franciscus Ribera, in chapter 14, Apocalypsis, will have hell a material and local fire, in the centre of the earth, two hundred Italian miles in diameter, as he defines it out of those words, Exiwit sanguis de terra, per stadia mille sexcenta, etc. But Lessius, book 13, De Moribus Divinis, chapter 24, will have this local hell far less, one Dutch mile in diameter, all filled with fire and brimstone 
because, as he there demonstrates, that space, cubically multiplied, will make a sphere able to hold eight hundred thousand millions of damned bodies, allowing each body six foot square, which will abundantly suffice. Cum certum sit, inquit, facta subductione, non futuros centies mille milliones damnandorum. But if it be no material fire, as Thomas, Bonaventure, Sonquinas, Voscius, and others argue, it may be there, or elsewhere, as Keckerman disputes. For sure, somewhere it is, certum est alicubi, etsi definitus circulus non assignatur. I will end the controversy in Augustine's words, better doubt of things concealed than to contend about uncertainties, where Abraham's bosom is and hell fire, wix a mansuetis a contentiosis nunquam invenitur, scarce the meek the contentious shall never find. If it be solid earth, tis the fountain of metals, waters, which by his innate temper turns air into water, which springs up in several chinks to moisten the earth's superficies, and that in a tenfold proportion, as Aristotle holds, or else these fountains come directly from the sea, by secret passages, and so made fresh again, by running through the bowels of the earth, and are either thick, thin, hot, cold, as the matter or minerals are by which they pass, or, as Peter Martyr and some others hold, from abundance of rain that falls, or from that ambient heat and cold, which alters that inward heat, and so, per consequence, the generation of waters. Or else it may be full of wind, or a sulfurious innate fire, as our meteorologists inform us, which sometimes breaking out causeth those horrible earthquakes, which are so frequent in these days, in Japan, China, and oftentimes swallow up whole cities. Let Lucian's Menippus consult with or ask of Tiresias. If you will not believe philosophers, he shall clear all your doubts when he makes a second voyage. End of section 7《セクション8 of The Anatomy of Melancholy Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for further information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org The Anatomy of Melancholy Volume 2 by Robert Burton Section 8 Partition 2 Section 2 Member 3 Part 2 In the meantime, let us consider of that which is sub dio, and find out a true cause, if it be possible, of such accidents, meteors, alterations, as happen above ground. Whence proceed that variety of manners, and a distinct character, as it were, to several nations. Some are wise, subtile, witty, others dull, sad, and heavy, some big, some little, as Tully de Fato, Plato in Timaio, Vegetius and Bodine prove at large, some soft and some hardy, barbarous, civil, black, dun, white. Is it from the air, from the soil, influence of stars, or some other secret cause? Why doth Africa breed so many venomous beasts? Ireland, none. Athens, owls. Crete, none. Why hath Daulis and Thebes no swallows? So Pausanias informeth us, as well as the rest of Greece. Ithaca, no hares, Pontus, asses, Scythia, swine. Whence comes this variety of complexions, colours, plants, birds, beasts, metals, peculiar almost to every place? Why so many thousand strange birds and beasts, proper to America alone, as Acosta demands, Book 4, Chapter 36, Were they created in the six days, or ever in Noah's ark? If there, why are they not dispersed and found in other countries? It is a thing, saith he, hath long held me in suspense. No Greek, Latin, Hebrew ever heard of them before, and yet as differing from our European animals as an egg and a chestnut, and, which is more, kine, horses, sheep, etc., 
till the Spaniards brought them, were never heard of in those parts. How comes it to pass that in the same sight, in one latitude, to such as are perioiki, there should be such difference of soil, complexion, colour, metal, air, etc.? The Spaniards are white, and so are Italians, when, as the inhabitants about Caput Bonai Spei, are blackamoors, and yet both are light distant from the equator. Nay, they that dwell in the same parallel lines with these negroes, as about the Straits of Magellan, are white-coloured, and yet some in Presbyter John's country, in Ethiopia, are done. They in Zeilan and Malabar, parallel with them, again black. Manamotapa in Africa and St. Thomas Isle are extreme hot, both under the line, coal black their inhabitants, whereas in Peru they are quite opposite in colour, very temperate or rather cold, and yet both alike elevated. Moscow in 53 degrees of latitude extreme cold, as those northern countries usually are, having one perpetual hard frost all winter long and in fifty-two degrees latitude, sometimes hard frost and snow all summer, as Buttons Bay, etc., or by fits, and yet England, near the same latitude, and Ireland, very moist, warm, and more temperate in winter than Spain, Italy, or France. Is it the sea that causeth this difference, and the air that comes from it? Why then is Ister so cold, near the Euxine, Pontus, Bithynia, and all Thrace, Frigidas regiones, Maginus calls them, and yet their latitude is but forty-two, which should be hot. Kevira, or Nova Albion, in America, bordering on the sea, was so cold in July that our Englishmen could hardly endure it. At Norenberga, in forty-five latitude, all the sea is frozen ice, and yet in a more southern latitude than ours. New England and the island of Cambriel Cocos which that noble gentleman Mr. Vaughan, or Orpheus Jr., describes in his Golden Fleece, is in the same latitude with Little Britain in France, and yet their winter begins not till January, their spring till May, which search he accounts worthy of an astrologer. Is this from the easterly winds, or melting of ice and snow dissolved within the circle arctic? or that the air being thick is longer before it be warm by the sunbeams, and once heated like an oven will keep itself from cold. Our climes breed lice, Hungary and Ireland, Mali, Audiunt in this kind. Come to the Azores, by a secret virtue of that air they are instantly consumed, and all our European vermin almost, saith Ortelius. Egypt is watered with Nilus not far from the sea, and yet there it seldom or never rains. Rhodes, an island of the same nature, yields not a cloud, and yet our islands ever dropping and inclining to rain. The Atlantic Ocean is still subject to storms, but in Del Zur, or Mare Pacifico, seldom or never any. Is it from the tropic stars, Apertio Portarum, in the Dodecamoriae's or constellations, the moon's mansions, such aspects of planets, such winds, or dissolving air, or thick air, which causeth this, and the like differences of heat and cold? Bodin relates of a Portugal ambassador that, coming from Lisbon to Danzig in Spruce, found greater heat there than at any time at home. Don Garcia de Silva, legate to Philip the Third, King of Spain, residing at Ispahan in Persia, 1619, in his letter to the Marquis of Bedmar, makes mention of greater cold in Ispahan, whose latitude is 31 degrees, than ever he felt in Spain, or any part of Europe. The torrid zone was by our predecessors held to be uninhabitable, but by our modern travellers found to be most temperate, bedewed with frequent rains and moistening showers. The breeze and cooling blasts in some parts, as Acosta describes, most pleasant and fertile. Arica, in Chile, is by report one of the sweetest places that ever the sun shined on. Olympus Terrae, a heaven on earth, how incomparably do some extol Mexico in Nova Hispania, Peru, Brazil, etc. 
in some again hard, dry, sandy, barren, a very desert, and still in the same latitude. Many times we find great diversity of air in the same country, by reason of the sight to seas, hills or dales, want of water, nature of soil and the like. As in Spain, Aragon is aspera et sicca, harsh and evil inhabited. Estremadura is dry, sandy, barren most part, extreme hot by reason of his plains. And Lucia another paradise, Valencia a most pleasant air and continually green, so is it about Granada. On the one side fertile plains, on the other continual snow to be seen all summer long on the hilltops that their houses in the alps are three quarters of the year covered with snow who knows not that tenerife is so cold at the top extreme hot at the bottom mons atlas in africa libanus in palestine with many such tantos inter ardores fidos nivibus tacitus calls them and radzivillus epistola two folium twenty seven yields it to be far hotter there than in any part of italy Tis true, but they are highly elevated, near the middle region, and therefore cold, ob paucam solarium radiorum refractionem, as Serarius answers. In the heat of summer, in the king's palace, in Escurial, the air is most temperate, by reason of a cold blast, which comes from the snowy mountains of Sierra de Cadarama, hard by, when, as in Toledo, it is very hot, so in all other countries. The causes of these alterations are commonly by reason of their nearness, I say, to the middle region. But this diversity of air, in places equally situated, elevated and distant from the pole, can hardly be satisfied with that diversity of plants, birds, beasts, which is so familiar with us. With Indians, everywhere, the sun is equally distant, the same vertical stars, the same irradiations of planets, aspects, like, the same nearness of seas, the same superficies, the same soil, or not much different. Under the equator itself, amongst the Sierras, Andes, Llanos, as Herrera, Light, and Acosta contend, there is tam mirabilis et inopinata varietas, such variety of weather, ut merito exerceat ingenia that no philosophy can yet find out the true cause of it. When I consider how temperate it is in one place, saith Acosta, within the Tropic of Capricorn, as about La Plata, and yet hard by at Potosi, in that same altitude, mountainous alike, extreme cold, extreme hot in Brazil, etc. Hic ego, saith Acosta, philosophiam Aristotelis meteorologicam vehementeririsi, cum etc. When the sun comes nearest to them, they have great tempests, storms, thunder and lightning, great store of rain, snow, and the foulest weather. When the sun is vertical, their rivers overflow, the morning fair and hot, noonday cold and moist, all which is opposite to us. How comes it to pass? Scaliger, Poetices, Book 3, Chapter 16, discourseth thus of this subject. How comes, and wherefore is, this temeraria siderum dispositio, this rash placing of stars, or, as Epicurus will, fortuita, or accidental? Why are some big, some little? Why are they so confusedly, unequally situated in the heavens, and set so much out of order? In all other things nature is equal, proportionable, and constant. There be justae dimensiones et prudens partium dispositio, as in the fabric of man, his eyes, ears, nose, face, members are correspondent. Cur non idem coelo opere omnium pulcherimo. Why are the heavens so irregular? Neque paribus molibus, neque paribus intervalis. Whence is this difference? Diversos, he concludes, efficere locorum genius to make diversity of countries, soils, manners, customs, characters, and constitutions among us, ut quantum vicinia ad caritatem addat, sidera distrahant ad perniciem, 
and so by this means fluio vel monte distincti sunt dissimiles. The same places almost shall be distinguished in manners. But this reason is weak and most insufficient. The fixed stars are removed since Ptolemy's time twenty six degrees from the first of Aries, and if the earth be immovable, as their sight varies, so should countries vary, and diverse alterations would follow. But this we perceive not, as in Tully's time with us in Britain, Caelum visu foidum, et in quo facile generantur nubes, etc., tis so still, wherefore Bodine, Theatrum Natura, book two and some others will have all these alterations and effects immediately to proceed from those genii spirits angels which rule and domineer in several places they cause storms thunder lightning earthquakes ruins tempests great winds floods etc the philosophers of conimbra will refer this diversity to the influence of that empyrean heaven for some say the eccentricity of the sun is come nearer to the earth than in Ptolemy's time. The virtue, therefore, of all vegetals is decayed, men grow less, etc. There are that observe new motions of the heavens, new stars, palantia sidera, comets, clouds, call them what you will, like those Medician, Bourbonian, Austrian planets lately detected, which do not decay, but come and go, rise higher and lower, hide and show themselves amongst the fixed stars, amongst the planets, above and beneath the moon, at set times, now nearer, now farther off, together, asunder, as he that plays upon a sackbut by pulling it up and down alters his tones and tunes do they their stations and places though to us undiscerned and from those motions proceed as they conceive diverse alterations clavius conjectures otherwise but they be but conjectures above damascus in caeli syria is a paradise by reason of the plenty of waters impromptu causa est and the deserts of arabia barren because of rocks rolling seas of sands and dry mountains quod in aquosa saith adricomius montes habens asperos saxosos praecipites horroris et mortis speciem praeseferentes uninhabitable therefore of men birds beasts void of all green trees plants and fruits a vast rocky horrid wilderness which by no art can be manured tis evident bohemia is cold for that it lies all along to the north but why should it be so hot in egypt or there never rain why should those etesian and northeastern winds blow continually and constantly so long together in some places at set times one way still in the dog days only here perpetual drought there dropping showers here foggy mists there a pleasant air here terrible thunder and lightning at such set seasons here frozen seas all the year there open in the same latitude to the rest no such thing nay quite opposite is to be found sometimes as in peru on the one side of the mountain it is hot, on the other cold, here snow, there wind, with infinite such. Fromundus, in his meteors, will excuse or solve all this by the sun's motion. But when there is such diversity to such as Perioiki, or very near sight, how can that position hold? Who can give a reason of this diversity of meteors, that it should rain stones, frogs, mice, etc., rats which they call lemmer in norway and are manifestly observed as munster writes by the inhabitants to descend and fall with some feculent showers and like so many locusts consume all that is green leo affer speaks as much of locusts about fez in barbary there be infinite swarms in their fields upon a sudden so at Aries in France, 1553, the like happened by the same mischief. All their grass and fruits were devoured. Magna in colarum admiratione et consternatione, as Valeriola relates. Coelum subito obum brabant, etc., he concludes. 
it could not be from natural causes. They cannot imagine whence they come, but from heaven. Are these and such creatures, corn, wood, stones, worms, wool, blood, etc., lifted up into the middle region by the sunbeams, as Barakelus, the physician, disputes, and thence let fall with showers, or they are engendered? Cornelius Gemma is of that opinion. They are there conceived by celestial influences. Others suppose they are immediately from God, or prodigies raised by art and illusions of spirits, which are the princes of the air, to whom Bodine, Book Two, the Artrum Natura, subscribes. In fine, of meteors in general, Aristotle's reasons are exploded by Bernardinus Telesius, by Paracelsus his principles confuted, and other causes assigned, sal, sulphur, mercury, in which his disciples are so expert, that they can alter elements and separate at their pleasure, make perpetual motions, not as Cardan, Tasnir, Peregrinus, by some magnetical virtue, but by mixture of elements, imitate thunder, like Salmonius, snow, hail, the seas ebbing and flowing, give life to creatures, as they say, without generation, and why not? Petrus Nonius Saluciensis and Kepler take upon them to demonstrate that no meteors, clouds, fogs, vapours, arise higher than fifty or eighty miles, and all the rest be purer air or element of fire, which Cardan, Tycho, and John Pena manifestly confute by refractions, and many other arguments. There is no such element of fire at all. If, as Tycho proves, the moon be distant from us fifty and six semi-diameters of the earth, and as Peter Nonius will have it, the air be so angust, what proportion is there betwixt the other three elements and it? To what use serves it? Is it full of spirits which inhabit it, as the Paracelsians and Platonists hold, the higher the more noble, full of birds, or a mere vacuum, to no purpose? It is much controverted between Tycho Brahe and Christopher Rotman, the landgrave of Hesse's mathematician, in their astronomical epistles, whether it be the same diaphanum clearness, matter of air and heavens, or two distinct essences. Christopher Rotman, John Pena, Jordanus Brunus, and many other late mathematicians contend it is the same and one matter throughout, saving that the higher, still the purer it is, and more subtile, as they find by experience in the top of some hills in America. If a man ascend, he faints instantly for want of thicker air to refrigerate the heart. Acosta, Book 3, Chapter 9, calls this mountain Periacaca in Peru. It makes men cast and vomit, he saith, that climb it, as some other of those Andes do in the deserts of Chile for five hundred miles together, and for extremity of cold to lose their fingers and toes. Tycho will have two distinct matters of heaven and air, but to say truth, with some small qualifications, they have one and the self-same opinion about the essence and matter of heavens that it is not hard and impenetrable, as peripatetics hold, transparent, of a quinta essentia, but that it is penetrable and soft as the air itself, and that the planets move in it as birds in the air, fishes in the sea. This they prove by motion of comets, and otherwise, though Clermontius in his Antidico stiffly opposes, which are not generated, as Aristotle teacheth, in the aerial region of a hot and dry exhalation, and so consumed, but as Anaxagoras and Democritus held of old, of a celestial matter, and as Tycho, Eliseus, Roslin, Thaddeus, Hagesius, Pena, Rotman, Fracastorius, demonstrate by their progress, parallaxes, refractions, motions of the planets, which interfere and cut one another's orbs, now higher and then lower, as Mars amongst the rest, which sometimes, as Kepler confirms by his own and Tycho's accurate observations, comes nearer the earth than the sun, and is again eftsoons aloft in Jupiter's orb, and other sufficient reasons, far above the moon, exploding in the meantime that element of fire, those fictitious first watery movers, 
those heavens, I mean, above the firmament, which De Irio, Lodovicus Imola, Patricius, and many of the fathers affirm. Those monstrous orbs of eccentrics, and eccentre epicucles deserentes, which howsoever Ptolemy, Alhazen, Vitellio, Purbacius, Maginus, Clavius, and many of their associates stiffly maintain to be real orbs, eccentric, concentric, circles, iquant, etc., are absurd and ridiculous. For who is so mad to think that there should be so many circles, like subordinate wheels in a clock, all impenetrable and hard, as they feign, add and subtract at their pleasure? Maginus makes eleven heavens, subdivided into their orbs and circles, and all too little to serve those particular appearances. Fracastorius, seventy-two homocentrics, Tycho Brahe, Nicholas Ramerus, Eliseus Röslin, have peculiar hypotheses of their own inventions, and they be but inventions, as most of them acknowledge, as we admit of equators, tropics, colours, circles arctic and antarctic, for doctrine's sake, though Ramus thinks them all unnecessary. They will have them supposed only for method and order. Tycho hath feigned I know not how many subdivisions of epicycles in epicycles, etc., to calculate and express the moon's motion. But when all is done, as a supposition, and no otherwise, not, as he holds, hard, impenetrable, subtile, transparent, etc., or making music, as Pythagoras maintained of old, and Robert Constantine of late, but still, quiet, liquid, open, etc. End of section 8section nine of the anatomy of melancholy volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for further information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the anatomy of melancholy volume two by robert burton section nine partition two section two member three part three if the heavens then be penetrable, as these men deliver, and no lets, it were not amiss in this aerial progress to make wings and fly up, which that Turk in Busbequius made his fellow-citizens in Constantinople believe he would perform. And some new-fangled wits, methinks, should some time or other find out. Or if that may not be, yet with a Galileo's glass, or Icaro Menippus's wings in Lucian, command the spheres and heavens, and see what is done amongst them. Whether there be generation and corruption, as some think, by reason of the ethereal comets, that in Cassiopeia, 1572, that in Signo, 1600, that in Sagittarius, 1604, and many like, which by no means Julius Caesar La Galla, that Italian philosopher, in his physical disputation with Galileus, De Phenomenis in Orbe Lunae, chapter 9, will admit, or that they were created ab initio, and show themselves at set times, as Helisius Röslin contends, have poles, axle trees, circles of their own, and regular motions, for non periunt sed minuuntur et disparent. Mancanus holds they come and go by fits, casting their tails still from the sun. Some of them, as a burning glass, projects the sunbeams from it, though not always neither. For sometimes a comet casts his tail from Venus, as Tycho observes, and as Helisaeus Röslin, of some others, from the moon, with little stars about them, ad stuporem astronomorum, cum multis aliis in caelo miraculis, all which argue with those Medician, Austrian, and Burbonian stars, that the heaven of the planets is indistinct, pure and open, in which the planets move, certis legibus ac metis. Examine likewise, and caelum sit coloratum, whether the stars be of that bigness, distance, as astronomers relate, so many in number, 1,026, 1,725, as Bayerus, or as some rabbins, 29,000 myriads, 
or as Galileo discovers by his glasses, infinite, and that via lactea, a confused light of small stars, like so many nails in a door, or all in a row, like those twelve thousand isles of the Maldives in the Indian Ocean. Whether the least visible star in the eighth sphere be eighteen times bigger than the earth, and, as Tycho calculates, fourteen thousand semi-diameters distant from it. Whether they be thicker parts of the orbs, as Aristotle delivers, or so many habitable worlds, as Democritus. Whether they have light of their own, or from the sun, or give light round, as Patritius discourseth. An aeque distant a centra mundi, whether light be of their essence, and that light be a substance or an accident. Whether they be hot by themselves, or by accident cause heat. Whether there be such a procession of the equinoxes as Copernicus holds, or that the eighth sphere move. And bene philosophentur, Roger Bacon, and J. D. Aphorisms, de multiplicatione specierum whether there be any such images ascending with each degree of the zodiac in the east, as Aliacensis feigns, an aqua supercailum, as Patritius and the schoolmen will, a crystalline watery heaven, which is certainly to be understood of that in the middle region, for otherwise, if at Noah's flood the water came from thence, it must be above a hundred years falling down to us, as some calculate. Besides, an terracit animata, which some so confidently believe, with Orpheus, Hermes, Averroes, from which all other souls of men, beasts, devils, plants, fishes, etc., are derived, and into which again, after some revolutions, as Plato in his Timaeus, Protinus in his Enneades, more largely discuss, they return. See Chalcidius and Benius, Plato's commentators, as all philosophical matter in materiam primam, Keplerus, Patritius, and some other Neoterics have in part revived this opinion. And that every star in heaven hath a soul, angel, or intelligence to animate or move it, etc. Or to omit all smaller controversies as matters of less moment, and examine that main paradox of the earth's motion now so much in question, Aristarchus Samius, Pythagoras, maintained it of old, Democritus, and many of their scholars, Didacus Astunica, Antony Fascarinus, a Carmelite, and some other commentators, will have Job to insinuate as much. Chapter 9, verse 4. Qui comovet teram de loco suo, etc. And that this one place of scripture makes more for the earth's motion than all the others prove against it whom Pineda confutes, most contradict. Howsoever, it is revived since by Copernicus, not as a truth, but a supposition, as he himself confesseth in the preface to Pope Nicholas, but now maintained in good earnest by Calcaninus, Telesius, Kepler, Rotman, Gilbert, Diggs, Galileo, Campanella, and especially by Landsbergius. Naturae rationi et veritati consentaneum by Origanus, and some others of his followers. For if the earth be the centre of the world, stand still, and the heavens move, as the most received opinion is, which they call inordinatam caeli dispositionem, though stiffly maintained by Tycho, Ptolemaeus, and their adherents, quis ille furor, etc. What fury is that? saith Dr. Gilbert. Satis animose, as Cabeus notes, that shall drive the heavens about with such incomprehensible celerity in twenty-four hours, when, as every point of the firmament and in the equator must needs move, so Clavius calculates, one hundred and seventy-six thousand six hundred and sixty in one two hundred and forty-sixth part of an hour, and an arrow out of a bow must go seven times about the earth, whilst a man can say an Ave Maria, if it keep the same space, or compass the earth 1,884 times in an hour, which is supra humanam cogitationem, beyond human conceit, ocior et iaculo et ventos aequante sagitta, 
A man could not ride so much ground, going forty miles a day, in two thousand nine hundred and four years, as the firmament goes in twenty-three hours, or so much in two hundred and three years, as the firmament in one minute, quod incredibile videtur, and the pole star, which to our thinking scarce moveth out of his place, goeth a bigger circuit than the sun, whose diameter is much larger than the diameter of the heaven of the sun, and twenty thousand semi-diameters of the earth from us, with the rest of the fixed stars, as Tycho proves. To avoid, therefore, these impossibilities, they ascribe a triple motion to the earth, the sun immovable in the centre of the whole world, the earth centre of the moon alone above Mars and Mercury, beneath Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, or, as Origanus and others will, one single motion to the earth, still placed in the centre of the world, which is more probable, a single motion to the firmament, which moves in thirty or twenty-six thousand years, and so the planets. Saturn in thirty years absolves his soul and proper motion, Jupiter in twelve, Mars in three, etc., and so solve all appearances better than any way whatsoever, calculate all motions, be they in longum or latum, direct, stationary, retrograde, ascent or descent, without epicycles, intricate eccentrics, etc., rectius commodiusque per unicum motum terrae, saith Lansbergius, much more certain than by those Alphonsine or any such tables which are grounded from those other suppositions. And tis true, they say, according to optic principles, the visible appearance of the planets do so indeed answer to their magnitudes and orbs, and come nearest to the mathematical observations and precedent calculations. There is no repugnancy to physical axioms, because no penetration of orbs. But then between the sphere of Saturn and the firmaments, there is such an incredible and vast space or distance, seven million semi-diameters of the earth, as Tycho calculates, void of stars. And besides, they do so enhance the bigness of the stars, enlarge their circuit, to solve those ordinary objections of parallaxes and retrogradations of the fixed stars, that alterations of the poles, elevation in several places, or latitude of cities here on earth, for, say they, if a man's eye were in the firmament, he should not at all discern that great annual motion of the earth, but it would still appear punctum indivisibile, and seem to be fixed in one place of the same bigness, that it is quite opposite to reason, to natural philosophy, and all out as absurd as disproportional, so some will, as prodigious, as that of the sun's swift motion of heavens. But, hoc posito, to grant this their tenet of the earth's motion, if the earth move, it is a planet, and shines to them in the moon, and to the other planetary inhabitants, as the moon, and they do to us upon the earth. But shine she doth, as Galileo, Kepler, and others prove, and then, per consequens, the rest of the planets are inhabited, as well as the moon, which he grants in his dissertation with Galileo's Nuncius Siderius, that there be jovial and Saturn inhabitants, etc., and those several planets have their several moons about them, as the earth hath hers, as Galileo hath already evinced by his glasses, 3,108, four about Jupiter, two about Saturn, though Sitius the Florentine, Fortunius Licetus, and Julius Caesar the Galla cavil at it. Yet Kepler, the emperor's mathematician, confirms out of his experience that he saw as much by the same help, and more about Mars, Venus, and the rest they hope to find out, peradventure even amongst the fixed stars, which Brunus and Brutius have already averred. Then, I say, the earth and they be planets alike, moved about the sun, the common centre of the world alike, and it may be those two green children, which Nubrigensis speaks of in his time, that fell from heaven, came from thence, and that famous stone that fell from heaven in Aristotle's time, Olympiads 84, Anno Tertio, ad Capuas Fluenta, recorded by Laertius and others, or Ancile, or Buckler, in Numa's time, recorded by Festus. We may likewise insert with Campanella and Brunus, 
that which Pythagoras, Aristarchus, Samius, Heraclitus, Epicurus, Melissus, Democritus, Leucippus maintained in their ages, there be infinite worlds and infinite earths or systems in infinito aethere, which Eusebius collects out of their tenets, because infinite stars and planets like unto this of ours, which some stick not still to maintain and publicly defend, sperabundus expecto innumerabilium mundorum in aeternitate per ambulationem, etc. For if the firmament be of such an incomparable bigness, as these Copernical giants will have it, infinitum, aut infinito proximum, so vast and full of innumerable stars, as being infinite in extent, one above another, some higher, some lower, some nearer, some farther off, and so far asunder, and those so huge and great, insomuch that if the whole sphere of Saturn, and all that is included in it, totum aggregatum, as from Mundus of Louvain in his tract, De immobilitate terrae, argues, e vehatur interstellas, videri a nobis non poterat, tam immanis est distantia intertellurem et fixas, sed instar puncti, etc. If our world be small in respect, why may we not suppose a plurality of worlds, those infinite stars visible in the firmament, to be so many suns, with particular fixed centres, to have likewise their subordinate planets, as the sun hath his dancing still around him, which Cardinal Cusanus, Walcarinus, Brunus, and some others have held, and some still maintain, animae, Aristotelismo in nutritae, et minuti speculationibus asuetae, secus forsan, etc. Though they seem close to us, they are infinitely distant, and so, per consequens, there are infinite habitable worlds. What hinders? Why should not an infinite cause, as God is, produce infinite effects? Kepler, I confess, will by no means admit of Brunus's infinite worlds, or that the fixed stars should be so many suns, with their compassing planets. Yet the said Kepler, between jest and earnest in his perspectives, lunar geography, et somnio suo, seems in part to agree with this, and partly to contradict. For the planets, he yields them to be inhabited, he doubts of the stars, and so doth Tycho in his astronomical epistles, out of a consideration of their vastity and greatness, break out into some such like speeches, that he will never believe those great and huge bodies were made to no other use than this that we perceive to illuminate the earth, a point insensible in respect of the whole. But who shall dwell in these vast bodies, earths, worlds, if they be inhabited? Rational creatures, as Kepler demands, or have they souls to be saved, or do they inhabit a better part of the world than we do? Are we, or they, lords of the world, and how are all things made for man? Difficile est nodum hunc expedire, eo quod nondum omnia quae huc pertinent explorata habemus. Tis hard to determine. This only he proves, that we are in praecipuo mundi sinu, in the best place, best world, nearest the heart of the sun. Thomas Campanella, a Calabrian monk, in his second book, De Censurerum, chapter 4, subscribes to this of Kepler, that they are inhabited, he certainly supposeth, but with what kind of creatures he cannot say. He labours to prove it by all means, and that there are infinite worlds, having made an apology for Galileo, and dedicates this tenet of his to Cardinal Cayetanus. Others freely speak, mutter, and would persuade the world, as Marinus Marcenus complains, that our modern divines are too severe and rigid against mathematicians, ignorant and peevish, in not admitting their true demonstrations and certain observations, that they tyrannise over art, science, and all philosophy, in suppressing their labours, saith Pomponatius, forbidding them to write, to speak a truth, all to maintain their superstition, and for their profit's sake. As for those places of scripture which are punit, they will have spoken ad captum vulgi, 
and if rightly understood and favourably interpreted, not at all against it. And as Otho Gassman writes, many great divines, besides Porphyrius, Proclus, Simplicius, and those heathen philosophers, Doctrina et aetate venerandi, morsis genesin mundanam popularis nescio cuius ruditatis, quae longa absit a vera philosophorum eruditione, in simulant. For Moses makes mention but of two planets, sun and moon, no four elements, etc. Read more on him in Grossius and Junius. But to proceed, these and such like insolent and bold attempts, prodigious paradoxes, inferences must needs follow, if it once be granted, which Rotman, Kepler, Gilbert, Digius, Origanus, Galileo, and others maintain of the earth's motion, that tis a planet, and shines as the moon doth, which contains in it both land and seas as the moon doth, for so they find by their glasses that maculae in facie lunae, the brighter parts are earth, the dusky sea, which Thales, Plutarch, and Pythagoras formerly taught, and manifestly discern hills and dales, and such like concavities, if we may subscribe to and believe Galileo's observations. But to avoid these paradoxes of the earth's motion, which the Church of Rome hath lately condemned as heretical, as appears by Blancanus and from Mundus's writings, our latter mathematicians have rolled all the stones that may be stirred, and to solve all appearances and objections have invented new hypotheses and fabricated new systems of the world out of their own Didalean heads. Fracastorius will have the earth stand still, as before, and to avoid that supposition of eccentrics and epicycles, he hath coined seventy-two homocentrics, to solve all appearances. Nicholas Ramerus will have the earth the centre of the world, but movable, and the eighth sphere immovable, the five upper planets to move about the sun, the sun and moon about the earth, of which orbs Tycho Brahe puts the earth the centre immovable, the stars immovable, the rest with Ramerus, the planets without orbs to wander in the air, keep time and distance, true motion, according to that virtue which God hath given them. Heliseus Röslin censureth both, with Copernicus, whose hypothesis de terrae motu, Philippus Landsbergius hath lately vindicated, and demonstrated with solid arguments in a just volume, Jansonius Caesins hath illustrated in a sphere. The said Johannes Landsbergius, 1633, hath since defended his assertion against all the cavils and calumnies of Fromundus's anti-Aristarchus, Baptista Morinus, and Petrus Bartholinus. Fromundus, 1634, hath written against him again, J. Rossius of Aberdeen, etc., sound drums and trumpets, whilst Röstlin, I say, censures all, and Ptolemaeus himself, as insufficient. One offends against natural philosophy, another against optic principles, a third against mathematical, as not answering to astronomical observations. One puts a great space between Saturn's orb and the eighth sphere, another too narrow. In his own hypothesis, he makes the earth as before the universal centre, the sun to the five upper planets, to the eighth sphere he ascribes diurnal motion, eccentrics and epicycles to the seven planets, which hath been formerly exploded. And so, dum vitant stulti vitia in contraria currunt, as a tinker stops one hole and makes two, he corrects them, and doth worse himself, reforms some, and mars all. In the meantime the world is tossed in a blanket amongst them, they hoist the earth up and down like a ball, make it stand and go at their pleasures. One saith the sun stands, another he moves, a third comes in, taking them all at rebound, and, lest there should any paradox be wanting, he finds certain spots and clouds in the sun, by the help of glasses, which multiply, saith Keplerus, a thing seen a thousand times bigger in Plano, and makes it come thirty-two times nearer to the eye of the beholder. But see the demonstration of this glass in Tard, by means of which the sun must turn round upon his own centre, or they about the sun. 
Fabricius puts only three, and those in the sun, Apelles fifteen, and those without the sun, floating like the Cyanian Isles in the Euxine Sea. Tard, the Frenchman, hath observed thirty-three, and those neither spots nor clouds, as Galileo, Epistula ad Valserum, supposeth. But planets concentric with the sun, and not far from him with regular motions. Christopher Schemer, a German-Swiss Jesuit, Ursica Rosa, divides them in maculas et faculas, and will have them to be fixed in solis superficie, and to absolve their periodical and regular motion in twenty-seven or twenty-eight days, holding withal the rotation of the sun upon his centre, and all are so confident that they have made schemes and tables of their motions. The Hollander, in his dissertationcula cum apelle, censures all, and thus they disagree amongst themselves, old and new, irreconcilable in their opinions, thus Aristarchus, thus Hipparchus, thus Ptolemaeus, thus Albateginus, thus Alphaganus, thus Tycho, thus Ramerus, thus Röstlinus, thus Fracastorius, thus Copernicus and his adherents, thus Clavius and Maginus, etc., with their followers, vary and determine of these celestial orbs and bodies. And so, whilst these men contend about the sun and moon, like the philosophers in Lucian, it is to be feared the sun and moon will hide themselves, and be as much offended as she was with those, and send another messenger to Jupiter, by some new-fangled Icaromenippus, to make an end of all those curious controversies, and scatter them abroad. End of section 9《》of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume Two, by Robert Burton. Section Ten, Partition Two, Section Two, Member Three. Part 4. But why should the sun and moon be angry, or take exceptions at mathematicians and philosophers, when as the like measure is offered unto God himself by a company of theologasters? They are not contented to see the sun and moon, measure their sight and biggest distance in a glass, calculate their motions, or visit the moon in a poetical fiction, or a dream, as he saith, Audax facinus et memorabile nunc incipiam, neque hoc saeculo usurpatum prius, quid in lunae regno hac nocte gestum sit exponam, et quo nemo unquam nisi somniando pervenit. But he, and Menippus, or, as Peter Cuneus, bona fide agam, nihil eorum quae scripturus sum, verum esse scitote, etc., Quae nec facta nec futura sunt dicam, stili tantum et ingenii causa. Not in jest, but in good earnest, these gigantical cyclops will transcend spheres, heaven, stars, into that empyrean heaven, soar higher yet, and see what God himself doth. The Jewish Talmudists take upon them to determine how God spends his whole time, sometimes playing with Leviathan, sometimes overseeing the world, etc., like Lucian's Jupiter, that spent much of the year in painting butterflies' wings, and seeing who offered sacrifice, telling the hours when it should rain, how much snow should fall in such a place, which way the wind should stand in Greece, which way in Africa. In the Turks' Al-Quran, Mahomet is taken up to heaven, upon a Pegasus sent on purpose for him, as he lay in bed with his wife, and after some conference with God, is set on ground again. The pagans paint him, and mangle him, after a thousand fashions. Our heretics, schismatics, and some schoolmen, come not far behind. Some paint him in the habit of an old man, and make maps of heaven, number the angels, tell their several names, offices. Some deny God and his providence, 
some take his office out of his hands will bind and loose in heaven release pardon forgive and be quartermaster with him some call his godhead in question his power and attributes his mercy justice providence they will know with cecilius why good and bad are punished together war fires plagues infest all alike why wicked men flourish good are poor in prison sick and ill at ease why doth he suffer so much mischief and evil to be done if he be able to help why doth he not assist good or resist bad reform our wills if he be not the author of sin and let such enormities be committed unworthy of his knowledge wisdom government mercy and providence why lets he all things be done by fortune and chance others as prodigiously inquire after his omnipotency and posit plure similes creare deus an ex scarabeo deum etc et quo demum ruetis sacrificuli some by visions and revelations take upon them to be familiar with god and to be of privy counsel with him they will tell how many and who shall be saved when the world shall come to an end what year what month and whatsoever else God hath reserved unto himself and to his angels. Some again, curious fantastics, will know more than this, and inquire with Epicurus what God did before the world was made. Was he idle? Where did he bide? What did he make the world of? Why did he then make it, and not before? If he made it new, or to have an end, how is he unchangeable, infinite, etc.? Some will dispute cavil and object as julian did of old whom cyril confutes as simon magus is fain to do in that dialogue betwixt him and peter and ammonius the philosopher in that dialogical disputation with zacharias the christian if god be infinitely and only good why should he alter or destroy the world if he confound that which is good how shall himself continue good if he pull it down because evil how shall he be free from the evil that made it evil etc with many such absurd and brain-sick questions intricacies froth of human wit and excrements of curiosity etc which as our saviour told his inquisitive disciples are not fit for them to know but ho oh, i am now gone quite out of sight i am almost giddy with roving about i could have ranged farther yet but i am an infant and not able to dive into these profundities or sound these depths not able to understand much less to discuss i leave the contemplation of these things to stronger wits that have better ability and happier leisure to wade into such philosophical mysteries for put case i were as able as willing yet what can one man do I will conclude with Scaliger. Ne quaquam nos homines sumus, sed partes hominis, ex omnibus aliquid fieri potest, itque non magnum, ex singulis fere nihil. Besides, as Natsiatzen hath it, Deus latere nos multa voluit, and with Seneca, chapter 35, De Cometis, Quid miramur tam rara mundi spectacula non teneri certis legibus, nondum intelligi. Multae sunt gentes quae tantum de facie sciunt caelum, veniet tempus furtasse, quo ista quae nunc latent, in lucem diei extrahat, longioris aevi diligentia, una aetas non sufficit, posteri, etc., when god sees his time he will reveal these mysteries to mortal men and show that to some few at last which he hath concealed so long for i am of his mind that columbus did not find out america by chance but god directed him at that time to discover it it was contingent to him but necessary to god he reveals and conceals to whom and when he will and which one said of history and records of former times god in his providence to check our presumptuous inquisition wraps up all things in uncertainty bars us from long antiquity and bounds our search within the compass of some few ages 
many good things are lost which our predecessors made use of as panchirola will better inform you many new things are daily invented to the public good so kingdoms men and knowledge ebb and flow are hid and revealed and when you have all done as the preacher concluded nihil est sub sole novum nothing new under the sun but my melancholy spaniel's quest my game is sprung and i must suddenly come down and follow jason pretensis in his book de morbis capitis and chapter of melancholy hath these words out of galen let them come to me to know what meat and drink they shall use and besides that i will teach them what temper of ambient air they shall make choice of what wind what countries they shall choose and what avoid out of which lines of his thus much we may gather that to this cure of melancholy amongst other things the rectification of air is necessarily required this is performed either in reforming natural or artificial air natural is that which is in our election to choose or avoid and tis either general to countries provinces particular to cities towns villages or private houses what harm those extremities of heat or cold do in this malady i have formerly shown the medium must needs be good where the air is temperate serene quiet free from bogs fens mists all manner of putrefaction contagious and filthy noisome smells the egyptians by all geographers are commended to be hilares a conceited and merry nation which i can ascribe to no other cause than the serenity of their air they that live in the orcades are registered by hector boethius and cardan to be of fair complexion long-lived most healthful free from all manner of infirmities of body and mind by reason of a sharp purifying air which comes from the sea the boeotians in greece were dull and heavy crassi bioti by reason of a foggy air in which they lived biotum in crasso urares aere natum attica most acute pleasant and refined the clime changes not so much customs manners wits as aristotle politics book six chapter four vegetius plato bodine hath proved at large as constitutions of their bodies and temperature itself in all particular provinces we see it confirmed by experience as the air is so are the inhabitants dull heavy witty subtle neat cleanly clownish sick and sound in perigord in france the air is subtle healthful seldom any plague or contagious disease but hilly and barren the men sound nimble and lusty but in some parts of guienne full of moors and marshes the people dull heavy and subject to many infirmities who sees not a great difference between surrey sussex and romney marsh the wolds in lincolnshire and the fens he therefore that loves his health if his ability will give him leave must often shift places and make choice of such as are wholesome pleasant and convenient there is nothing better than change of air in this malady and generally for health to wander up and down as those tartary zamolienses that live in hordes and take opportunity of times places seasons the kings of persia had their summer and winter houses in winter at sardis in summer at susa now at persepolis then at pasargada cyrus lived seven cold months at babylon three at susa two at hecbatana saith xenophon and had by that means a perpetual spring the great turk sojourns sometimes at constantinople sometimes at adrianople etc the kings of spain have their escurial in heat of summer madrid for a wholesome seat valladolid a pleasant sight etc variety of sequesus as all princes and great men have and their several progresses to this purpose lucullus the roman had his house at rome at baiae etc when gnaeus pompeius marcus cicero saith plutarch and many noble men in the summer came to see him at supper pompeius jested with him that it was an elegant and pleasant village full of windows galleries and all offices fit for a summer-house but in his judgment very unfit for winter 
Lucullus made answer that the lord of the house had wit like a crane, that changeth her country with the season. He had other houses furnished and built for that purpose, all out as commodious as this. So Tully had his Tusculan, Plinius his Lauretan village, and every gentleman of any fashion in our times hath the like. The bishop of Exeter had fourteen several houses, all furnished in times past, in Italy, though they bide in cities in winter, which is more gentlemanlike, all the summer they come abroad to their country houses to recreate themselves. Our gentry in England live most part in the country, except it be some few castles, building still in bottoms, saith Jovius, or near woods, Corona arborum virentium. You shall know a village by a tuft of trees at or about it, to avoid those strong winds wherewith the island is infested, and cold winter blasts. Some discommend moated houses as unwholesome. So Camden saith of Ewelm that it was therefore unfrequented, obstagni wicini halitus, and all such places as be near lakes or rivers. But I am of opinion that these inconveniences will be mitigated, or easily corrected, by good fires, as one reports of Venice, that graviolentia and fog of the moors is sufficiently qualified by those innumerable smokes. Nay more, Thomas Ravenus, a great physician, contends that the Venetians are generally longer lived than any city in Europe, and live many of them a hundred and twenty years. But it is not water simply that so much offends, as the slime and noisome smells that accompany such overflowed places, which is but at some few seasons after a flood, and is sufficiently recompensed with sweet smells and aspects in summer. Where pinget vario gemantia prata colore, and many other commodities of pleasure and profit, or else may be corrected by the sight, if it be somewhat remote from the water, as Lindley, Orton supermontem, Drayton, or a little more elevated, though nearer, as Corcott, Amington, Polesworth, Weddington, to insist in such places best to me known, upon the river of Anchor, in Warwickshire, Swalston, and Drakeslea upon Trent. Or, howsoever they be unseasonable in winter, or at some times, they have their good use in summer. If so be that their means be so slender, as they may not admit of any such variety, but must determine once for all, and make one house serve each season, I know no men that have given better rules in this behalf than our husbandry writers. Cato and Columella prescribe a good house to stand by a navigable river, good highways near some city, and in a good soil, but that is more for commodity than health. End of section 10 Section 11 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2, by Robert Burton. Section 11. Partition 2, Section 2, Member 3, Part 5. The best soil commonly yields the worst air. A dry, sandy plat is fittest to build upon, and such as is rather hilly than plain, full of downs, a Cotswold country, as being most commodious for hawking, hunting, wood, waters, and all manner of pleasures. Perigord in France is barren, yet by reason of the excellency of the air, and such pleasures that it affords, much inhabited by the nobility, as Nuremberg in Germany, Toledo in Spain. Our countryman Tussa will tell us so much, that the field-own is for profit, the woodland for pleasure and health the one commonly a deep clay, therefore noisome in winter, and subject to bad highways, the other a dry sand. Provision may be had elsewhere, and our towns are generally bigger in the woodland than the field on, more frequent and populous, and gentlemen more delight to dwell in such places. 
Sutton Coldfield in Warwickshire, where I was once a grammar scholar, may be a sufficient witness, which stands, as Camden notes, loco ingrato et sterili, but in an excellent air, and full of all manner of pleasures. Wadley in Berkshire is situate in a vale, though not so fertile a soil as some vales afford, yet a most commodious sight, wholesome in a delicious air, a rich and pleasant seat. So Seagrave in Leicestershire, which town I am now bound to remember, is situated in a champagne at the edge of the wolds, and more barren than the villages about it, yet no place likely yields a better air. And he that built that fair house, Wollerton, in Nottinghamshire, is much to be commended, though the track be sandy and barren about it, for making choice of such a place. Constantine praiseth mountains, hilly, steep places, above the rest by the seaside, and such as look toward the north upon some great river, as Farmac in Derbyshire, on the Trent, environed with hills, open only to the north, like Mount Edgecombe in Cornwall, which Mr. Carew so much admires for an excellent seat. Such is the general sight of Bohemia, Serenat Boreas, the north wind clarifies, but near lakes or marshes, in holes, obscure places, or to the south and west, he utterly disproves. Those winds are unwholesome, putrefying, and make men subject to diseases. The best building for health, according to him, is in high places, and in an excellent prospect, like that of Cudston in Oxfordshire, which place I must honoris ergo mention, is lately and fairly built, in a good air, good prospect, good soil, both for profit and pleasure, not so easily to be matched. Crescentius, in his book one, De Agricultura, chapter five, is very copious in this subject how a house should be wholesomely sighted, in a good coast, good air, wind, etc. Varro, De Re Rustica, Book 1, Chapter 12, forbids lakes and rivers, marshy and manured grounds. They cause a bad air, gross diseases, hard to be cured. If it be so that he cannot help it, better, as he adviseth, sell thy house and land, than lose thine health. He that respects not this in choosing of his seat, or building his house, is mente captus, mad, Cato saith, and his dwelling next to hell itself, according to Columella. He commends, in conclusion, the middle of a hill, upon a descent. Baptista Porta Villae censures Varro, Cato, Columella, and those ancient rustics, approving many things, disallowing some, and will by all means have the front of a house stand to the south which, how it may be good in Italy and hotter climes, I know not, in our northern countries I am sure it is best. Stephanus, a Frenchman, subscribes to this, approving especially the descent of a hill south or south-east, with trees to the north, so that it be well watered, a condition in all sites which must not be omitted, as Herbastein inculcates, Book I, Julius Caesar Claudinus, a physician, for a nobleman in Poland, melancholy given, adviseth him to dwell in a house inclining to the east, and by all means to provide the air be clear and sweet, which Montanus counselleth the Earl of Montfort, his patient, to inhabit a pleasant house, and in a good air. If it be so, the natural site may not be altered of our city, town, village, yet by artificial means it may be helped. In hot countries, therefore, they make the streets of their cities very narrow. All over Spain, Africa, Italy, Greece, and many cities of France, in Languedoc especially, and Provence, those southern parts, Montpellier, the habitation and university of physicians, is so built, with high houses, narrow streets, to divert the sun's scalding rays, which Tacitus commends, as most agreeing to their health, because the height of buildings and narrowness of streets keep away the sunbeams. Some cities use galleries or arched cloisters towards the street, as Damascus, Bologna, Padua, Bern in Switzerland, Westchester with us, as well to avoid tempests as the sun's scorching heat. They build on high hills in hot countries for more air, or to the seaside, as Baiae, Naples, etc.
in our northern countries we are opposite we commend straight broad open fair streets as most befitting and agreeing to our clime we build in bottoms for warmth and that site of mitylene in the island of lesbos in the aegean sea which vitruvius so much discommends magnificently built with fair houses said imprudenter positam unadvisedly cited because it lay along to the south and when the south wind blew the people were all sick would make an excellent site in our northern climes of that artificial site of houses i have sufficiently discoursed if the plan of the dwelling may not be altered yet there is much in choice of such a chamber or room in opportune opening and shutting of windows excluding foreign air and winds and walking abroad at convenient times crato a german commends east and south sight disallowing cold air and northern winds in this case rainy weather and misty days free from putrefaction fens bogs and muck hills if the air be such open no windows come not abroad montanus will have his patient not to stir at all if the wind be big or tempestuous as the most part in march it is with us or in cloudy lowering dark days as in november which we commonly call the black month or stormy let the wind stand how it will he must not open a casement in bad weather or in a boisterous season he especially forbids us to open windows to a south wind the best sites for chamber windows in my judgment are north east south and which is the worst west levinus lemnius attributes so much to air and rectifying of wind and windows that he holds it alone sufficient to make a man sick or well to alter body and mind a clear air cheers up the spirits exhilarates the mind a thick black misty tempestuous contracts overthrows great heed is therefore to be taken at what times we walk how we place our windows lights and houses how we let in or exclude this ambient air the egyptians to avoid immoderate heat make their windows on the top of the house like chimneys with two tunnels to draw a thorough air in spain they commonly make great opposite windows without glass still shutting those which are next to the sun so likewise in turkey and italy venice excepted which brags of her stately glazed palaces they use paper windows to like purpose and lie sub dio in the top of their flat-roofed houses so sleeping under the canopy of heaven in some parts of italy they have windmills to draw a cooling air out of hollow caves and disperse the same through all the chambers of their palaces to refresh them as at costosa the house of cesareo trento a gentleman of vicenza and elsewhere many excellent means are invented to correct nature by art if none of these courses help the best way is to make artificial air which howsoever is profitable and good still to be made hot and moist and to be seasoned with sweet perfumes pleasant and lightsome as it may be to have roses violets and sweet-smelling flowers ever in their windows poses in their hand laurentius commends water-lilies a vessel of warm water to evaporate in the room and will make a more delightful perfume if there be added orange flowers pills of citrons rosemary cloves bays rose-water rose vinegar benzoin laudanum styrax and such like gums which make a pleasant and acceptable perfume besardus byzantinus prefers the smoke of juniper to melancholy persons which is in great request with us at oxford to sweeten our chambers guanerius prescribes the air to be moistened with water and sweet herbs boiled in it vine and sallow leaves etc to besprinkle the ground and posts with rose water rose vinegar which avicenna much approves of colours it is good to behold green red yellow and white and by all means to have light enough with windows in the day wax candles in the night neat chambers good fires in winter merry companions 
For though melancholy persons love to be dark and alone, yet darkness is a great increaser of the humour. Although our ordinary air be good by nature or art, yet it is not amiss, as I have said, still to alter it. No better physic for a melancholy man than change of air and variety of places, to travel abroad and see fashions. Leo Affer speaks of many of his countrymen so cured, without all other physic. Amongst the Negroes there is such an excellent air, that if any of them be sick elsewhere, and brought thither, he is instantly recovered, of which he was often an eye-witness. Lipsius, Zwinger, and some others, add as much of ordinary travel. No man, saith Lipsius, in an epistle to Lanoius, a noble friend of his, now ready to make a voyage, can be such a stock or stone, whom that pleasant speculation of countries, cities, towns, rivers, will not affect. Seneca, the philosopher, was infinitely taken with the sight of Scipio Africanus's house, near Linternum, to view those old buildings, cisterns, baths, tombs, etc., and how was Tully pleased with the sight of Athens, to behold those ancient and fair buildings, with a remembrance of their worthy inhabitants. Paulus Aemilius, that renowned Roman captain, after he had conquered Perseus, the last king of Macedonia, and now made an end of his tedious wars, though he had been long absent from Rome, and much there desired, about the beginning of autumn, as Livy describes it, made a pleasant peregrination all over Greece, accompanied with his son Scipio, and Athenaeus, the brother of King Eumenes, leaving the charge of his army with Sulpicius Gallus. By Thessaly he went to Delphos, thence to Megaris, Aulis, Athens, Argos, Lacedaemon, Megalopolis, etc. He took great content, exceeding delight in that his voyage, as who doth not that shall attempt the like? Though his travel be adjectationem magis quam ad usum re publicae, as one well observes, to crack, gaze, see fine sights and fashions, spend time, rather than for his own or public good. As it is to many gallants that travel out their best days, together with their means, manners, honesty, religion. Yet it availeth howsoever, for peregrination charms our senses, with such unspeakable and sweet variety, that some count him unhappy that never travelled, and pity his case that from his cradle to his old age beholds the same still, still, still the same, the same. Insomuch that Rassis doth not only commend, but enjoin travel, and such variety of objects, to a melancholy man, and to lie in diverse inns, to be drawn into several companies. Montaltus, chapter 36, and many neoterics of the same mind. Celsus adviseth him, therefore, that will continue his health, to have varium vitae genus, diversity of callings, occupations, to be busied about, sometimes to live in the city, sometimes in the country, now to study or work, to be intent, then again to hawk or hunt, swim, run, ride, or exercise himself. A good prospect alone will ease melancholy, as Comesius contends, Book 2, Chapter 7, De Sale. The citizens of Barcino, saith he, otherwise penned in, melancholy, and stirring little abroad, are much delighted with that pleasant prospect their city hath into the sea, which, like that of old Athens, besides Aegina, Salamina, and many pleasant islands, had all the variety of delicious objects. So are those Neapolitans and inhabitants of Genoa, to see the ships, boats, and passengers go by, out of their windows, their whole cities being situated on the side of a hill, like Pera by Constantinople, so that each house almost hath a free prospect to the sea, as some part of London to the Thames, or to have a free prospect all over the city at once, as at Granada in Spain, and Fez in Africa, the river running betwixt two declining hills, the steepness causeth each house almost, as well to oversee, as to be overseen of the rest. Every country is full of such delights and prospects, as well within land as by sea, as Hermon and Rama in Palestina, 
Colalto in Italy, the top of Magetus, or Acrocorinthus, that old decayed castle in Corinth, from which Peloponnesus, Greece, the Ionian and Aegean seas, were semel et simul, at one view to be taken. In Egypt, the square top of the Great Pyramid, three hundred yards in height, and so the Sultan's palace in Grand Cairo, the country being plain, hath a marvellous fair prospect as well over Nilus as that great city, five Italian miles long and two broad by the riverside. From Mount Sion in Jerusalem, the Holy Land is of all sides to be seen. Such high places are infinite. With us, those of the best note are Glastonbury Tower, Box Hill in Surrey, Beaver Castle, Rodway Grange, Walsby in Lincolnshire, where I lately received a real kindness by the munificence of the right honourable my noble lady and patroness, the Lady Frances, Countess Dowager of Exeter, and two amongst the rest, which I may not omit for vicinity's sake, Oldbury in the confines of Warwickshire, where I have often looked about me with great delight, at the foot of which hill I was born and Handbury in Staffordshire, contiguous to which is Fowled, a pleasant village, and an ancient patrimony belonging to our family, now in the possession of mine elder brother, William Burton, Esquire. Barclay the Scot commends that of Greenwich Tower for one of the best prospects in Europe, to see London on the one side, the Thames, ships, and pleasant meadows on the other. There be those that say as much and more of St. Mark's steeple in Venice, yet these are at too great a distance. Some are especially affected with such objects as be near, to see passengers go by in some great roadway, or boats in a river, in subjectum forum de spicere, to oversee a fair, a market-place, or out of a pleasant window into some thoroughfare street, to behold a continual concourse, a promiscuous rout coming and going, or a multitude of spectators at a theatre, a mask, or some such like show. But I rove. The sum is this, that variety of actions, objects, air, places, are excellent good in this infirmity, and all others good for man, good for beast. Constantine the Emperor, Book 18, Chapter 13, Ex Leontio, holds it an only cure for rotten sheep and any manner of sick cattle. Lilius a Fonte Aigubinus, that great doctor, at the latter end of many of his consultations, as commonly he doth set down what success his physic had, in melancholy most especially approves of this above all other remedies whatsoever, as appears in Consultation 69, Consultation 229, etc., Many other things helped, but change of air was that which wrought the cure, and did most good. End of section 11。section 12 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2, by Robert Burton, Section 12, Partition 2, Section 2, Member 4, Part 1. Exercise Rectified of Body and Mind to that great inconvenience which comes on the one side by immoderate and unseasonable exercise, too much solitariness and idleness on the other, must be opposed as an antidote, a moderate and seasonable use of it, and that both of body and mind, as a most material circumstance, much conducing to this cure and to the general preservation of our health. The heavens themselves run continually round, the sun riseth and sets, the moon increaseth and decreaseth, stars and planets keep their constant motions, the air is still tossed by the winds, the waters ebb and flow, to their conservation, no doubt, to teach us that we should ever be in action, for which cause Hieron prescribes Rusticus the monk, 
that he be always occupied about some business or other, that the devil do not find him idle. Seneca would have a man do something, though it be to no purpose. Xenophon wisheth one rather to play at tables, dice, or make a gesture of himself, though he might be far better employed, than do nothing. The Egyptians of old, and many flourishing commonwealths since, have enjoined labour and exercise to all sorts of men, to be of some vocation and calling, and give an account of their time, to prevent those grievous mischiefs that come by idleness. For as fodder, whip, and burthen belong to the ass, so meet correction and work unto the servant. Ecclesiasticus 33.23 The Turks enjoin all men whatsoever, of what degree, to be of some trade or other. The Grand Signor himself is not excused. In our memory, saith Sabellicus, Mahomet the Turk, he that conquered Greece, at that very time, when he heard ambassadors of other princes, did either carve or cut wooden spoons, or frame something upon a table. This present sultan makes notches for bows. The Jews are most severe in this examination of time. All well-governed places, towns, families, and every discreet person will be a law unto himself. But amongst us the badge of gentry is idleness, to be of no calling, not to labour, for that's derogatory to their birth, to be a mere spectator, a drone, fruges consumere natus, to have no necessary employment to busy himself about in church and commonwealth, some few governors exempted, but to rise to eat, etc., to spend his days in hawking, hunting, etc., and such like disports and recreations, which our casuists tax, are the sole exercise almost and ordinary actions of our nobility, and in which they are too immoderate. And thence it comes to pass that in city and country so many grievances of body and mind, and this feral disease of melancholy so frequently rageth, and now domineers almost all over Europe amongst our great ones. They know not how to spend their time, disports excepted, which are all their business, what to do, or otherwise how to bestow themselves, like our modern Frenchmen that had rather lose a pound of blood in a single combat than a drop of sweat in any honest labour. Every man almost hath something or other to employ himself about, some vocation, some trade, but they do all by ministers and servants. Ad otia dun taxet se natos existimant, immo ad sui ipsius plerumque et aliorum perniciem. As one freely taxeth such kind of men, they are all for pastimes. Tis all their study, all their invention tends to this alone, to drive away time, as if they were born, some of them, to no other ends. Therefore, to correct and avoid these errors and inconveniences, our divines, physicians, and politicians so much labour and so seriously exhort. And for this disease in particular, there can be no better cure than continual business, as Rassis holds, to have some employment or other which may set their mind a work and distract their cogitations. Riches may not easily be had without labour and industry, nor learning without study, neither can our health be preserved without bodily exercise. If it be of the body, Guanerius allows that exercise which is gentle, and still after those ordinary frications which must be used every morning. Montaltus, chapter 26, and Jason Pratensis use almost the same words highly commending exercise, if it be moderate, a wonderful help so used, Crato calls it, and a great means to preserve our health, as adding strength to the whole body, increasing natural heat, by means of which the nutriment is well concocted in the stomach, liver, and veins, few or no crudities left, is happily distributed over all the body. Besides, it expels excrements by sweat and other insensible vapours, insomuch that Gallen prefers exercise before all physic, rectification of diet, or any regimen in what kind soever. Tis nature's physician. 
Fulgentius, out of Gordonius, terms exercise a spur of a dull, sleepy nature, the comforter of the members, cure of infirmity, death of diseases, destruction of all mischiefs and vices. The fittest time for exercise is a little before dinner, a little before supper, or at any time when the body is empty. Montanus, consultation 31, prescribes it every morning to his patient, and that, as Calenus adds, after he hath done his ordinary needs, rubbed his body, washed his hands and face, combed his head, and gargarized. What kind of exercise he should use, Gallen tells us, book two and three, de sanitate tuenda, and in what measure, till the body be ready to sweat and roused up. Ad ruborem, some say, non ad sudorem, lest it should dry the body too much. Others enjoin those wholesome businesses as to dig so long in his garden, to hold the plough, and the like. Some prescribe frequent and violent labour and exercises, as sawing every day so long together. Hippocrates confounds them, but that is in some cases to some peculiar men the most forbid, and by no means will have it go farther than a beginning sweat, as being perilous if it exceed. Of these labours, exercises, and recreations, which are likewise included, some properly belong to the body, some to the mind, some more easy, some hard, some with delight, some without, some within doors, some natural, some are artificial. Amongst bodily exercises, Galen commends ludum parvae pili to play at ball, be it with the hand or racket, in tennis courts or otherwise. It exerciseth each part of the body, and doth much good, so that they sweat not too much. It was in great request of old amongst the Greeks, Romans, barbarians, mentioned by Homer, Herodotus, and Plinius. Some write that Aganella, a fair maid of Corcyra, was the inventor of it, for she presented the first bowl that ever was made to Nausicaa, the daughter of King Alcinous, and taught her how to use it. The ordinary sports which are used abroad are hawking, hunting, hilares venandi labores, one calls them, because they recreate body and mind. Another, the best exercise that is, by which alone many have been freed from all feral diseases. Hegesippus, Book 1, Chapter 37, relates of Herod that he was eased of a grievous melancholy by that means. Plato, 7, De Legibus, highly magnifies it, dividing it into three parts, by land, water, air. Xenophon, in Cyropedia, graces it with a great name, Deorum Munus, the gift of the gods, a princely sport, which they have ever used, saith Langius, Epistle 59, Book 2, as well for health as pleasure, and do at this day, it being the sole almost and ordinary sport of our noblemen in Europe, and elsewhere all over the world. Bohemus stars it therefore, studium nobilium, communiter venantur, quod sibi solis licere contendunt, Tis all their study, their exercise, ordinary business, all their talk, and indeed some dote too much after it. They can do nothing else, discourse of naught else. Paulus Jovius doth in some sort tax our English nobility for it, for living in the country so much, and too frequent use of it, as if they had no other means but hawking and hunting to approve themselves gentlemen with. Hawking comes near to hunting, the one in the air as the other on the earth, a sport as much affected as the other, by some preferred. It was never heard of amongst the Romans, invented some twelve hundred years since, and first mentioned by Firmicus, Book 5, Chapter 8. The Greek emperors began it, and now nothing so frequent. He is nobody that in the season hath not a hawk on his fist. A great art, and many books written of it. It is a wonder to hear what is related of the Turks' officers in this behalf, how many thousand men are employed about it, how many hawks of all sorts, how much revenue is consumed on that only disport, how much time is spent at Adrianople alone every year to that purpose. The Persian kings hawk after butterflies with sparrows made to that use, 
and stairs, lesser hawks for lesser games they have, and bigger for the rest, that they may produce their sport to all seasons. The Muscovian emperors reclaim eagles to fly at hinds, foxes, etc., and such a one was sent for a present to Queen Elizabeth. Some reclaim ravens, castrils, pies, etc., and man them for their pleasures. Fowling is more troublesome, but all out as delightsome to some sorts of men, be it with guns, lime, nets, glades, gins, strings, baits, pitfalls, pipes, calls, stalking horses, setting dogs, decoy ducks, etc., or otherwise. Some much delight to take larks with day nets, small birds with chaff nets, plovers, partridge, herons, snipe, etc. Henry the Third, King of Castile, as Mariana the Jesuit reports of him, Book Three, Chapter Seven, was much affected with catching of quails, and many gentlemen take a singular pleasure at morning and evening to go abroad with their quail pipes, and will take any pains to satisfy their delight in that kind. The Italians have gardens fitted to such use, with nets, bushes, glades, sparing no cost or industry, and are very much affected with the sport. Tycho Brahe, that great astronomer, in the chorography of his Isle of Huna and Castle of Uraniburg, puts down his nets and manner of catching small birds as an ornament and recreation, wherein he himself was sometimes employed. Fishing is a kind of hunting by water, be it with nets, wheels, baits, angling or otherwise, and yields all out as much pleasure to some men as dogs or hawks. When they draw their fish upon the bank, saith Nicolaus Hensilius, Silesiographiae, chapter 3, speaking of that extraordinary delight his countrymen took in fishing and in making of pools. James Dubravius, that Moravian, in his book De Piscini et Piscium, telleth how travelling by the highway side in Silesia he found a nobleman booted up to the groins, wading himself, pulling the nets, and labouring as much as any fisherman of them all. And when some belike objected to him the baseness of his office, he excused himself that if other men might hunt hares, why should not he hunt carps? Many gentlemen in like sort with us will wade up to the armholes upon such occasions, and voluntarily undertake that to satisfy their pleasures, which a poor man for a good stipend would scarce be hired to undergo. Plutarch, in his book De Solertia Animalium, speaks against all fishing as a filthy, base, illiberal employment, having neither wit nor perspicacity in it, nor worth the labour. But he that shall consider the variety of baits for all seasons, and pretty devices which our anglers have invented, peculiar lines, false flies, several slights, etc., will say that it deserves like commendation, requires as much study and perspicacity as the rest, and is to be preferred before many of them, because hawking and hunting are very laborious, much riding, and many dangers accompany them, but this is still and quiet, and if so be the angler catch no fish, yet he hath a wholesome walk to the brookside, pleasant shade by the sweet silver streams. He hath good air, and sweet smells of fine fresh meadow flowers. He hears the melodious harmony of birds. He sees the swans, herons, ducks, water hens, coots, etc., and many other fowl, with their brood, which he thinketh better than the noise of hounds or blast of horns, and all the sport that they can make. Many other sports and recreations there be, much in use, as ringing, bowling, shooting, which Ascham recommends in a just volume, and hath in former times been enjoined by statute, as a defensive exercise, and an honour to our land, as well may witness our victories in France. Keelpins, trunks, quoits, pitching bars, hurling, wrestling, leaping, running, fencing, mustering, swimming, wasters, foils, football, balloon, quintain, etc., and many such, which are the common recreations of the country folks. 
riding of great horses, running at rings, tilts and tournaments, horse races, wild goose chases, which are the disports of greater men, and good in themselves, though many gentlemen by that means gallop quite out of their fortunes. But the most pleasant of all outward pastimes is that of Aretius, de ambulatio per moina loca, to make a petty progress, a merry journey now and then with some good companions, to visit friends, see cities, castles, towns. Visere saepamnes nitidos, per ammainaque tempe, et placida summi sectar in montibus auras to see the pleasant fields, the crystal fountains, and take the gentle air amongst the mountains, to walk amongst orchards, gardens, bowers, mounts and arbours, artificial wildernesses, green thickets, arches, groves, lawns, rivulets, fountains, and such like pleasant places, like that Antiochian Daphne, brooks, pools, fish-ponds, between wood and water, in a fair meadow, by a river-side, ubi variae avium cantationes, florum colores, pratorum frutices, etc., to disport in some pleasant plain, park, run up a steep hill sometimes, or sit in a shady seat, must needs be a delectable recreation. Hortus principis, et domus ad delectationem facta, cum silva monte et piscina vulgo la montagna the prince's garden at ferrara scotus highly magnifies with the groves mountains ponds for a delectable prospect he was much affected with it a persian paradise or pleasant park could not be more delectable in his sight st bernard in the description of his monastery is almost ravished with the pleasures of it a sick man, saith he, sits upon a green bank, and when the dog-star parcheth the plains and dries up rivers, he lies in a shady bower, fronde sub arborea ferventia temperat astra, and feeds his eyes with variety of objects, herbs, trees, to comfort his misery. He receives many delightsome smells, and fills his ears with that sweet and various harmony of birds, Good God, saith he, what a company of pleasures hast thou made for man! He that should be admitted on a sudden to the sight of such a palace as that of Escurial in Spain, or to that which the Moors built at Granada, Fontainebleau in France, the Turk's gardens in his seraglio, wherein all manner of birds and beasts are kept for pleasure, wolves, bears, lynxes, tigers, lions, elephants, etc., or upon the banks of that Thracian Bosphorus, the Pope's Belvedere in Rome, as pleasing as those haughty pensiles in Babylon, or that Indian king's delightsome garden in Aelian, or those famous gardens of the Lord Cantalo in France, could not choose, though he were never so ill-paid, but be much recreated for the time, or many of our noblemen's gardens at home. To take a boat in a pleasant evening, and with music to row upon the waters, which Plutarch so much applauds, Elian admires, upon the river Pineus, in those Thessalian fields, beset with green bays, where birds so sweetly sing that passengers, enchanted as it were with their heavenly music, omnium laborum et curarum oblivis cantur, forget forthwith all labours, care and grief. Or in a gondola through the Grand Canal in Venice, to see those goodly palaces, must needs refresh and give content to a melancholy dull spirit or to see those inner rooms of a fair-built and sumptuous edifice, as that of the Persian kings, so much renowned by Diodorus and Curtius, in which all was almost beaten gold, chairs, stools, thrones, tabernacles, and pillars of gold, plane trees and vines of gold, grapes of precious stones, and all the other ornaments of pure gold, Fulget gemma floris, et jaspide fulva supellex, strata micant tirio. 
with sweet odours and perfumes, generous wines, opiparous fare, etc., besides the gallantest young men, the fairest virgins, puellae scitulae ministrantes, the rarest beauties the world could afford, and those set out with costly and curious attires, ad stuporem usque spectantium, with exquisite music, as in Trimalchio's house, in every chamber sweet voices, ever sounding day and night, incomparabilis luxus, all delights and pleasures in each kind which to please the senses could possibly be devised or had, convives coronati, deliciis ebrii, etc. Telemachus in Homer is brought in as one ravished almost at the sight of that magnificent palace and rich furniture of Menelaus, when he beheld Iris fulgorem et resonantia tecto corusco, auro at quelectro nitido, secto quelefanto, argento que simul, talis jovis ardua sedes, aula que calicolum stellans splendescit olumpo. Such glittering of gold and brightest brass to shine, clear amber, silver pure, and ivory so fine, Jupiter's lofty palace, where the gods do dwell, was even such a one, and did it not excel. It will, laxare animus, refresh the soul of man to see fair-built cities, streets, theatres, temples, obelisks, etc. The temple of Jerusalem was so fairly built of white marble, with so many pyramids covered with gold, Tectumque templi fulvo coruscans auro, nimio suo fulgore obcaecabat oculos itinerantium, was so glorious and so glistened afar off, that the spectators might not well abide the sight of it. But the inner parts were all so curiously set out with cedar, gold, jewels, etc., as he said of Cleopatra's palace in Egypt, crassumque trabes absconderat aurum, that the beholders were amazed. What so pleasant as to see some pageant or sight go by, as at coronations, weddings, and such like solemnities, to see an ambassador or a prince met, received, entertained with masks, shows, fireworks, etc., to see two kings fight in single combat, as Porus and Alexander, Canute and Edmund Ironside, Scanderbeg and Ferat Bassa the Turk, when not honour alone but life itself is at stake, as the poet of Hector, nec enim pro tergore tauri, pro boe nec certamen erat, quae praemia cursus, esse solent, sed pro magni vira quanimaque Hectoris. To behold a battle fought, like that of Cressy, or Agincourt, or Poitiers, qua nescio, saith Foissart, an vetustas ullam profere posit clariorem, to see one of Caesar's triumphs in old Rome revived, or the like, to be present at an interview as that famous of Henry the Eighth and Francis the First, so much renowned all over Europe, ubi tanto apparatu, saith Hubertus Velius, Tamque triumphali pompa, ambo reges, cum maiorum coniugibus coere, ut nulla unquam aetas, tam calebria festa viderit aut audierit. Noe ever saw the like. So infinitely pleasant are such shows, to the sight of which oftentimes they will come hundreds of miles, give any money for a place, and remember many years after with singular delight. Bodine, when he was ambassador in England, said he saw the noblemen go in their robes to the Parliament House, summa cum jucunditate vidimus. He was much affected with the sight of it. Pomponius Columna, saith Jovius in his life, saw thirteen Frenchmen, and so many Italians, once fight for a whole army, quod jucundissimum spectaculum in vita dicit sua the pleasantest sight that ever he saw in his life. Who would not have been affected with such a spectacle? Or that single combat of Breot the Frenchman and Antony Schetz, a Dutchman, before the walls of Silvaducis in Brabant, anno 1600, 
They were twenty-two horse on the one side, as many on the other, which, like Livis Horatii, Torquati, and Corvini, fought for their own glory and country's honour, in the sight and view of their whole city and army. When Julius Caesar warred about the banks of Rhone, there came a barbarian prince to see him and the Roman army, and when he had beheld Caesar a good while, I see the gods now, saith he, which before I heard of, nec feliciorem ulam vitae mei aut optavi aut sensi diem. It was the happiest day that ever he had in his life. Such a sight alone were able of itself to drive away melancholy. If not for ever, yet it must needs expel it for a time. Radzivillus was much taken with the Pasha's palace in Cairo, and amongst many other objects which that palace afforded, with that solemnity of cutting the banks of the Nile by Ibram Pasha when it overflowed. Besides two or three hundred gilded galleys on the water, he saw two millions of men gathered together on the land, with turbans as white as snow, and twas a goodly sight. The very reading of feasts, triumphs, interviews, nuptials, tilts, tournaments, combats, and monomachies, is most acceptable and pleasant. Franciscus Modius hath made a large collection of such solemnities in two great tomes, which whoso will may peruse. The inspection alone of those curious iconographies of temples and palaces, as that of the Lateran Church in Albertus Durer, that of the Temple of Jerusalem in Josephus, Adricomius, and Villalpandus, that of the Escurial in Guadas, of Diana at Ephesus in Pliny, Nero's Golden Palace in Rome, Justinian's in Constantinople, that Peruvian Jugos in Cusco, ut non ab hominibus, sed a daimoniis constructum vidiatur, St. Mark's in Venice by Ignatius, with many such, Priscorum Artificum Opera, saith that interpreter of Pausanias, the rare workmanship of those ancient Greeks, in theatres, obelisks, temples, statues, gold, silver, ivory, marble images, non minore ferme cum leguntur, quam cum cernuntur, animum delectatione complent, affect one as much by reading almost as by sight. End of section 12section 13 of the anatomy of melancholy volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for further information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the anatomy of melancholy volume 2 by robert burton section 13 partition 2 section 2 member 4 Part two. The country hath his recreations, the city his several gymnics and exercises, may games, feasts, wakes, and merry meetings, to solace themselves. The very being in the country, that life itself is a sufficient recreation to some men to enjoy such pleasures as those old patriarchs did. Diocletian the emperor was so much affected with it that he gave over his sceptre and turned gardener. Constantine wrote twenty books of husbandry. Lysander, when ambassadors came to see him, bragged of nothing more than of his orchard. He sunt ordines me. What shall I say of Cincinnatus, Cato, Tully, and many such? How have they been pleased with it, to prune, plant, inoculate, and graft, to show so many several kinds of pears, apples, plums, peaches, etc. Nunc captare feras laqueo, nunc fallere visco, aquetia magnos canibus circundare saltus, insidias avibus moliri in kendere wepres. Sometimes with traps deceive, with line and string, to catch wild birds and beasts, encompassing the grove with dogs, and out of bushes firing, et nidos avium scrutari, etc. 
Eucundus, in his preface to Cato, Varro, Columella, etc., put out by him, confesseth of himself that he was mightily delighted with these husbandry studies, and took extraordinary pleasure in them. If the theory or speculation can so much affect, what shall the place and exercise itself, the practical part, do? The same confession I find in Herbastein, Porter, Camerarius, and many others, which have written of that subject. If my testimony were aught worth, I could say as much of myself, I am vere Saturnus. No man ever took more delight in springs, woods, groves, gardens, walks, fish-ponds, rivers, etc. But tantalus a labri sitiens fugientia captat flumina. And so do I. Welle licet, potiri non licet. Every palace, every city almost, hath its peculiar walks, cloisters, terraces, groves, theatres, pageants, games, and several recreations. Every country some professed gymnics to exhilarate their minds and exercise their bodies. The Greeks had their Olympian, Pythian, Isthmian, Nemian games, in honour of Neptune, Jupiter, Apollo, Athens hers, some for honour, garlands, crowns, for beauty, dancing, running, leaping, like our silver games. The Romans had their feasts, as the Athenians and Lacedaemonians held their public banquets, in Pritaneo, Panathanaeis, Thesperiis, Fiditiis, plays, Naumachies, places for sea-fights, theatres, amphitheatres able to contain seventy thousand men, wherein they had several delightsome shows to exhilarate the people, gladiators, combats of men with themselves, with wild beasts, and wild beasts one with another, like our bull-baitings or bear-baitings, in which many countrymen and citizens amongst us so much delight and so frequently use. Dancers on ropes, jugglers, wrestlers, comedies, tragedies, publicly exhibited at the emperor's and city's charge, and that with incredible cost and magnificence. In the Low Countries, as Metaron relates, before these wars, they had many solemn feasts, plays, challenges, artillery gardens, colleges of rhymers, rhetoricians, poets, and to this day such places are curiously maintained in Amsterdam, as appears by that description of Isacus Pontanus. So likewise, not long since at Freiburg in Germany, as is evident by that relation of Neander, they had ludos septenales, solemn plays every seven years, which Bocerus, one of their own poets, hath elegantly described. At nunc magnifico spectacula structa paratu, quid memorem, veteri non concessura quirino, ludorum pompa, etc. In Italy they have solemn declamations of certain select young gentlemen in Florence, like those reciters in old Rome, and public theatres in most of their cities, for stage players and others to exercise and recreate themselves. All seasons almost, all places have their several pastimes, some in summer, some in winter, some abroad, some within, some of the body, some of the mind, and diverse men have diverse recreations and exercises. Domitian, the emperor, was much delighted with catching flies, Augustus to play with nuts amongst children, Alexander Severus was often pleased to play with whelps and young pigs, Adrian was so wholly enamoured with dogs and horses that he bestowed monuments and tombs of them, and buried them in graves. In foul weather, or when they can use no other convenient sports, by reason of the time, as we do cock-fighting, to avoid idleness, I think, though some be more seriously taken with it, spend much time, cost, and charges, and are too solicitous about it. Severus used partridges and quails, as many Frenchmen do still, and to keep birds in cages, with which he was much pleased, when at any time he had leisure from public cares and businesses. He had, saith Lampridius, 
tame pheasants, ducks, partridges, peacocks, and some twenty thousand ring-doves and pigeons. Buspequius, the emperor's orator, when he lay in Constantinople and could not stir much abroad, kept for his recreation, busying himself to see them fed, almost all manner of strange birds and beasts. This was something, though not to exercise his body, yet to refresh his mind. Conradus Gessner, at Zürich, in Switzerland, kept so, likewise for his pleasure, a great company of wild beasts, and, as he saith, took great delight to see them eat their meat. Turkey gentlewomen, that are perpetual prisoners, still mewed up according to the custom of the place, have little else beside their household business, or to play with their children, to drive away time, but to dally with their cats, which they have in delitiis, as many of our ladies and gentlewomen use monkeys and little dogs. The ordinary recreations which we have in winter, and in most solitary times busy our minds with, are cards, tables and dice, shovel-board, chess-play, the philosopher's game, small trunks, shuttlecock, billiards, music, masks, singing, dancing, yule games, frolics, jests, riddles, catches, purposes, questions and commands, merry tales of errant knights, queens, lovers, lords, ladies, giants, dwarfs, thieves, cheaters, witches, fairies, goblins, friars, etc., such as the old woman told Psyche in Apuleius, Bocase's novels, and the rest, quarum auditione pueri delectantur, senes narratione, which some delight to hear, some to tell, all are well pleased with. Amaranthus the philosopher met Hermocles, Diophantus, and Philolaus, his companions, one day busily discoursing about Epicurus and Democritus's tenets, very solicitous which was most probable and came nearest to truth, to put them out of that surly controversy and to refresh their spirits, he told them a pleasant tale of Stratocles the physician's wedding, and of all the particulars, the company, the cheer, the music, etc., for he was new come from it, with which relation they were so much delighted that Philolaus wished a blessing to his heart, and many a good wedding, many such merry meetings might he be at, to please himself with the sight, and others with the narration of it. News are generally welcome to all our ears. Avide audimus, aures enim hominum novitate laetantur, as Pliny observes. We long after rumour to hear and listen to it. Densum humeris bibit aure vulgus. We are most part too inquisitive and apt to hearken after news, which Caesar, in his commentaries, observes of the old Gauls. They would be inquiring of every carrier and passenger what they had heard or seen, what news abroad. Quid toto fiat in orbe, quid seres, quid thraces agant, secreta noercae, et pueri, quis amet, etc., as at an ordinary with us, bakehouse or barber's shop, when that great Gonsalva was upon some displeasure confined by King Ferdinand to the city of Loja in Andalusia. The only comfort, saith Jovius, he had to ease his melancholy thoughts, was to hear news, and to listen after those ordinary occurrences which were brought him cum primis, by letters or otherwise, out of the remotest parts of Europe. Some men's whole delight is to take tobacco and drink all day long in a tavern or alehouse, to discourse, sing, jest, roar, talk of a cock and bull over a pot, etc., and when three or four good companions meet, tell old stories by the fireside or in the sun, as old folks usually do quae aprici meminere senes, remembering afresh and with pleasure ancient times, and such like accidents which happened in their younger years. Others' best pastime is to game, nothing to them so pleasant, hic veneri indulget, hunc de coquit alia. Many too nicely take exceptions at cards, tables and dice, and such mixed lusorious lots whom Gattaca well confutes. 
which, though they be honest recreations in themselves, yet may justly be otherwise accepted at, as they are often abused, and forbidden as things most pernicious. Insanam rem et damnosam, Lemnius calls it. For most part in these kind of disports, tis not art or skill, but subtlety, cony-catching, knavery, chance and fortune carried all away, tis ambulatoria pecunia, puncto mobilis horae permutat dominus et cedit in altera jura. They labour most part not to pass their time in honest disport, but for filthy lucre and covetousness of money. In foedissimum lucrum et avaritiam hominum convertitur, as Danaeus observes, fons fraudum et maleficiorum, tis the fountain of cousinage and villainy, a thing so common all over Europe at this day, and so generally abused, that many men are utterly undone by it, their means spent, patrimonies consumed, they and their posterity beggared. Besides swearing, wrangling, drinking, loss of time, and such inconveniences, which are ordinary concomitants, for when once they have got a haunt of such companies, and a habit of gaming, they can hardly be drawn from it, but as an itch it will tickle them, and as it is with whoremasters, once entered, they cannot easily leave it off. Wexat mentes insania cupido, they are mad upon their sport. And in conclusion, which Charles the Seventh, that good French king, published in an edict against gamesters, unde pii et hilaris vitae, suffugium sibi suisque liberis, totique familiae, etc., that which was once their livelihood, should have maintained wife, children, family, is now spent and gone. Maeror et gestas, etc. Sorrow and beggary succeeds. So good things may be abused, and that which was first invented to refresh men's weary spirits, when they come from other labours and studies, to exhilarate the mind, to entertain time and company, tedious otherwise in those long solitary winter nights and keep them from worse matters an honest exercise is contrarily perverted chess play is a good and witty exercise of the mind for some kind of men and fit for such melancholy rassis holds as are idle and have extravagant impertinent thoughts or troubled with cares nothing better to distract their mind and alter their meditations invented some say by the general of an army in a famine to keep soldiers from mutiny but if it proceed from overmuch study in such a case it may do more harm than good it is a game too troublesome for some men's brains too full of anxiety all out as bad as study besides it is a testy choleric game and very offensive to him that loseth the mate. William the Conqueror, in his younger years, playing at chess with the Prince of France, Dauphiné was not annexed to that crown in those days, losing a mate knocked the chessboard about his pate, which was a cause afterward of much enmity between them. For some such reason it is belike that Patritius forbids his prince to play at chess, Hawking and hunting, riding, etc., he will allow, and this to other men, but by no means to him. In Muscovy, where they live in stoves and hot houses all winter long, come seldom or little abroad, it is again very necessary, and therefore in those parts, saith Herbastein, much used. At Fez in Africa, where the like inconvenience of keeping within doors is through heat, it is very laudable and as leo affair relates as much frequented a sport fit for idle gentlewomen soldiers in garrison and courtiers that have naught but love matters to busy themselves about but not altogether so convenient for such as are students the like i may say of brooks's philosophy game dr fulke's metromachia and his oronomachia with the rest of those intricate astrological and geometrical fictions, for such especially as are mathematically given, and the rest of those curious games. 
dancing, singing, masking, mumming, stage plays, howsoever they be heavily censured by some severe Catos, yet if opportunely and soberly used, may justly be approved. Melius est foidere quam saltare, saith Austin. But what is that if they delight in it? Nemo saltat sobrius. But in what kind of dance? I know these sports have many oppuners, whole volumes writ against them, when, as all they say, if duly considered, is but ignoratio elenchi, and some again, because they are now cold and wayward, past themselves, cavil at all such youthful sports in others, as he did in the comedy. They think them illico nasci senes, etc. Some, out of preposterous zeal, object many times trivial arguments, and because of some abuse, will take away the good use, as if they should forbid wine, because it makes men drunk. But in my judgment they are too stern. There is a time for all things, a time to mourn, a time to dance, Ecclesiastes 3, 4, a time to embrace, a time not to embrace, verse 5, and nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, verse 22. For my part, I will subscribe to the king's declaration, and was ever of that mind. Those May games, wakes and wits and ales, etc., if they be not at unseasonable hours, may justly be permitted. Let them freely feast, sing and dance, have their puppet plays, hobby horses, tabors, crowds, bagpipes, etc., play at ball and barley breaks, and what sports and recreations they like best. In Franconia, a province of Germany, saith Albanus Bohemus, the old folks, after evening prayer, went to the alehouse, the younger sort to dance, and to say truth with Salisburiensis, Satius fuerat sic otiari quam turpius occupari, better to do so than worse, as without question otherwise, such is the corruption of man's nature, many of them will do. For that cause, plays, masks, jesters, gladiators, tumblers, jugglers, etc., and all that crew is admitted and winked at. Tota jocularium sena procedit, et idio spectacula admissa sunt, et infinita tirocinia vanitatum, ut his occupentur qui perniciosius otiari solent that they might be busied about such toys that would otherwise more perniciously be idle. So that, as Tacitus said of the astrologers in Rome, we may say of them, Genus hominum est quod in civitate nostra et vitabitur semper et retinabitur. They are a debauched company most part, still spoken against, as well they deserve some of them, for I so relish and distinguish them as fiddlers and musicians, and yet ever retained. Evil is not to be done, I confess, that good may come of it, but this is evil per accidens, and in a qualified sense, to avoid a greater inconvenience, may justly be tolerated. Sir Thomas More, in his utopian commonwealth, as he will have none idle, so will he have no man labour over hard, to be toiled out like a horse. Tis more than slavish infelicity, the life of most of our hired servants and tradesmen elsewhere, excepting his utopians, but half the day allotted for work, and half for honest recreation, or whatsoever employment they shall think fit for themselves. If one half day in a week were allowed to our household servants for their merry meetings by their hard masters, or in a year some feasts, like those Roman Saturnals, I think they would labour harder all the rest of their time, and both parties be better pleased. But this needs not, you will say, for some of them do naught but loiter all the week long. This which I aim at is for such as are fracti animis, troubled in mind, to ease them, over-toiled on the one part, to refresh, over-idle on the other, to keep themselves busied. And to this purpose, as any labour or employment will serve to the one, any honest recreation will conduce to the other, so that it be moderate and sparing, as the use of meat and drink, 
not to spend all their life in gaming, playing, and pastimes, as too many gentlemen do, but to revive our bodies and recreate our souls with honest sports, of which, as there be diverse sorts and peculiar to several callings, ages, sexes, conditions, so there be proper for several seasons, and those of distinct natures, to fit that variety of humours which is amongst them. That if one will not, another may, some in summer, some in winter, some gentle, some more violent, some for the mind alone, some for the body and mind. As to some it is both business and a pleasant recreation to oversee workmen of all sorts, husbandry, cattle, horses, etc., to build, plot, project, to make models, cast up accounts, etc., some without, some within doors, new, old, etc., as the season serveth, and as men are inclined. It is reported of Philippus Bonus, that good Duke of Burgundy, by Lodovicus Vives, Epistles, and Heuter in his history, that the said Duke, at the marriage of Eleonora, sister to the King of Portugal, at Bruges in Flanders, which was solemnized in the deep of winter, when, as by reason of unseasonable weather, he could neither hawk nor hunt, and was now tired with cards, dice, etc., and such other domestic sports, or to see ladies dance with some of his courtiers, he would in the evening walk disguised all about the town. It so fortuned, as he was walking late one night, he found a country fellow dead drunk, snorting on a bulk, he caused his followers to bring him to his palace, and there, stripping him of his old clothes, and attiring him after the court fashion, when he waked, he and they were all ready to attend upon his excellency, persuading him he was some great duke. The poor fellow, admiring how he came there, was served in state all the day long. After supper he saw them dance, heard music, and the rest of those court-like pleasures. But late at night, when he was well tippled and again fast asleep, they put on his old robes, and so conveyed him to the place where they first found him. Now the fellow had not made them so good sport the day before, as he did when he returned to himself. All the jest was to see how he looked upon it. In conclusion, after some little admiration, the poor man told his friends he had seen a vision, constantly believed it, would not otherwise be persuaded, and so the jest ended. Antiochus Epiphanes would often disguise himself, steal from his court, and go into merchants, goldsmiths, and other tradesmen's shops, sit and talk with them, and sometimes ride or walk alone, and fall aboard with any tinker, clown, serving-man, carrier, or whomsoever he met first. Sometimes he did ex insperato give a poor fellow money to see how he would look, or on set purpose lose his purse as he went, to watch who found it, and withal how he would be affected, and with such objects he was much delighted. Many such tricks are ordinarily put in practice by great men, to exhilarate themselves and others, all which are harmless jests, and have their good uses. End of section 13。section 14 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2, by Robert Burton, Section 14, Partition 2, Section 2, Member 4, Part 3. But amongst those exercises or recreations of the mind within doors, there is none so general, so aptly to be applied to all sorts of men, so fit and proper to expel idleness and melancholy, as that of study. Studia senectutem oblectant, adolescentiam alunt, secundas res ornant, adversis perfugium et solatium praebent, domi delectant, etc. 
find the rest in Tully, pro arcia poeta. What so full of content as to read, walk, and see maps, pictures, statues, jewels, marbles, which some so much magnify as those that Phidias made of old so exquisite and pleasing to be beheld, that as Chrysostom thinketh, if any man be sickly, troubled in mind, or that cannot sleep for grief, and shall but stand over against one of Phidias's images, he will forget all care, or whatsoever else may molest him in an instant. There be those as much taken with Michael Angelo's, Raphael de Urbino's, Francesco Francia's pieces, and many of those Italian and Dutch painters, which were excellent in their ages and esteem of it as a most pleasing sight to view those neat architectures, devices, escutcheons, coats of arms, read such books, to peruse old coins of several sorts in a fair gallery, artificial works, perspective glasses, old relics, Roman antiquities, variety of colours. A good picture is falsa veritas et muta poesis, and though, as Vive saith, Artificialia delectant, sed mox fastidimus, artificial toys please but for a time, yet who is he that will not be moved with them for the present? When Achilles was tormented and sad for the loss of his dear friend Patroclus, his mother Thetis brought him a most elaborate and curious buckler made by Vulcan, in which were engraven sun, moon, stars, planets, Sea, land, men fighting, running, riding, women scolding, hills, dales, towns, castles, brooks, rivers, trees, etc., with many pretty landscapes and perspective pieces, with sight of which he was infinitely delighted and much eased of his grief. Continuo eo spectaculo captus de lenito maerore oblectabatur in manibus tenens dei splendida dona. Who will not be affected so in like case, or see those well-furnished cloisters and galleries of the Roman cardinals, so richly stored with all modern pictures, old statues and antiquities? Cum se spectando recreet simul et legendo, to see their pictures alone, and read the description, as Boisardus well adds, whom will it not affect? which Bosius, Pomponius, Laetus, Marianus, Scotus, Cavalerius, Ligorius, etc., and he himself hath well performed of late. Or in some prince's cabinets, like that of the great dukes in Florence, of Felix Platerus in Basel, or noblemen's houses, to see such variety of attires, faces, so many, so rare, and such exquisite pieces, of men, birds, beasts, etc., to see those excellent landscapes, Dutch works and curious cuts of Sadlier of Prague, Albertus Dürer, Gautius Vrintes, etc., such pleasant pieces of perspective, Indian pictures made of feathers, China works, frames, thaumaturgical motions, exotic toys, etc. Who is he that is now wholly overcome with idleness, or otherwise involved in a labyrinth of worldly cares, troubles, and discontents, that will not be much lightened in his mind by reading of some enticing story, true or feigned, whereas in a glass he shall observe what our forefathers have done, the beginnings, ruins, falls, periods of commonwealths, private men's actions displayed to the life, etc. Plutarch therefore calls them secundas mensas et bellaria, the second course and junkets, because they were usually read at noblemen's feasts. Who is not earnestly affected with a passionate speech, well penned, an elegant poem, or some pleasant bewitching discourse, like that of Heliodorus? Ubi oblectatio quaedam placide fuit, cum hilaritate conjuncta. Julian the Apostate was so taken with an oration of Libanius, the sophister, that he confesseth he could not be quiet till he had read it all out. Legi orationem tuam magna ex parte, hesterna die anteprandium, pransus vero sine ulla intermissione totam absolvi. 
O argumenta, O compositionem! I may say the same of this or that pleasing tract, which will draw his attention along with it. To most kind of men it is an extraordinary delight to study, for what a world of books offers itself in all subjects, arts and sciences, to the sweet content and capacity of the reader. In arithmetic, geometry, perspective, optics, astronomy, architecture, sculpture, painting, of which so many and such elaborate treatises are of late written, in mechanics and their mysteries, military matters, navigation, riding of horses, fencing, swimming, gardening, planting, great tomes of husbandry, cookery, falconry, hunting, fishing, fowling, etc., with exquisite pictures of all sports, games, and what not. In music, metaphysics, natural and moral philosophy, philology, in policy, heraldry, genealogy, chronology, etc., they afford great tomes, or those studies of antiquity, etc., et quid subtilius arithmeticis inventionibus, quid jucundius musicis rationibus, quid divinius astronomicis, quid rectius geometricis demonstrationibus. What so sure, what so pleasant? He that shall but see that geometrical tower of Garazenda at Bologna in Italy, the steeple and clock at Strasbourg, will admire the effects of art, or that engine of Archimedes, to remove the earth itself, if he had but a place to fasten his instrument. Archimedes' cochlea, and rare devices to corrivate water, musical instruments and trisyllable echoes again, again, and again repeated, with myriads of such. What vast tomes are extant in law, physic, and divinity, for profit, pleasure, practice, speculation, in verse or prose, etc. Their names alone are the subject of whole volumes. We have thousands of authors of all sorts, many great libraries, full well furnished, like so many dishes of meat, served out for several pallets. And he is a very block that is affected with none of them. Some take an infinite delight to study the very languages wherein these books were written, Hebrew, Greek, Syriac, Chaldee, Arabic, etc., Methinks it would please any man to look upon a geographical map, suavi animum delectatione alicere, ob incredibilem rerum varietatem et jucunditatem, et ad pleniorem sui cognitionem excitare. Choreographical, topographical delineations, to behold, as it were, all the remote provinces, towns, cities of the world, and never to go forth of the limits of his study to measure by the seal and compass their extent, distance, examine their sight. Charles the Great, as Platina writes, had three fair silver tables, in one of which superficies was a large map of Constantinople, in the second Rome, neatly engraved, in the third an exquisite description of the whole world, and much delight he took in them, what greater pleasure can there now be than to view those elaborate maps of Ortelius, Mercator, Hondius, etc., to peruse those books of cities put out by Braunus and Hogenbergius, to read those exquisite descriptions of Maginus, Munster, Herrera, Light, Merula, Boterus, Leander, Albertus, Camden, Leo Afer, Andricomius, Nicholas Gerbelius, etc., those famous expeditions of Christophus Columbus, Americus Vespucius, Marcus Polus the Venetian, Ludovicus Vetomanus, Aloysius Caramustus, etc. Those accurate diaries of Portuguese, Hollanders, of Bartison, Oliver Arnault, etc. Hakluyt's voyages, Petrus Martyr's decades, Benzo, Lerius, Linschoten's relations, those Hodoiporicons are Megen, Broca the monk, Bredembarcius, Johannes Dublinius, Sands, etc., to Jerusalem, Egypt, and other remote places of the world, those pleasant itineraries of Paulus Henserus, Jorocus Sincerus, Dux Polonus, etc., to read Bellonius's observations, Petrus Gilius's surveys, those parts of America set out and curiously cut in pictures by Fratres Abri, 
to see a well-cut herbal, herbs, trees, flowers, plants, all vegetables expressed in their proper colours to the life, as that of Matiolus upon Dioscorides, Delacampius, Lobo, Bauhinus, and that last voluminous and mighty herbal of Beslar of Nuremberg, wherein almost every plant is to his own bigness. To see birds, beasts, and fishes of the sea, spiders, gnats, serpents, flies, etc., all creatures set out by the same art, and truly expressed in lively colours, with an exact description of their natures, virtues, qualities, etc., as hath been accurately performed by Aelian, Gesner, Ulysses, Algiovandus, Bellonius, Rontoletius, Hippolytus, Salvianus, etc., Arcana Caeli, Naturae Secreta, Ordinem Universi Scire, Maioris Felicitatis, et Cedinis Est, Quam Cogitatione, Quis Assequi Possit, Aut Mortalis Sperare. What more pleasing studies can there be than the mathematics, theoretical or practical parts, as to survey land, make maps, models, dials, etc., with which I was ever much delighted myself? Talis est mathematum pulcritudo, saith Plutarch, ut his in dignum sit divitiarum falleras istas et bulas, et puellaria spectacula comparari. Such is the excellence of these studies, that all those ornaments and childish bubbles of wealth are not worthy to be compared to them. Crede mihi, saith one, extingui dulce erit mathematicarum artium studio. I could even live and die with such meditation, and take more delight, true content of mind in them, than thou hast in all thy wealth and sport, how rich soever thou art. And, as Cardan well seconds me, honorificum magis est et gloriosum haec intelligere quam provinciis praesse, formosum auditem juvenem esse. The like pleasure there is in all other studies, to such as are truly addicted to them. Ea suavitas, one holds, ut cum quis ea degustaverit, quasi poculis circeis captus, non posit unquam abilis divelli. The like sweetness, which as Circe's cup bewitcheth a student, he cannot leave off, as well may witness those many laborious hours, days and nights, spent in the voluminous treatises written by them the same content. Julius Scaliger was so much affected with poetry that he broke out into a pathetical protestation. He had rather be the author of twelve verses in Lucan, or such an ode in Horace, than Emperor of Germany. Nicholas Gerbelius, that good old man, was so much ravished with a few Greek authors restored to light, with hope and desire of enjoying the rest, that he exclaims forthwith, Arabibus atque indis omnibus erimus ditiores. We shall be richer than all the Arabic or Indian princes. Of such esteem they were with him, incomparable worth and value. Seneca prefers Zeno and Chrysippus to doting Stoics, he was so much enamoured of their works, before any prince or general of an army and Orontius, the mathematician, so far admires Archimedes that he calls him divinum et homine maiorem, a petty god, more than a man. And well he might, for aught I see, if you respect fame or worth. Pindarus of Thebes is as much renowned for his poems as Epaminondas, Pelopidas, Hercules, or Bacchus, his fellow citizens, for their warlike actions. Et si famam respicias, non pauciores Aristotelis, quam Alexandri meminerunt. As Cardan notes, Aristotle is more known than Alexander, for we have a bare relation of Alexander's deeds. But Aristotle, totus vivit in monumentis, is whole in his works. Yet I stand not upon this. The delight is it which I aim at, so great pleasure, such sweet content there is in study. King James, 1605, when he came to see our University of Oxford, and amongst other edifices, now went to view that famous library, renewed by Sir Thomas Bodley, in imitation of Alexander, at his departure break out into that noble speech, If I were not a king, I would be a university man, 
and if it were so that I must be a prisoner, if I might have my wish, I would desire to have no other prison than that library, and to be chained together with so many good authors et mortuis magistris. So sweet is the delight of study, the more learning they have, as he that hath a dropsy, the more he drinks, the thirstier he is, the more they covet to learn. And the last day is prioris discipulus. Harsh at first learning is, radices amarcae, but fructus dulces, according to that of Isocrates, pleasant at last. The longer they live, the more they are enamoured with the muses. Heinzius, the keeper of the library at Leiden in Holland, was mewed up in it all the year long, and that which to thy thinking should have bred a loathing caused in him a greater liking. I no sooner, saith he, come into the library, but I bolt the door to me, excluding lust, ambition, avarice, and all such vices, whose nurse is idleness, the mother of ignorance, and melancholy herself, and in the very lap of eternity, amongst so many divine souls, I take my seat, with so lofty a spirit and sweet content, that I pity all our great ones and rich men that know not this happiness. I am not ignorant in the meantime, notwithstanding this which I have said, how barbarously and basely, for the most part, our ruder gentry esteem of libraries and books, how they neglect and contemn so great a treasure, so inestimable a benefit, as Aesop's cock did the jewel he found in the dunghill, and all through error, ignorance, and want of education. And tis a wonder withal, to observe how much they will vainly cast away in unnecessary expenses, quot modis periant, saith Erasmus, magnatibus pecuniae, quantum absumant, alia, scorta, computationes, profectiones non necessariae, pompae, bella quaesita, ambitio, colax, morio, ludio, etc., what in hawks, hounds, lawsuits, vain building, gormandizing, drinking, sports, plays, pastimes, etc. If a well-minded man to the muses would sue to some of them for an exhibition to the farther maintenance or enlargement of a work, be it college, lecture, library, or whatsoever else may tend to the advancement of learning, they are so unwilling, so averse, that they had rather see these which are already, with such cost and care erected, utterly ruined, demolished, or otherwise employed, for they repine many, and grudge at such gifts and revenues so bestowed, and therefore it were vain, as Erasmus well notes, well abhis, well anigotiatoribus, qui se mamonae dediderunt, improbum fortasse tali officium exigere to solicit or ask anything of such men that are likely damned to riches, to this purpose. For my part I pity these men, stultos jubio esse libenter, let them go as they are in the catalogue of ignoramus. How much, on the other side, are we all bound that are scholars to those munificent Ptolemies, bountiful Mycenases, heroical patrons, divine spirits, qui nobis haec otia fecerunt, Nam querit ille mihi semper Deus. These blessings, friend, a deity bestowed, for never can I deem him less than God, that have provided for us so many well-furnished libraries, as well in our public academies in most cities, as in our private colleges. How shall I remember Sir Thomas Bodley amongst the rest, Otho Nicholson, and the right reverend John Williams, Lord Bishop of Lincoln, with many other pious acts, who besides that at St. John's College in Cambridge, that in Westminster, is now likewise in Fieri, with a library at Lincoln, a noble precedent for all corporate towns and cities to imitate. O oh, quam te memorem, vir illustrissime, quibus elogiis! But to my task again. Whosoever he is, therefore, that is overrun with solitariness, or carried away with pleasing melancholy and vain conceits, and for want of employment knows not how to spend his time, or crucified with worldly care, I can prescribe him no better remedy than this of study, to compose himself to the learning of some art or science. Provided always that this malady proceed not from overmuch study, 
for in such case he adds fuel to the fire, and nothing can be more pernicious. Let him take heed he do not overstretch his wits, and make a skeleton of himself, or such enamoratos as read nothing but playbooks, idle poems, jests, Amadis de Gaulle, The Knight of the Sun, The Seven Champions, Palmerin de Oliva, Juan of Bordeaux, etc. Such many times prove in the end as mad as Don Quixote. Study is only prescribed to those that are otherwise idle, troubled in mind, or carried headlong with vain thoughts and imaginations, to distract their cogitations, although variety of study, or some serious subject, would do the former no harm, and divert their continual meditations another way. Nothing in this case better than study. Semper aliquid memoritere discant, saith Piso, let them learn something without book, transcribe, translate, etc., which Hyperius holds available of itself. The mind is erected thereby from all worldly cares, and hath much quiet and tranquillity. For, as Austin well hath it, tis scientia scientiarum, omni mele dulcior, omni pane suavior, omni vino hilarior. Tis the best nepenthe, surest cordial, sweetest alterative, presentest diverter. For neither, as Chrysostom well adds, those boughs and leaves of trees which are plashed for cattle to stand under, in the heat of the day, in summer, so much refresh them with their acceptable shade, as the reading of the scripture doth recreate and comfort a distressed soul, in sorrow and affliction. Paul bids pray continually, quod cibus corpori lectio animae facit, saith Seneca, as meat is to the body, such is reading to the soul. To be at leisure without books is another hell, and to be buried alive. Cardan calls a library the physic of the soul. Divine authors fortify the mind, make men bold and constant, and, as Hyperius adds, godly conference will not permit the mind to be tortured with absurd cogitations. Rasis enjoins continual conference to such melancholy men, perpetual discourse of some history, tale, poem, news, etc. Alternos sermones edere ac bibere, aeque iucunum quam cibus, sive potus, which feeds the mind as meat and drink doth the body, and pleaseth as much. And therefore the said Rasis, not without good cause, would have somebody still talk seriously, or dispute with them, and sometimes to cavil and wrangle, so that it break not out to a violent perturbation. For such altercation is like stirring of a dead fire to make it burn afresh, it wets a dull spirit, and will not suffer the mind to be drowned in those profound cogitations which melancholy men are commonly troubled with. Ferdinand and Alphonsus, kings of Aragon and Sicily, were both cured by reading the history, one of Curtius, the other of Livy, when no prescribed physic would take place. Camerarius relates as much of Lorenzo de Medici. Heathen philosophers are so full of divine precepts in this kind, that, as some think, they alone are able to settle a distressed mind. Sunt verba et voces, quibus hunc lenire dolorem, etc. Epictetus, Plutarch, and Seneca, qualis ille, quae tela, saith Lipsius, adversus omnes animi casus administrat, et ipsam mortem, quo modo vitia eripit, infert virtutes. When I read Seneca, methinks I am beyond all human fortunes, on the top of a hill above mortality. Plutarch saith as much of Homer, for which cause belike Niceratus in Xenophon was made by his parents to con Homer's Iliads and Odysseys without book, ut in virum bonum evaderet, as well to make him a good and honest man as to avoid idleness. If this comfort be got from philosophy, what shall be had from divinity? What shall Austin, Cyprian, Gregory, Bernard's divine meditations afford us? Qui quid sit pulcrum, quid turpe, quid utile, quid non, plenius et melius crisippo et crantore dicunt. Nay, what shall the scripture itself, which is like an apothecary's shop, wherein are all remedies for all infirmities of mind, purgatives, cordials, 
alteratives, corroboratives, lenitives, etc. Every disease of the soul, saith Austin, hath a peculiar medicine in the scripture. This only is required, that the sick man take the potion which God hath already tempered. Gregory calls it a glass wherein we see all our infirmities, ignitum colloquium, Psalm 119, verse 140. Or again, a charm. And therefore Hieron prescribes Rusticus the monk continually to read the scripture, and to meditate on that which he hath read. For, as mastication is to meet, so is meditation on that which we read. I would for these causes wish him that is melancholy to use both human and divine authors, voluntarily to impose some task upon himself to divert his melancholy thoughts, to study the art of memory, Cosmus Rosellius, Petrus Ravenna's Scencelius's Detectus, or practice brachigraphy, etc., that will ask a great deal of attention, or let him demonstrate a proposition in Euclid in his five last books, extract a square root, or study algebra, than which, as Clavius holds, in all human disciplines nothing can be more excellent and pleasant, so abstruse and recondite, so bewitching, so miraculous, so ravishing, so easy withal, and full of delight, omnem humanum captum superare videtur. By this means you may define ex ungue leonem, as the diverb is, by his thumb alone, the bigness of Hercules, or the true dimensions of the great Colossus, Solomon's temple, and Domitian's amphitheatre, out of a little part. By this art you may contemplate the variation of the twenty-three letters, which may be so infinitely varied, that the words complicated and deduced thence will not be contained within the compass of the firmament. Ten words may be varied forty thousand three hundred and twenty several ways. By this art you may examine how many men may stand one by another in the whole superficies of the earth. Some say a hundred and forty-eight billion, four hundred and fifty-six thousand, eight hundred million. Assignando singulis passum quadratum, assigning a square foot to each. How many men, supposing all the world as habitable as France, as fruitful and so long lived, may be born in sixty thousand years? And so may you demonstrate with Archimedes how many sands the mass of the whole world might contain, if all sandy, if you did but first know how much a small cube as big as a mustard seed might hold, with infinite such. But in all nature, what is there so stupendous as to examine and calculate the motion of the planets, their magnitudes, apogees, perigees, eccentricities, how far distant from the earth, the bigness, thickness, compass of the firmament, each star, with their diameters and circumference, apparent area, superficies, by those curious helps of glasses, astrolabes, sextants, quadrants, of which Tycho Brahe, in his mechanics, optics, divine optics, arithmetic, geometry, and such like arts and instruments. What so intricate and pleasing withal, as to peruse and practice Heron Alexandrinus's works, De Spiritalibus, De Machinis Bellicis, De Machina Se Movente, Jordani Nemoraii, De Ponderibus, Propositio Thirteen, that pleasant tract of Macometes Bragdedinus, De Superficierum Divisionibus, Apollonius's Conics, or Commandinus's labours in that kind, De Centro Gravitatis, with many such geometrical theorems and problems. Those rare instruments and mechanical inventions of Bessonus and Cardan to this purpose, with many such experiments intimated long since by Roger Bacon, in his tract De Secretis Artis et Naturae, as to make a chariot to move, sine animali, diving boats, to walk on the water by art, and to fly in the air, to make several cranes and pulleys, quibus homo trahat ad se mille homines, lift up and remove great weights, mills to move themselves, Archita's doves, Albertus's brazen head, and such thaumaturgical works. But especially to do strange miracles by glasses, of which Proclus and Bacon writ of old, 
burning glasses, multiplying glasses, perspectives, ut unus homo appareat exercitus, to see afar off, to represent solid bodies by cylinders and concaves, to walk in the air, ut veraciter videant, saith Bacon, aurum et argentum, et quiquid aliud volunt, et cum veniant ad locum visionis nihil inveniant which glasses are much perfected of late by Baptista Porta and Galileo, and much more is promised by Maginus and Midorgius to be performed in this kind. Otocousticon some speak of, to intend hearing, as the other do sight. Marcellus Vrenken, a Hollander, in his epistle to Burgravius, makes mention of a friend of his, that is about an instrument, quo videbit quae in altero horizonte sint, but our alchemists, methinks, and Rosicrucians afford most rarities, and are fuller of experiments. They can make gold, separate and alter metals, extract oils, salts, lees, and do more strange works than Geber, Lullius, Bacon, or any of those ancients. Crolius hath made after his master Paracelsus aurum fulminans, or aurum volatile which shall imitate thunder and lightning, and crack louder than any gunpowder. Cornelius dribble a perpetual motion, inextinguishable lights, linum non ardens, with many such feats. See his book, De Natura Elementorum. Besides hail, wind, snow, thunder, lightning, etc., those strange fireworks, devilish petards, and such like warlike machinations derived hence, of which read Tartalia and others. Ernestus Burgravius, a disciple of Paracelsus, hath published a discourse in which he specifies a lamp to be made of man's blood, lucerna vitae et mortis index, so he terms it, which chemically prepared forty days, and afterwards kept in a glass, shall show all the accidents of this life. Si lampus sic clarus, tuc homo hilaris et sanus corpore et animo, si nebulosus et depressus male afficitur, et sic prostatu hominis variatur, unde sumptus sanguis, and which is the most wonderful, it dies with the party, cum homine perit et evanescit. The lamp and the man whence the blood was taken are extinguished together. The same author hath another tract of Mumia, all out as vain and prodigious as the first, by which he will cure most diseases, and transfer them from a man to a beast, by drawing blood from one, and applying it to the other, well in plantam deriware, and an alexi pharmacum, of which Roger Bacon of old, in his tract, De retardanda senectute, to make a man young again, live three or four hundred years. Besides panaceas, martial amulets, unguentum armarium, balsams, strange extracts, elixirs, and such like magico-magnetical cures. Now what so pleasing can there be as the speculation of these things, to read and examine such experiments, or if a man be more mathematically given, to calculate or peruse Napier's logarithms, or those tables of artificial signs and tangents, not long since set out by mine old collegiate, good friend and late fellow student of Christ Church in Oxford, Mr. Edmund Gunter, which will perform that by addition and subtraction only, which heretofore Regio Montanus's tables did by multiplication and division, or those elaborate conclusions of his sector, quadrant and cross staff. Or let him that is melancholy calculate spherical triangles, square a circle, cast a nativity, which, howsoever some tax, I say with Garcaius, Dabimus hoc petulantibus ingeniis, we will in some cases allow. Or let him make an ephemerides, read Suisse the calculator's works, Scariger de emendatione temporum, and Petavius his adversary, till he understand them. Peru's subtle Scotus and Suarez's metaphysics, or school divinity, Occam, Thomas, Entisperus, Durand, etc. If those other do not affect him, and his means be great, to employ his purse and fill his head, he may go find the philosopher's stone. He may apply his mind, I say, to heraldry, antiquity, invent impresses, emblems, make epithalamiums, epitaphs, elegies, epigrams, 
palindroma epigrammata, anagrams, chronograms, acrostics, upon his friends' names, or write a comment on Martianus Capella, Tertullian de Palio, the Nubian geography, or upon Aelia Lilia Crispis, as many idle fellows have essayed, and rather than do nothing, very averse a thousand ways with Putian, so torturing his wits, or as Rhinerus of Luneburg, two thousand one hundred and fifty times in his Proteus Poeticus, or Scardiger, Chrysolithus, Clepicius, and others have in like sort done. If such voluntary tasks, pleasure and delight, or crabbedness of these studies, will not yet divert their idle thoughts and alienate their imaginations, they must be compelled, saith Christophorus a Vega, Cogi debent, Book 5, Chapter 14, upon some malt, if they perform it not, quod ex officio incumbat, loss of credit or disgrace, such as our public university exercises. For, as he that plays for nothing will not heed his game, no more will voluntary employment so thoroughly affect a student, except he be very intent of himself, and take an extraordinary delight in the study about which he is conversant. It should be of that nature, his business, which volens nolens he must necessarily undergo, and without great loss, mulct, shame, or hindrance, he may not omit. Now for women, instead of laborious studies, they have curious needleworks, cutworks, spinning, bone lace, and many pretty devices of their own making, to adorn their houses, cushions, carpets, chairs, stools. For she eats not the bread of idleness, Proverbs 31, 27, Quasivit lanam et linum confections, conserves, distillations, etc., which they show to strangers. Ipsa comes praeseis quaperis venientibus ultro, hospitibus monstrare solet, non segniter horas contestata suas, sed nec sibi de peri isse, which to her guests she shows with all her pelf, thus far, my maids, but this I did myself, this they have to busy themselves about, household offices, etc., neat gardens, full of exotic, versicolour, diversely varied, sweet-smelling flowers and plants in all kinds, which they are most ambitious to get, curious to preserve and keep, proud to possess, and much many times brag of. Their merry meetings and frequent visitations, mutual invitations in good towns I voluntarily omit, which are so much in use, gossiping among the meaner sort, etc. Old folks have their beads, an excellent invention to keep them from idleness, that are by nature melancholy, and past all affairs, to say so many paternosters, ave marias, creeds, if it were not profane and superstitious. In a word, body and mind must be exercised, not one, but both, and that in a mediocrity, otherwise it will cause a great inconvenience. If the body be overtired, it tires the mind. The mind oppresseth the body, as with students it oftentimes falls out, who, as Plutarch observes, have no care of the body, but compel that which is mortal to do as much as that which is immortal, that which is earthly as that which is ethereal. But as the ox, tired, told the camel, both serving one master, that refused to carry some part of his burden, before it were long he should be compelled to carry all his pack and skin to boot, which by and by, the ox being dead, fell out. The body may say to the soul, that will give him no respite or remission. A little after, an ague, vertigo, consumption, seizeth on them both. All his study is omitted, and they must be compelled to be sick together. He that tenders his own good estate and health must let them draw with equal yoke, both alike, that so they may happily enjoy their wished health. End of section 14。section 15 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion 
The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2, by Robert Burton, Section 15. Partition 2, Section 2, Member 5. Waking and Terrible Dreams Rectified As waking that hurts, by all means must be avoided, so sleep, which so much helps, by like ways, must be procured, by nature or art, inward or outward medicines, and be protracted longer than ordinary, if it may be, as being an especial help. It moistens and fattens the body, concocts and helps digestion, as we see in dormice and those alpine mice that sleep all winter, which Gesner speaks of, when they are found sleeping under the snow in the dead of winter, as fat as butter. It expels cares, pacifies the mind, refresheth the weary limbs after long work. Somne quies rerum, placidissime somne deorum, pax animi, quem cura fugit, qui corpora duris, fessa ministeriis mulces reparasque labore. Sleep, rest of things, O pleasing deity, peace of the soul which cares doth crucify, weary bodies refresh and mollify. The chiefest thing in all physic, Paracelsus calls it, omnia arcana gemarum superans et metallorum. The fittest time is two or three hours after supper, when as the meat is now settled at the bottom of the stomach, and tis good to lie on the right side first, because at that side the liver doth rest under the stomach, not molesting any way, but heating him as a fire doth a kettle, that is put to it. After the first sleep, tis not amiss to lie on the left side, that the meat may the better descend, and sometimes again on the belly, but never on the back. Seven or eight hours is a competent time for a melancholy man to rest, as Crater thinks. But as some do, to lie in bed and not sleep, a day or half a day together, to give assent to pleasing conceits and vain imaginations, is many ways pernicious. To procure this sweet, moistening sleep, it is best to take away the occasions, if it be possible, that hinder it, and then to use such inward or outward remedies which may cause it. Constat hodie, saith Boisardus in his tract De Magia, chapter 4. Multus ita fascinari ut noctes integras exigent insomnes, summa, in quietudine animorum et corporum. Many cannot sleep for witches and fascinations, which are too familiar in some places. They call it dare alicui malum noctem. But the ordinary causes are heat and dryness which must first be removed. A hot and dry brain never sleeps well. Grief, fears, cares, expectations, anxieties, great business, in orum ultramque otiose ut dormius, and all violent perturbations of the mind must in some sort be qualified before we can hope for any good repose. He that sleeps in the daytime, or is in suspense, fear, any way troubled in mind, or goes to bed upon a full stomach, may never hope for quiet rest in the night. Nec enim meritoria somnus admittunt, as the poet saith. Inns and such like troublesome places are not for sleep. One calls Osla, another Tapster. One cries and shouts, another sings, hoops, halloos. Absentum cantat amicam, multa prolutus vapa nauta atque viator. Who not accustomed to such noises can sleep amongst them? He that will intend to take his rest must go to bed animo securo, quieto et libero, with a secure and composed mind, in a quiet place. Omnia noctes erunt placida composta quiete. And if that will not serve, or may not be obtained, to seek then such means as are requisite. To lie in clean linen and sweet before he goes to bed, or in bed, to hear sweet music, which Ficinus commends, Book 1, Chapter 4, or, as Jobertus, Book 3, Chapter 10, to read some pleasant author till he be asleep, to have a basin of water still dropping by his bedside, or to lie near that pleasant murmur, Lene sonantis aquae. Some floodgates, arches, falls of water, like London Bridge, or some continuate noise which may benumb the senses, Lenis motus, Silentium et tenebra, tum et ipsa voluntas somnus faciunt. 
as a gentle noise to some procure sleep, so which Bernardinus Telesius, Liber de Somno, well observes, silence in a dark room, and the will itself, is most available to others. Piso commends frications, and uborde a good draught of strong drink before one goes to bed. I say, a nutmeg and ale, or a good draught of muscadine with a toast and nutmeg, or a posset of the same, which many use in a morning, but methinks for such as have dry brains are much more proper at night. Some prescribe a sup of vinegar as they go to bed, a spoonful, saith Aetius Tetra Biblos, Book 2, Chapter 10, Book 6, Chapter 10, Egit Netta, Book 3, Chapter 14, Piso, a little after meat, because it rarefies melancholy, and procures an appetite to sleep. Donatus and Mercurialis approve of it, if the malady proceed from the spleen. Salustius Salvianus, Book 2, Chapter 1, De Remediis, Hercules de Saxonia in Aelinus Montaltus de Morbibus Capitis, Chapter 28, De Melancholia, are altogether against it. Lodovicus Mercatus in some cases doth allow it. Rassus seems to deliberate of it, though Simeon commends it, in source peradventure. He makes a question of it, as for baths, fomentations, oils, potions, simples or compounds, inwardly taken to this purpose, I shall speak of them elsewhere. If, in the midst of the night, when they lie awake, which is usual to toss and tumble and not sleep, Ranzovius would have them, if it be in warm weather, to rise and walk three or four turns, till they be cold, about the chamber, and then go to bed again. Against fearful and troublesome dreams, incubus and such inconveniences, wherewith melancholy men are molested, the best remedy is to eat a light supper, and of such meats as are easy of digestion no hare, venison, beef, etc., not to lie on his back, nor to meditate or think in the daytime of any terrible objects, or especially talk of them before he goes to bed. For, as he said in Lucian after such conference, Hecates somniare mihi videor. I can think of nothing but hobgoblins, and as Tully notes, for the most part our speeches in the daytime cause our fantasy to work upon the like in our sleep which Ennius writes of Homer, et carnis insomnis leporis vestigia latrat. As a dog dreams of a hare, so do men on such subjects they thought on last. Somnia quae mentes ludunt volitantibus umbris, nec delubra deum, nec ab ethere numina mitunt, sed sibi quisque facit, etc. For that cause when Ptolemy, king of Egypt, had posed the seventy interpreters in order, and asked the nineteenth man what would make one sleep quietly in the night. He told them the best way was to have divine and celestial meditations, and to use honest actions in the daytime. Lodovicus Vives wonders how schoolmen could sleep quietly, and were not terrified in the night or walk in the dark. They had such monstrous questions, and thought of such terrible matters all day long. They had need, amongst the rest, to sacrifice to God Morpheus, whom Philostratus paints in a white and black coat, with a horn and ivory box full of dreams, of the same colours, to signify good and bad. If you will know how to interpret them, read Artemidorus, Sambucus, and Cardan. But how to help them, I must refer you to a more convenient place. End of section 15《Section 16 of the Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2 by Robert Burton. Section 16. Partition 2, Section 2, Member 6, Subsection 1. Perturbations of the mind rectified, from himself by resisting to the utmost, confessing his grief to a friend, etc. Whoever he is that shall hope to cure this malady in himself or any other, must first rectify these passions and perturbations of the mind. The chiefest cure consists in them. 
A quiet mind is that voluptus, or summum bonum of Epicurus, non dolere, curis vacare, animo tranquillo esse, not to grieve, but to want cares, and have a quiet soul, is the only pleasure of the world, as Seneca truly recites his opinion, not that of eating and drinking, which injurious Aristotle maliciously puts upon him, and for which he is still mistaken, male audit et vapulat, slandered without a cause, and lashed by all posterity. Fear and sorrow, therefore, are especially to be avoided, and the mind to be mitigated with mirth, constancy, good hope. Vain terror, bad objects, are to be removed, and all such persons in whose companies they be not well pleased. Fernelius, Concilium 43, Mercurialis, Concilium 6 Piso, Jacinus, Chapter 15, in 9 Rasis, Capivaccius, Hildesheim, etc., all inculcate this as an especial means of their cure, that their minds be quietly pacified, vain conceits diverted, if it be possible, with terrors, cares, fixed studies, cogitations, and whatsoever it is that shall any way molest or trouble the soul, because that otherwise there is no good to be done. The body's mischiefs, as Plato proves, proceed from the soul, and if the mind be not first satisfied, the body can never be cured. Alcibiades raves, saith Maximus Tyrius, and his sick, his furious desires carry him from Lycius to the pleading place, thence to the sea, so into Sicily, thence to Lacedaemon, thence to Persia, thence to Samos, then again to Athens. Critias tyranniseth over all the city, Sardanapalus is lovesick. These men are ill-affected all, and can never be cured, till their minds be otherwise qualified. Crato, therefore, in that often cited counsel of his for a nobleman his patient, when he had sufficiently informed him in diet, air, exercise, venus, sleep, concludes with these as matters of greatest moment. Quod reliquum est animae accidentia corrigantur, from which alone proceeds melancholy. They are the fountain, the subject, the hinges whereon it turns, and must necessarily be reformed. For anger stirs choler, heats the blood and vital spirits. Sorrow on the other side refrigerates the body, and extinguisheth natural heat, overthrows appetite, hinders concoction, dries up the temperature, and perverts the understanding. Fear dissolves the spirits, infects the heart, attenuates the soul, and for these causes all passions and perturbations must, to the uttermost of our power, and most seriously, be removed. Aelianus Montaltus attributes so much to them, that he holds the rectification of them alone to be sufficient to the cure of the melancholy in most patients. Many are fully cured when they have seen or heard, etc., enjoy their desires, or be secured and satisfied in their minds. Galen, the common master of them all, from whose fountain they fetch water, brags, book one, de sanitate to render, that he for his part has cured divers of this infirmity, solum animus ad rectum institutis, by right settling alone of their minds. Yea, but you will here infer that this is excellent good, indeed if it could be done, but how shall it be effected? By whom? What art? What means? Hic labo, hic opus est. Tis a natural infirmity, a most powerful adversary. All men are subject to passions, and melancholy above all others, as being distempered by their innate humours, abundance of choler adust, weakness of parts, outward occurrences, and how shall they be avoided? The wisest men, greatest philosophers of most excellent wit, reason, judgment, divine spirits, cannot moderate themselves in this behalf, such as are sound in body and mind, stoics, heroes, Homer's gods, all are passionate and furiously carried sometimes. And how shall we that are already crazed, fracti animis, sick in body, sick in mind, resist? We cannot perform it. You may advise and give good precepts, as who cannot, but how shall they be put in practice? I may not deny it, but our passions are violent, and tyrannize of us. Yet there be means to curb them, though they be headstrong. They may be tamed, 
they may be qualified, if he himself or his friends will use their honest endeavours, or make use of such ordinary helps as are commonly prescribed. He himself, I say. From the patient himself the first and chiefest remedy must be had. For if he be averse, peevish, waspish, give way wholly to his passions, will not seek to be helped or be ruled by his friends, how is it possible he should be cured? But if he be willing at least, gentle, tractable, and desire his own good, no doubt he may magnum morbi deponere partum, be eased at least, if not cured. He himself must do his utmost endeavour to resist and withstand the beginnings. Principius obsta. Give not water passage, no, not a little. Ecclesiasticus 25.27. If they open a little, they will make a greater breach at length. Whatsoever it is that runneth in his mind, vain conceit, be it pleasing or displeasing, which so much affects or troubleth him, by all possible means he must withstand it. Expel those vain, false, frivolous imaginations, absurd conceits, feigned fears and sorrows, from which, saith Piso, this disease primarily proceeds, and takes his first occasion or beginning by doing something or other that shall be opposite unto them, thinking of something else, persuading by reason, or howsoever, to make a sudden alteration of them. Though he have hitherto run in a full career, and precipitated himself, following his passions, giving reins to his appetite, let him now stop upon a sudden, curb himself in, and as Lemnius adviseth, strive against with all his power, to the utmost of his endeavour, and not cherish those fond imaginations which so covertly creep into his mind, most pleasing and amiable at first, but bitter as gall at last, and so headstrong, that by no reason, art, counsel, or persuasion they may be shaken off. Though he be far gone, and habituated into such fantastical imaginations, yet, as Tully and Plutarch advise, let him oppose, fortify, or prepare himself against them, by premeditation, reason, or, as we do by a crooked staff, bend himself another way. Tu tamen interrea effugito, quae tristia mentem solicitant, Procul esse jube curasque mentumque palentum, ultrices iras sint omnia laeta. In the meantime, expel them from thy mind, pale fears, sad cares, and griefs which do it grind, revengeful anger, pain, and discontent. Let all thy soul be set on merriment. Curas tolle graves, erasque crede profanum. If it be idleness hath caused this infirmity, or that he perceive himself given to solitariness, to walk alone, and please his mind with fond imaginations, let him by all means avoid it. Tis a bosom enemy, tis delightsome melancholy, a friend in show, but a secret devil, a sweet poison, it will in the end be his undoing. Let him go presently, task or set himself a work, get some good company. If he proceed, as a gnat flies about a candle, so long till at length he burn his body, so in the end he will undo himself. If it be any harsh object, ill company, let him presently go from it. If by his own default, through ill diet, bad air, want of exercise, etc., let him now begin to reform himself. It would be a perfect remedy against all corruption, if, as Roger Bacon hath it, we could but moderate ourselves in those six non-natural things. If it be any disgrace, abuse, temporal loss, calumny, death of friends, imprisonment, banishment, be not troubled with it, do not fear, be not angry, grieve not at it, but with all courage sustain it. Gordonius. Tu contra audientio ito. If it be sickness, ill success, or any adversity that hath caused it, oppose an invincible courage. Fortify thyself by God's word, or otherwise, mala bonus persuadenda, set prosperity against adversity, as we refresh our eyes by seeing some pleasant meadow, fountain, picture, or the like. Recreate thy mind by some contrary object, with some more pleasing meditation divert thy thoughts. Yea, but if you infer again, facile consilium damus aliis, 
we can easily give counsel to others. Every man, as the saying is, can tame a shrew, but he that hath her. Si hic esses, alita sentires. If you were in our misery, you would find it otherwise. Tis not so easily performed. We know this to be true. We should moderate ourselves, but we are furiously carried. We cannot make use of such precepts. We are overcome, sick, male sani, distempered and habituated to these courses. We can make no resistance. You may as well bid him that is diseased not to feel pain, as a melancholy man not to fear, not to be sad. Tis within his blood, his brains, his whole temperature. It cannot be removed. But he may choose whether he will give way too far unto it. He may in some sort correct himself. A philosopher was bitten with a mad dog, and as the nature of that disease is to abhor all waters and liquid things, and to think they still see the picture of a dog before them, he went for all this, reluctante se, to the bath, and seeing there, as he thought, in the water the picture of a dog, with reason overcame this conceit, quid cane cum balneo, what should a dog do in a bath? A mere conceit. Thou thinkest thou hearest and seest devil, black men, etc. Tis not so. Tis thy corrupt fantasy. Settle thine imagination. Thou art well. Thou thinkest thou hast a great nose. Thou art sick. Every man observes thee, laughs thee to scorn. Persuade thyself, tis no such matter. This is fear only, and vain suspicion. Thou art discontent. Thou art sad and heavy, but why, upon what ground? Consider of it. Thou art jealous, timorous, suspicious. For what cause? Examine it thoroughly, thou shalt find none at all, or such as is to be contemned, such as thou wilt surely deride and contemn in thyself when it is past. Rule thyself then with reason, satisfy thyself, Accustom thyself, wean thyself from such fond conceits, vain fears, strong imaginations, restless thoughts. Thou mayst do it. Est in nobis asuascere, as Plutarch saith. We may frame ourselves as we will. As he that useth an upright shoe may correct the obliquity or crookedness by wearing it on the other side, we may overcome passions if we will. Quicquid sibi imperavit, animus obtinuit, as Seneca saith. Nulli tam feri affectus, ut non disciplina per domentur. Whatsoever the will desires, she may command. No such cruel affections, but by discipline they may be tamed. Voluntarily thou wilt not do this or that, which thou oughtest to do, or refrain, etc., but when thou art lashed like a dull jade, thou wilt reform it. Fear of a whip will make thee do, or not do. Do that voluntarily, that which thou canst do, and must do by compulsion. Thou mayst refrain if thou wilt, and master thine affections. As in a city, saith Melanchthon, they do by stubborn rebellious rogues, that will not submit themselves to political judgment compel them by force. So must we do by our affections. If thy heart will not lay aside those vicious motions, and the fantasy those fond imaginations, we have another form of government to enforce and refrain our outward members, that they be not led by our passions. If appetite will not obey, let the moving faculty overrule her, let her resist and compel her to do otherwise. In an ague the appetite would drink. Sore eyes that itch would be rubbed, but reason saith no, and therefore the moving faculty will not do it. Our fantasy would intrude a thousand fears, suspicions, chimeras upon us, but we have reason to resist. Yet we let it be overborne by our appetite. Imagination enforceth spirits, which, by an admirable league of nature, compel the nerves to obey, and they are several limbs. We give too much way to our passions, 
and as to him that is sick of an ague, all things are distasteful and unpleasant. Non ex cibi vitio, saith Plutarch, not in the meat, but in our taste. So many things are offensive to us, not of themselves, but out of our corrupt judgment, jealousy, suspicion, and the like. We pull these mischiefs upon our own heads. If then our judgment be so depraved, our reason overruled, will precipitated, that we cannot seek our own good, or moderate ourselves, as in this disease commonly it is, the best way for ease is to impart our misery to some friend, not to smother it up in our own breast, aliter vitium, crescitque tegendo, etc., and that which was most offensive to us, a cause of fear and grief, quod nunc te coquit, another hell. For strangulat inclusus dolor atque exaestuat intus, grief concealed strangles the soul, but when, as we shall but impart it to some discreet, trusty, loving friend, it is instantly removed, by his counsel, happily, wisdom, persuasion, advice, his good means, which we could not otherwise apply unto ourselves. A friend's counsel is a charm, like mandrake wine, call us sop it, and as a ball that is tied to a fig tree becomes gentle on a sudden, which some, saith Plutarch, interpret of good words. So is a savage, obdurate heart mollified by fair speeches. All adversity finds ease in complaining, as Isidore holds, and tis a solace to relate it. Agathi de paraphasis est in etairu. Friends' confabulations are comfortable at all times, as fire in winter, shade in summer. Quale sopor fessis in gramine, meat and drink to him that is hungry or athirst. Democritus's collyrium is not so sovereign to the eyes as this to the heart. Good words are cheerful and powerful of themselves, but much more from friends, as so many props, mutually sustaining each other like ivy and a wall, which Carnivarius hath well illustrated in an emblem. Lenit animum simplex vel saipe narratio. The simple narration many times easeth our distressed mind, and in the midst of greatest extremities, so diverse have been relieved by exonerating themselves to a faithful friend. He sees that which we cannot see for passion and discontent. He pacifies our minds. He will ease our pain, assuage our anger. Quante inde voluptas, quanta securitas, Chrysostom adds. What pleasure, what security by that means? Nothing so available. Or that so much refresheth the soul of man. Tully, as I remember, in an epistle to his dear friend Atticus, much condoles the defects of such a friend. I live here, saith he, in a great city, where I have a multitude of acquaintance, but not a man of all that company with whom I dare familiarly breathe, or freely jest. Wherefore I expect thee, I desire thee, I send for thee, for there be many things which trouble and molest me, which had I but thee in presence, I could quickly disburden myself of in a walking discourse. The like peradventure may he and he say with that old man in the comedy, Nemo est maiorum amicorum hodie, apud quem ex promere occulta mea audiam. And much inconvenience may both he and he suffer in the meantime by it. He or he, or whosoever then labours of this malady, by all means let him get some trusty friend, semper habens pilademque aliquem qui curet orestem, a pylades, to whom freely and securely he may open himself. For as in all other occurrences, so it is in this, si quis in calum ascendisset, etc., as he said in Tully. If a man had gone to heaven, seen the beauty of the skies, stars errant, fixed, etc., in suavis erit admiratio, it will do him no pleasure, except he have somebody to impart what he hath seen. It is the best thing in the world, as Seneca therefore adviseth in such a case, to get a trusty friend, to whom we may freely and sincerely pour out our secrets. Nothing so delighteth and easeth the mind, as when we have a prepared bosom, to which our secrets may descend, of whose conscience we are assured. 
as our own, whose speech may ease our succorless estate, counsel relieve, mirth expel our mourning, and whose very sight may be acceptable unto us. It was the counsel which that politic Comineus gave to all princes and others distressed in mind, by occasion of Charles, Duke of Burgundy, that was much perplexed, first to pray to God and lay himself open to him, and then to some special friend, whom we hold most dear, to tell all our grievances to him. Nothing so forcible to strengthen, recreate, and heal the wounded soul of a miserable man. End of section 16Section 17 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2, by Robert Burton, Section 17. Partition 2, Section 2, Number 6, Subsections 2 to 3. Subsection 2. Help from friends by counsel, comfort, fair and foul means, witty devices, satisfaction, alteration of his course of life, removing objects, etc. When the patient of himself is not able to resist or overcome these heart-eating passions, his friends or physician must be ready to supply that which is wanting. Sue erit humanitatis et sapientiae, which Tully enjoineth in like case. Siquid erratum curare, aut improvisum suae diligentia corrigere. They must all join, nec satis medico, saith Hippocrates. Suum fecisse officium, nisi suum corque egrotus. Suum astantes, etc. First, they must especially beware a melancholy, discontented person, be it in what kind of melancholy soever, never be left alone or idle, but as physicians prescribe physic, cum custodia, let them not be left unto themselves, but with some company or other, lest by that means they aggravate and increase their disease. Non oportet egros fungus modi esse solis vel inter ignotos, vel inter eos cors non amant aut negligunt, as Rodericus a Fonseca, tome 1, consultation 35, prescribes. Lugentes custodire solemnus, saith Seneca, ne solitudine male utanto. We watch a sorrowful person, lest he abuse his solitariness. And so should we do a melancholy man, set him about some business, exercise or recreation, which may divert his thoughts, and still keep him otherwise intent. For his fantasy is so restless, operative and quick, that if he be not in perpetual action, ever employed, it will work upon itself, melancholize, and be carried away instantly, with some fear, jealousy, discontent, suspicion, some vain conceit or other. If his weakness be such that he cannot discern what is amiss, correct or satisfy, it behoves them by counsel, comfort or persuasion, by fair or foul means, to alienate his mind by some artificial invention, or some contrary persuasion, to remove all objects, causes, companies, occasions, as may any way molest him, to humour him, please him, divert him, and if it be possible, by altering his course of life, to give him security and satisfaction. If he conceal his grievances, and will not be known of them, they must observe by his looks, postures, motions, fantasy, what it is that offends, and then to apply remedies unto him. Many are instantly cured when their minds are satisfied. Alexander makes mention of a woman, that by reason of her husband's long absence in travel, was exceeding peevish and melancholy. But when she heard her husband was returned, beyond all expectation, at the first sight of him 
she was freed from all fear, without help of any other physic restored to her former health. Trincavelius, Concilium 12, Book 1, hath such a story of a Venetian, that being much troubled with melancholy and ready to die for grief, when he heard his wife was brought to bed of a son, instantly recovered. As Alexander concludes, if our imaginations be not inveterate, by this art they may be cured, especially if they proceed from such a cause. No better way to satisfy than to remove the object, cause, occasion, if by any art or means possible we may find it out. If he grieve, stand in fear, be in suspicion, suspense, or any way molested, secure him, solvator malum, give him satisfaction, the cure is ended. Alter his course of life, there needs no other physic. If the party be sad or otherwise affected, consider, saith Trallianus, the manner of it, all circumstances, and forthwith make a sudden alteration by removing the occasions, avoid all terrible objects heard or seen, monstrous and prodigious aspects, tales of devils, spirits, ghosts, tragical stories, to such as are in fear they strike a great impression, renewed many times, and recall such chimeras and terrible fictions into their minds. Make not so much a mention of them in private talk, or a dumb show tending to that purpose. Such things, saith Galateus, are offensive to their imaginations, and to those that are now in sorrow, Seneca forbids all sad companions and such as lament. A groaning companion is an enemy to quietness. Or if there be any such party at whose presence the patient is not well pleased, he must be removed. Gentle speeches and fair means must first be tried, no harsh language used or uncomfortable words, and not expel, as some do, one madness with another. He that so doth is madder than the patient himself. All things must be quietly composed, eversa non ever tenda, sed erigenda. Things down must not be dejected, but reared, as Crato counselleth. He must be quietly and gently used, and we should not do anything against his mind, but by little and little effect. As a horse that starts at a drum or trumpet, and will not endure the shooting of a piece, may be so manned by art, and animated that he cannot only endure, but is much more generous at the hearing of such things, much more courageous than before, and much delighteth in it. They must not be reformed ex abrupto, but by all art and insinuation, made to such companies, aspects, objects, they could not formerly away with. Many at first cannot endure the sight of a green wound, a sick man, which afterward become good chirurgeons, bold empirics. A horse starteth at a rotten post afar off, which coming near he quietly passeth. "'Tis much in the manner of making such kind of persons, "'be they never so averse from company, bashful, solitary, timorous, "'they may be made at last with those Roman matrons "'to desire nothing more than in a public show "'to see a full company of gladiators breathe out their last. "'If they may not otherwise be accustomed "'to brook such distasteful and displeasing objects, "'the best way, then, is generally to avoid them. "'Montanus, Concilium 229 to the Earl of Montfort, a courtier, and his melancholy patient, adviseth him to leave the court, by reason of those continual discontents, crosses, abuses, cares, suspicions, emulations, ambition, anger, jealousy, which that place afforded, and which surely caused him to be so melancholy at the first. Maxima quaequai domus servis et plena superbit. A company of scoffers and proud jacks are commonly conversant, and attend such places, and able to make any man that is of a soft, quiet disposition, as many times they do, ex stulto insanum. If once they humour him, a very idiot or stark mad, a thing too much practised in all common societies, and they have no better sport than to make themselves merry by abusing some silly fellow or to take advantage of another man's weakness. 
in such cases as in a plague the best remedy is quito longe tarde for to such a party especially if he be apprehensive there can be no greater misery to get him quickly gone far enough off and not to be over hasty in his return if he be so stupid that he do not apprehend it his friends should take some order and by their discretion supply that which is wanting in him as in all other cases they ought to do if they see a man melancholy given solitary averse from company please himself with such private and vain meditations though he delight in it they ought by all means seek to divert him to dehort him and to tell him of the event and danger that may come of it if they see a man idle that by reason of his means otherwise will betake himself to no course of life they ought seriously to admonish him he makes a noose to entangle himself his want of employment will be his undoing if he hath sustained any great loss suffered a repulse disgrace etc if it be possible relieve him if he desire aught let him be satisfied if in suspense fear suspicion let him be secured and if it may conveniently be give him his heart's content for the body cannot be cured till the mind be satisfied socrates in plato would prescribe no physic for carmides headache till first he had eased his troubled mind body and soul must be cured together as head and eyes oculum non curabis sine tote capite nec caput sine toto corpora nec totum corpus sine anima if that may not be hoped or expected yet ease him with comfort cheerful speeches fair promises and good words persuade him advise him many saith galen have been cured by good counsel and persuasion alone heaviness of the heart of man doth bring it down but a good word rejoiceth it proverbs twelve twenty five and there is he that speaketh words like the pricking of a sword but the tongue of a wise man is health namque saupii animi est remedium a gentle speech is the true cure of a wounded soul as plutarch contends out of aeschylus and euripides if it be wisely administered it easeth grief and pain as diverse remedies do many other diseases tis incantationis instar a charm estuantis animi lefrigirium that true nepenthe of homer which was no indian plant or feigned medicine which epidamnus thoris's wife sent helena for a token as macrobius gropius gregorius nathianzen and others suppose but opportunity of speech for helena's bowl medea's unction venus's girdle circe's cup cannot so enchant so forcibly move or alter as it doth a letter sent or read will do as much multum alievo cum tuas literas lego i am much eased as tully wrote to pomponius atticus when i read thy letters and as Julianus the apostate once signified to Maximus the philosopher, as Alexander slept with Homer's works, so do I with thine epistles. Tanquam peoniis medicamentis, eesque assidue tanquam, recentes et novas iteramus, scribe ergo, et assidue scribe, or else come thyself. Amicus ad amicum venies assuredly a wise and well-spoken man may do what he will in such a case a good orator alone as tully holds can alter affections by power of his eloquence comfort such as are afflicted erect such as are depressed expel and mitigate fear lust anger etc and how powerful is the charm of a discreet and dear friend ille regit dictus animus et temperat iras what may he not effect as Cremes told Manidemus, Fear not, conceal it not, O friend, but tell me what it is that troubles thee, and I shall surely help thee by comfort, counsel, or in the matter itself. Arnoldus speaks of a usurer in his time, that upon a loss, much melancholy and discontent, was so cured. 
as imagination, fear, grief, cause such passions, so conceits alone, rectified by good hope, counsel, etc., are able again to help. And tis incredible how much they can do in such a case, as Trincavelius illustrates by an example of a patient of his, Porphyrius the philosopher, in Plotinus's life, written by him, relates that being in a discontented humour through insufferable anguish of mind, he was going to make away himself. But meeting by chance his master Plotinus, who perceiving by his distracted looks all was not well, urged him to confess his grief, which when he had heard, he used such comfortable speeches that he redeemed him a falcivus erebi, pacified his unquiet mind, insomuch that he was easily reconciled to himself and much abashed to think afterwards that he should ever entertain so vile a motion. By all means, therefore, fair promises, good words, gentle persuasions are to be used, not to be too rigorous at first, or to insult over them, not to deride, neglect, or contemn, but rather, as Lemnius exhorteth, to pity, and by all plausible means to seek to redress them. But if satisfaction may not be had, mild courses, promises, comfortable speeches, and good counsel will not take place. Then, as Christophorus Avega determines, Book 3, Chapter 14, De Melancholia, to handle them more roughly, to threaten and chide, saith Altomarus, terrify sometimes, or as Salvianus will have them, to be lashed and whipped, as we do by a starting horse, that is affrighted without a cause, or as Rassus adviseth, one while to speak fair and flatter, another while to terrify and chide, as they shall see cause. When none of these precedent remedies will avail, it will not be amiss, which Savonarola and Alien Montaltus so much commend, clavum clavo pelere, to drive out one passion with another, or by some contrary passion, as they do bleeding at nose by letting blood in the arm, to expel one fear with another, one grief with another. Christophorus a Vega accounts it rational physic, non alienum a ratione, and Lemnius much approves it, to use a hard wedge to a hard knot, to drive out one disease with another, to pull out a tooth, or wound him, to geld him, saith Platerus, as they did epileptical patients of old, because it quite alters the temperature, that the pain of the one may mitigate the grief of the other, and I knew one that was so cured of a quartan ague, by the sudden coming of his enemies upon him. If we may believe Pliny, whom Scaliger calls Mendaciorum Patrem, the father of lies, Quintus Fabius Maximus, that renowned consul of Rome, in a battle fought with the king of the Alloborges at the river Isaurus, was so rid of a quartan ague. Valesius, in his controversies, holds this an excellent remedy, and if it be discreetly used in this malady, better than any physic. Sometimes again, by some feigned lie, strange news, witty device, artificial invention, it is not amiss to deceive them. As they hate those, says Alexander, that neglect or deride, so they will give ear to such as will soothe them up. If they say they have swallowed frogs or a snake, by all means grant it, and tell them you can easily cure it. Tis an ordinary thing. Philodotus, the physician, cured a melancholy king that thought his head was off by putting a leaden cap thereon. The weight made him perceive it and freed him of his fond imagination. A woman in the said Alexander swallowed a serpent as she thought. He gave her a vomit and conveyed a serpent, such as she conceived, into the basin. Upon the sight of it she was amended. The pleasantest dotage that ever I read, saith Laurentius, was of a gentleman at Senes in Italy, who was afraid to piss, lest all the town be drowned. The physicians caused the bell to be rung backward, and told him the town was on fire, whereupon he made water and was immediately cured. Another supposed his nose so big that he should dash it against the wall if he stirred. His physician took a great piece of flesh, and holding it in his hand, pinched him by the nose, making him believe that flesh was cut from it. Forestus had a melancholy patient who thought he was dead. He put a fellow in a chest like a dead man by his bedside and made him rear himself a little and eat. 
the melancholy man asked the counterfeit whether dead men used to eat meat. He told him yea, whereupon he did eat likewise and was cured. Lemnius hath many such instances, and Jovianus Pontanus, but amongst the rest I find one most memorable, registered in the French chronicle of an advocate of Paris before mentioned, who believed verily he was dead, etc. I read a multitude of examples of melancholy men, cured by such artificial inventions. Subsection 3. Music a Remedy Many and sundry are the means which philosophers and physicians have prescribed to exhilarate a sorrowful heart, to divert those fixed and intent cares and meditations, which in this malady so much offend, but in my judgment none so present, none so powerful, none so apposite as a cup of strong drink, mirth, music, and merry company. Ecclesiasticus 40.20 Wine and music rejoice the heart. Rassus, Altomarus, Aelianus, Montaltus, Ficinus, Benedictus Victor, Faventinus are almost immoderate in the commendation of it. A most forcible medicine, Jacinus calls it. Jason Pratensis, a most admirable thing, and worthy of consideration, that can so mollify the mind, and stay those tempestuous affections of it. Musica et Mentis medicina moestae, a roaring med against melancholy, to rear and revive the languishing soul, affecting not only the ears, but the very arteries, the vital and animal spirits. It erects the mind and makes it nimble. Lemnius chapter 44. This it will effect in the most dull, severe and sorrowful souls, expel grief with mirth, and if there be any clouds, dust, or dregs of cares yet lurking in our thoughts, most powerfully it wipes them all away, and that which is more, it will perform all this in an instant. Cheer up the countenance, expel austerity, bring in hilarity, inform our manners, mitigate anger. Athenaeus calleth it an infinite treasure to such as are endowed with it. Dulcisonum reficit tristia corda melos. Eobanus Hesus, many other properties, Cassiodorus Epistle 4, reckons up of this our divine music, not only to expel the greatest griefs, but it doth extenuate fears and furies, appeaseth cruelty, abateth heaviness, and to such as are watchful it causeth quiet rest, it takes away spleen and hatred, be it instrumental, vocal, with strings, wind, cry, a spiritu sine manuum dexteritate gubernator, etc. It cures all irksomeness and heaviness of the soul. Labouring men that sing to their work can tell as much, and so can soldiers when they go to fight, whom terror of death cannot so much affright as the sound of trumpet, drum, fife, and such like music animate. Metis enim mortis, as Censorinus informeth us, musica depellitor, it makes a child quiet. The nurse's song, and many times the sound of a trumpet on a sudden, bells ringing, a carman's whistle, a boy singing some ballad tune early in the streets, alters, revives, recreates a restless patient that cannot sleep in the night, etc. In a word, it is so powerful a thing that it ravisheth the soul, Regina sensum, the queen of the senses, by sweet pleasure, which is a happy cure and corporal tunes pacify our incorporeal soul, sine ore loquem, dominatum in animam exercet, and carries it beyond itself, helps, elevates, extends it. Gallagher gives a reason of these effects, because the spirits about the heart take in that trembling and dancing air into the body, are moved together and stirred up with it, or else the mind, as some suppose harmonically composed, is roused up at the tunes of music. And tis not only men that are so affected, but almost all other creatures. You know the tale of Hercules Gallus, Orpheus, and Amphion, Felices Animus, Ovid calls them, that could saxa movere sone testudinis, etc., make stocks and stones, as well as beasts and other animals, dance after their pipes. The dog and the hare, wolf and lamb, Vicinumque lupo praebuit agna latus, clamosus gracilus, stridula cornix. 
et jovis aquila as philostratus describes it in his images stood all gaping upon orpheus and trees pulled up by the roots came to hear him et comitem quercum penis amica trahit arion made fishes follow him which as common experience evinceth are much affected with music all singing birds are much pleased with it especially nightingales if we may believe calcagninus and bees amongst the rest though they be flying away when they hear any tingling sound will tarry behind hearts hinds horses dogs bears are exceedingly delighted with it scaliger exercise 302 elephants agrippa adds librum 2 capitus 24 and in lydia in the midst of a lake there be certain floating islands if you will believe it that after music will dance but to leave all declamatory speeches in praise of divine music i will confine myself to my proper subject besides that excellent power it hath to expel many other diseases it is a sovereign remedy against despair and melancholy and will drive away the devil himself canus a rhodian fiddler in philostratus when apollonius was inquisitive to know what he could do with his pipe told him that he would make a melancholy man merry and him that was merry much merrier than before a lover more enamoured a religious man more devout ismenius the theban chiron the centaur is said to have cured this and many other diseases by music alone as now they do those saith bodine that are troubled with st vitus's bedlam dance timotheus the musician compelled alexander to skip up and down and leave his dinner like the tale of the friar and the boy whom augustine de civitati gay book seventeen chapter fourteen so much commends for it who hath not heard how david's harmony drove away the evil spirits from king saul one samuel sixteen and elisha when he was much troubled by importunate kings called for a minstrel and when he played the hand of the lord came upon him two kings three Censorinus reports how Asclepiades, the physician, helped many frantic persons by this means. Phrenetic Gorum mentes morbo turbatus. Jason Pratensis hath many examples, how Clinius and Empedocles cured some desperately melancholy, and some mad by this our music, which, because it hath such excellent virtues, be like Homer brings in Themius playing, and the muses singing at the banquet of the gods, Aristotle, Politics, Book 8, Chapter 5, Plato, Book 2, De Legibus, highly approve it, and so do all politicians. The Greeks, Romans, have graced music, and made it one of the liberal sciences. Though it be now become mercenary, all civil commonwealths allow it, Cnaeus Manlius, as Livius relates, Anno ab urbe condita, brought first out of Asia to Rome singing wenches, players, jesters and all kinds of music to their feasts your princes emperors and persons of any quality maintain it in their courts no mirth without music sir thomas more in his absolutely utopian commonwealth allows music as an appendix to every meal and that throughout to all sorts epictetus calls mensa mutum praeceppi a table without music a manger for the concert of musicians at a banquet is a carbuncle set in gold, and as the signet of an emerald well trimmed with gold, so is the melody of music in a pleasant banquet. Ecclesiasticus 32, 5, 6. Louis XI, when he invited Edward IV to come to Paris, told him that, as a principal part of his entertainment, he should hear sweet voices of children, Ionic and Lydian tunes, exquisite music. He should have a and the cardinal of bourbon to be his confessor which he used as a most plausible argument as to a sensual man indeed it is lucian in his book de saltatione is not ashamed to confess that he took infinite delight in singing dancing music women's company and such like pleasures and if thou saith he didst but hear them play and dance i know thou wouldst be so well pleased with the object that thou would dance for company thyself without doubt thou wilt be taken with it so scaliger ingenuously confesseth i am beyond all measure affected with music i do most willingly behold them dance 
I am mightily detained and allured with the grace and comeliness of fair women. I am well pleased to be idle amongst them. And what young man is not? As it is acceptable and conducing to most, so especially to a melancholy man, provided always his disease proceed not originally from it, that he be not some light immorato, some idle fantastic, who capers in conceit all day long, and thinks of nothing else but how to make jigs, sonnets, madrigals, in commendation of his mistress. In such cases music is most pernicious, as a spur to a free horse will make him run himself blind, or break his wind, in caitamentum enim amoris musica, for music enchants, as Menander holds, it will make such melancholy persons mad, and the sound of those jigs and hornpipes will not be removed out of the ears a week after. Plato, for this reason, forbids music and wine to all young men, because they are most part amorous, ne ignis adato igni, lest one fire increase another. Many men are melancholy by hearing music, but it is a pleasing melancholy that it causes, and therefore to such as are discontent, in woe, fear, sorrow, or dejected, it is a most pleasant remedy. It expels cares, alters their grieved minds, and easeth in an instant. Otherwise, saith Plutarch, musica magis dementat quam vinum. Music makes some men mad as a tiger. Like Astolfos's horn in Ariosto, or Mercury's golden wand in Homer, that made some wake, others sleep, it hath diverse effects, and Theophrastus right well prophesied that diseases were either procured by music or mitigated. End of section 17 Section 18 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2 by Robert Burton, Section 18. Partition 2, Section 2, Member 6, Subsection 4. Mirth and Merry Company, Fair Objects, Remedies. Mirth and Merry Company may not be separated from music both concerning and necessarily required in this business. Mirth, says Vives, purgeth the blood, confirms health, causeth a fresh, pleasing and fine colour, for rogues life, wets the wit, makes the body young, lively and fit for any manner of employment. The merrier the heart, the longer the life. A merry heart is the life of the flesh, Proverbs 14.13. Gladness prolonged his days, Ecclesiasticus 30.22, and this is one of the three Salernitan doctors, Dr. Merriman, Dr. Diet, Dr. Quiet, which cure all diseases, mens hilares, requies, moderata dieta. Jonesus is a great magnifier of honest mirth, by which, saith he, we cure many passions of the mind in ourselves and in our friends which Galateus assigns for a cause why we love merry companions, and well they deserve it, being that, as Magninus holds, a merry companion is better than any music, and as the saying is, comes jucundus in via pro vehiculo, as a wagon to him that is wearied on the way. Jucunda confabulatio, sales, jocai, pleasant discourse, jests, conceits, merry tales. Meliti verborum globuli, as Petronius, Pliny, Spondanus, Caelius, and many good authors plead, are that sole Nepenthes of Homer, Helena's bowl, Venus's girdle, so renowned of old to expel grief and care, to cause mirth and gladness of heart, if they be rightly understood or seasonably applied. In a word, amor voluptas, venus, gaudium, Jocus ludus sermo suavis suaviatio. Gratification, pleasure, love, joy, mirth, sport, pleasant words, and no alloy, are the true nepenthes. 
for these causes our physicians generally prescribe this as a principal engine to batter the walls of melancholy, a chief antidote and a sufficient cure of itself. By all means, saith Mesway, procure mirth to these men in such things as are heard, seen, tasted, or smelled, or any way perceived, and let them have all enticements and fair promises. The sigh of excellent beauties, attires, ornaments, delightsome passages to distract their minds from fear and sorrow, and such things on which they are so fixed and intent. Let them use hunting, sports, plays, jests, merry company, as Rassus prescribes, which will not let the mind be molested, a cup of good drink now and then, hear music, and have such companions with whom they are especially delighted, merry tales or toys, drinking, singing, dancing, and whatsoever else may procure mirth, and by no means, says Guianerius, suffer them to be alone. Benedictus Victorius Faventinus, in his empirics, accounts it an especial remedy against melancholy, to hear and see singing, dancing, maskers, mummers, to converse with such merry fellows and fair maids. For the beauty of woman cheereth the countenance. Ecclesiasticus 36.22 Beauty alone is a sovereign remedy against fear, grief, and all melancholy fits. A charm, as Peter de la Seine and many other writers affirm, a banquet itself. He gives instance in the discontented Menelaus, that was so often freed by Helena's fair face, and Tully, three Tusculans, cites Epicurus as a chief patron of this tenet. To expel grief and procure pleasure, sweet smells, good diet, touch, taste, embracing, singing, dancing, sports, plays, and above the rest, exquisite beauties, quibus oculi jucunde moventur et animae, are the most powerful means, obvia forma, to meet or see a fair maid pass by, or to be in company with her. He found it by experience, and made good use of it in his own person, if Plutarch belie him not for he reckons up the names of some more elegant pieces, Leontia, Brodina, Hedieia, Nicadia, that were frequently seen in Epicurus's garden, and very familiar in his house. Neither did he try it himself alone, but if we may give credit to Athenaeus, he practised it upon others. For when a sad and sick patient was brought unto him to be cured, he laid him on a down bed crowned him with a garland of sweet-smelling flowers, in the fair perfumed closet delicately set out, and after a portion or two of good drink which he administered, he brought in a beautiful young wench that could play upon a lute, sing and dance, etc. Tully, three Tusculans, scoffs at Epicurus, for this his profane physic, as well he deserved, and yet Favorinus and Stobius highly approve of it. Most of our looser physicians in some cases to such parties especially, allow of this, and all of them will have a melancholy sad and discontented person make frequent use of honest sports, companies, and recreations, et incitandos ad venerum, as Rodericus a Fonseca will, aspectu et contractu pulcherimarum verminarum, to be drawn to such consults, whether they will or no, not to be an auditor only, or a spectator, but sometimes an actor himself, dulce est decipere in loco, to play the fool now and then is not amiss, there is a time for all things. Grave Socrates would be merry by fits, sing, dance, and take his liquor too, or else Theodoret belies him. So would old Cato, Tully by his own confession, and the rest. Xenophon, in his Symposium, brings in Socrates as a principal actor, no man merrier than himself, and sometimes he would ride a cock-horse with his children, equitare in arundine longa, though Alcibiades scoffed at him for it, and well he might, for now and then, saith Plutarch, the most virtuous, honest, and gravest men will use feasts, jests, and toys, as we do sauce to our meats. So did Scipio and Laelius, et scena in secreta remorant, virtus scipiadae et mitis sapienta laidi. 
nugari cum illo, et discinti ludere, donec decoqueritur olus, soliti. Valorous Scipio and gentle Laelius, removed from the scene and rout so clamorous, were wont to recreate themselves their robes laid by, whilst supper the cook was making ready. Machiavel, in the eighth book of his Florentine history, gives this note of Cosmo de' Medici, the wisest and gravest man of his time in Italy, that he would now and then play the most egregious fool in his carriage, and was so much given to jesters, players, and childish sports, to make himself merry, that he that should but consider his gravity on the one part, his folly and lightness on the other, would surely say there were two distinct persons in him. Now methinks he did well in it, though Salisburiensis be of opinion, that magistrates, senators, and grave men should not descend to lighter sports, ne res publica ludere vidiator, but, as Themistocles, still keep a stern and constant carriage. I commend Cosmo de' Medici and Castruccius Castrucanus, than whom Italy never knew a worthier captain, another Alexander. If Machiavel do not deceive us in his life, when a friend of his reprehended him for dancing beside his dignity, belike at some cushion dance, he told him again, Qui sapit inter diu, vix unquam noctii desipit. He that is wise in the day may dote a little in the night. Paulus Jovius relates a much of Pope Leo Decimus, that he was a grave, discreet, stead man, yet sometimes most free, and too open in his sports. And tis not altogether unfit or misbeseeming the gravity of such a man, if that decorum of time, place, and such circumstances be observed. Misce stultiatiam consiliis brevem, and as he said in an epigram to his wife, I would have every man say to himself or to his friend, Moll, once in pleasant company by chance, I wish that you for company would dance, which you refused and said, Your years require, now matron-like both manners and attire. Well, Moll, if needs you will be matron-like, then trust to this, I will be matron-like. Yet so to you, my love, may never lessen, as you for church, house, bed, observe this lesson. Sit in the church as solemn as a saint, no deed, word, thought, your due devotion taint. Veil, if you will, your head, your soul reveal to him that only wounded souls can heal. Be in my house as busy as a bee, having a sting for every one but me, buzzing in every corner, gathering honey. Let nothing waste that costs or yieldeth money. And when thou seest my heart to mirth incline, Thy tongue, wit, blood, warm with good cheer and wine, Then of sweet sports let no occasion scape, But be as wanton, toying as an ape. Those old Greeks had the Lubentium, Deum, goddess of pleasure, And the Lacedaemonians, instructed from Lycurgus, Did Deo Risui Sacrificare, after their wars especially, And in times of peace, which was used in Thessaly, as it appears by that of Apuleius, who was made an instrument of their laughter himself, because laughter and merriment was to season their labours and modester life. Resum enim divum atque, hominum est eterna voluptus. Princes use jesters, players, and have those masters of revels in their courts. The Romans at every supper, for they had no solemn dinner, used music, gladiators, jesters, etc., as Suetonius relates of Tiberius, Dion of Commodus, and so did the Greeks. Besides music, in Xenophon Simpus, Philippus Videndi Artifex, Philip a jester, was brought to make sport. Paulus Jovius, in the eleventh book of his history, hath a pretty digression of our English customs, which, howsoever some may misconstrue, I for my part will interpret to the best. The whole nation, beyond all other mortal men, is most given to banqueting and feasts, for they prolong them many hours together, with dainty cheer, exquisite music, and facete jesters, and afterwards they fall a-dancing and courting their mistresses, till it be late in the night. Volaterin gives the same testimony of this island, 
commending our jovial manner of entertainment and good mirth, and methinks he saith well. There is no harm in it, long may they use it, and all such modest sports. Tesius reports of a Persian king that had a hundred and fifty maids attending at his table, to play, sing, and dance by turns, and Geraldus of an Egyptian prince that kept nine virgins still to wait upon him, and those of most excellent feature and sweet voices, which afterwards gave occasion to the Greeks of that fiction of the nine muses. The king of Ethiopia in Africa, most of our Asian princes have done so and do, those Sophies, Mogors, Turks, etc., solace themselves after supper amongst their queens and concubines. Quae jucundioris oblecta mente causa, saith mine author, corum rege psalere et saltere consueverant, taking great pleasure to see and hear them sing and dance. This, and many such means to exhilarate the heart of men, have been still practised in all ages, as knowing there is no better thing to the preservation of man's life. What shall I say then, but to every melancholy man? Utere convivis, non tristibus utere amicis, quos luge et risus, et joca salsa juvant. Feast often, and use friends not still so sad, whose jests and merriments may make thee glad. Use honest and chaste sports, cynical shows, plays, games. Accedant juvenuque cori, mistaeque puellae, and as Marsilius Ficinus concludes an epistle to Bernardus Canisianus, and some other of his friends, will I this tract to all good students. Live merrily, O oh my friends, free from cares, perplexity, anguish, grief of mind. Live merrily. Laetitia Caelum vos creavit. Again and again I request you to be merry. If anything trouble your hearts or vex your souls, neglect and contemn it, let it pass. And this I enjoin you, not as a divine alone, but as a physician. For without this mirth, which is the life and quintessence of physic, medicines and whatsoever is used and applied to prolong the life of man, is dull, dead, and of no force. Dum fata sinunt, vivite laeti, Seneca, I say, be merry. Nec lucibus virentem, viduemus hanc juventum. It was Tiresias the prophet's counsel to Menippus, that travelled all the world over, even down to hell itself to seek content, and his last farewell to Menippus, to be merry. Contemn the world, saith he, and count that is in it vanity and toys. This only covet all thy life long. Be not curious or over-solicitous in anything, but with a well-composed and contented estate to enjoy thyself, and above all things to be merry. Sic numerus uti censet sine amore jocisque, nil est jucundum vivas in amore jocisque. Nothing better, to conclude with Solomon, Ecclesiastic 3.22, than that a man should rejoice in his affairs. Tis the same advice which every physician in this case rings to his patient, as Capivaccius to his, avoid overmuch study and perturbations of the mind, and as much as in thee lives, live at heart's ease. Prosper Calenus to that melancholy cardinal Cassius, amidst thy serious studies and business, use jests and conceits, plays and toys, and whatsoever else may recreate thy mind. Nothing better than mirth and merry company in this malady. It begins with sorrow, saith Montanus. It must be expelled with hilarity. But see the mischief. Many men, knowing that merry company is the only medicine against melancholy, will therefore neglect their business, and in another extreme, spend all their days among good fellows in a tavern or an alehouse, and know not otherwise how to bestow their time but in drinking, malt worms, men fishes, or water snakes, qui bibunt solum ranarum more, nihil comedentes, like so many frogs in a puddle. Tis their sole exercise to eat and drink, to sacrifice to volupia, rumina, edulica, potina, 
Milona, is all their religion. They wish for Philoxenus's neck, Jupiter's trinoctium, and that the sun would stand still, as in Joshua's time, to satisfy their lust, that they might dies notesque per graecari et bibere. Flourishing wits, and men of good parts, good fashion, and good worth, basely prostitute themselves to every rogue's company, to take tobacco and drink, to roar and sing scurrilous songs in base places. In venies aliquem cum percursore jacentem, permistum nautis, aut furibus, aut fugitivis, which Thomas Erastus objects to Paracelsus, that he would be drinking all day long with Carmen and tapsters in a brothel house, is too frequent among us with men of better note, like Timocreon of Rhodes, multa bibens et multa vorans, etc. They drown their wits, seethe their brains in ale, consume their fortunes, lose their time, weaken their temperatures, contract filthy diseases, wounds, dropsies, calentures, tremor, get swollen jugulars, pimpled red faces, sore eyes, etc., heat their livers, alter their complexions, spoil their stomachs, overthrow their bodies, for drink drowns more than the sea and all the rivers that fall into it, mere funges and casks, confound their souls, suppress reason, go from Scylla to Charybdis, and use that which is a help to their undoing. Quid refert morbo and ferro periamve ruina. When the black prince went to set the exiled king of Castile into his kingdom, there was a terrible battle fought between the English and the Spanish. At last the Spanish fled. The English followed them to the riverside, where some drowned themselves to avoid their enemies. The rest were killed. Now tell me what difference is between drowning and killing. As good be melancholy still as drunken beasts and beggars. Company a sole comfort and an only remedy to all kinds of discontent is their sole misery and cause of perdition. As Hermione lamented in Euripides, Malae mulieres me fecerent malum. Evil company marred her. May they justly complain. Bad companions have been their bane. For malus malum vult utsit sui similis. One drunkard in a company, one thief, one whoremaster, will by his good will make all the rest as bad as himself. Et si nocturnus jures te formidare vapores. Be of what complexion you will, inclination, love or hate, be it good or bad, if you do come amongst them, you must do as they do, yea, though it be to the prejudice of your health, you must drink venenum pro vino, and so like grasshoppers, whilst they sing over their cups all summer, they starve in winter, and for a little vain merriment shall find a sorrowful reckoning in the end. End of section 18Section 19 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2 by Robert Burton, Section 19. Partition 2, Section 3, Member 1. A consolatory digression, containing the remedies of all manner of discontents. Because in the preceding section I have made mention of good counsel, comfortable speeches, persuasion, how necessarily they are required to the cure of the discontented or troubled mind, how pleasant a remedy they yield, and many times a sole sufficient cure of themselves. I have thought fit in this following section a little to digress, if at least it be to digress in this subject, to collect and glean a few remedies and comfortable speeches out of our best orators, philosophers, divines and fathers of the church, tending to this purpose. I confess many have copiously written of this subject. Plato, Seneca, Plutarch, Xenophon, Epictetus, Theophrastus, Xenocrates, Grantor, Lucian, 
Berthius, and some of late, Sadolitus, Cardan, Budaeus, Stella, Petrarch, Erasmus, besides Austin, Cyprian, Bernard, etc., and they so well, that as Hieromi in like case said, Si nostrum araret ingenium, de illorum posset fontibus irrigari. If our barren wits were dried up, they might be copiously irrigated from these wellsprings, and I shall but actum agere. Yet, because these tracts are not so obvious and common, I will epitomise, and briefly insert some of their divine precepts reducing their voluminous and vast treaties to my small scale, for it were otherwise impossible to bring so great vessels into so little a creek. And although, as Cardan said of his book De Consolatione, I know beforehand this tract of mine many will contemn and reject, they that are fortunate, happy, and in flourishing estate have no need of such consolatory speeches. They that are miserable and unhappy think them insufficient to ease their grieved minds and comfort their misery. Yet I will go on, for this must needs do some good to such as are happy to bring them to a moderation and make them reflect and know themselves by seeing the inconstancy of human felicity, others' misery, and to such as are distressed, if they will but attend and consider of this. It cannot choose but give some content and comfort. Tis true, no medicine can cure all diseases. Some affections of the mind are altogether incurable. Yet these helps of art, physic, and philosophy must not be contemned. Arianus and Plotinus are stiff in the contrary opinion, that such precepts can do little good. Berthius himself cannot comfort in some cases. They will reject such speeches like bread of stones. Insana stultae mentis haec solatia. Words add no courage, which Catiline once said to his soldiers, A captain's oration does not make a coward a valiant man. And as Job feelingly said to his friends, You are but miserable comforters all. Tis to no purpose in that vulgar phrase to use a company of obsolete sentences and familiar sayings, as Plinius Secundus, being now sorrowful and heavy for the departure of his dear friend Cornelius Rufus, a Roman senator, wrote to his fellow Tiro in like case. Ad hibe solatia, sed nova aliqua, sed fortia, quae audierim nunquam, legerim nunquam, nam quae audivi, quae legi omnia, tanto dolore superantur. Either say something that I never read nor heard of before, or else hold thy peace. Most men will hear except trivial consolations, ordinary speeches, and known persuasions in this behalf will be of small force. What can any man say that has not been said? To what end are such paranetical discourses? You may as soon remove Mount Caucasus as alter some men's affections. Yet sure I think they cannot choose but do some good, and comfort and ease a little, Though it be the same again, I will say it, and upon that hope I will adventure. Non meus hic sermo, tis not my speech this, but of Seneca, Plutarch, Epictetus, Austin, Bernard, Christ and his apostles. If I make nothing, as Montaigne said in like case, I will mar nothing, tis not my doctrine, but my study. I hope I shall do nobody wrong to speak what I think and deserve not blame in imparting my mind. If it be not for thy ease, it may for mine own. So Tully, Cardan, and Berthius wrote de consolatione, as well to help themselves as others. Be it as it may, I will essay. Discontents and grievances are either general or particular. General are wars, plagues, dearths, famine, fires, inundations, unseasonable weather, epidemical diseases which afflict whole kingdoms, territories, cities, or peculiar to private men, as cares, crosses, losses, death of friends, poverty, want, sickness, orbities, injuries, abuses, etc. Generally all discontent, omnes quatimor fortunae salo, no condition pre, quisque sors patimor manes, 
even in the midst of our mirth and jollity, there is some grudging, some complaint. As he saith, our whole life is a glycipicron, a bitter-sweet passion, honey and gall mixed together. We are all miserable and discontent, who can deny it? If all, and that it be a common calamity, an inevitable necessity, all distressed, then as Cardan infers, who art thou that hopest to go free? Why dost thou not grieve thou art a mortal man, and not governor of the world? Fere quam sortum patiuntur omnes, nemo recuset. If it be common to all, why should one man be more disquieted than another? If thou alone wert distressed, it were indeed more irksome, and less to be endured. But when the calamity is common, comfort thyself with this. Thou hast more fellows. Solomon miseris socios habuisse doloris. Tis not thy sole case, and why shouldst thou be so impatient? Ay, but alas, we are more miserable than others. What shall we do? Besides private miseries, we live in perpetual fear and danger of common enemies. We have Bologna's whips, and pitiful outcries for epithalamiums, for pleasant music, that fearful noise of ordnance, drums, and warlike trumpets still sounding in our ears. Instead of nuptial torches, we have firing of towns and cities, for triumphs, lamentations, for joy, tears. So it is, and so it was, and so it ever will be. He that refuseth to see and hear, to suffer this, is not fit to live in this world, and knows not the common condition of all men, to whom so long as they live, with a reciprocal course, joys and sorrows are annexed, and succeed one another. It is inevitable, it may not be avoided, and why shouldst thou be so much troubled? Grave nihil est homine quod fet necessitas, as Tully deems out of an old poet, that which is necessary cannot be grievous. If it be so, then comfort thyself in this, that whether thou wilt or no, it must be endured, make a virtue of necessity, and conform thyself to undergo it. Si longa est, levis est, si gravis est, brevis est. If it be long, tis light, if grievous, it cannot last, it will away, dies dolorum minuit. And if naught else, time will wear it out, custom will ease it. Oblivion is a common medicine for all losses, injuries, griefs, and detriments whatsoever, and when they are once past, this commodity comes of infelicity. It makes the rest of our life sweeter unto us. Atque haec olim meminisse juvabit. Recollection of the past is pleasant. The privation and want of a thing many times makes it more pleasant and delightsome than before it was. We must not think the happiest of all of us to escape here without some misfortunes. Usque adeo nulla est sincera voluptas, solicitumque aliquid latis intervenit. Heaven and earth are much unlike. Those heavenly bodies indeed are freely carried in their orbs without any impediment or interruption, to continue their course for innumerable ages, and make their conversations. But men are urged with many difficulties, and have diverse hindrances, opposition still crossing, interrupting their endeavours and desires, and no mortal man is free from this law of nature. We must not therefore hope to have all things answer our own expectation, to have a continuance of good success and fortunes. Fortuna nunquam perpetua est bona, and as Minutius Felix, the Roman consul, told that insulting Coriolanus, drunk with his good fortunes, look not for that success thou hast hitherto had, it never yet happened to any man since the beginning of the world, nor ever will to have all things according to his desire, or to whom fortune was never opposite and adverse. Even so it fell out to him as he foretold, and so to others, even to that happiness of Augustus, though he were Jupiter's almoner, Pluto's treasurer, Neptune's admiral, it could not secure him. Such was Alcibiades' fortune. Now Sates, that great Gonsalves, and most famous men, that as Jovius concludes, it is almost fatal to great princes, through their own default or otherwise circumvented with envy and malice, to lose their honours, and die contumeliously. Tis so, 
still hast been, and ever will be. Nihil est ab omni parte beatum. There's no perfection is so absolute, that some impurity does not pollute. Whatsoever is under the moon is subject to corruption, alteration, and so long as thou livest upon earth, look not for other. Thou shalt not here find peaceable and cheerful days, quiet times, but rather clouds, storms, calumnies, such is our fate. And as those errant planets in their distinct orbs have their several motions, sometimes direct, stationary, retrograde, in apogee, perigee, oriental, occidental, combust, feral, free, and as our astrologers will, have their fortitudes and abilities, by reason of those good and bad irradiations, conferred to each other's sight in the heavens, in their terms, houses, case, detriment, etc. So we rise and fall in this world, ebb and flow, in and out, reared and dejected, lead a troublesome life, subject to many accidents and casualties of fortunes, variety of passions, infirmities, as well as from ourselves as others. Yea, but thou thinkest thou art more miserable than the rest. Other men are happy, but in respect of thee, their miseries are but flea-bitings to thine. Thou alone art unhappy, none so bad as thyself. Yet if, as Socrates said, all men in the world should come and bring their grievances together, of body, mind, fortune, sores, ulcers, madness, epilepsies, agues, and all those common calamities of beggary, want, servitude, imprisonment, and lay them on a heap to be equally divided. Wouldst thou share alike and take thy portion, or be as thou art? Without question thou wouldst be as thou art, if some Jupiter should say to give us all content. Yam faciam quod vultis, eris tu, qui modo miles, mercator, tu consultas modo, rusticus hinc vos. Vos hinc mutatis discedite partibus, ea quid slatis, nolint. Well, be it so then, you, master soldier, shall be a merchant, you, sir lawyer, a country gentleman. Go you to this, that side you, why stand ye, it's as well as tis. Every man knows his own, but not another's defects and miseries, and tis the nature of all men still to reflect upon themselves their own misfortunes not to examine or consider other men's, not to compare themselves with others, to recount their miseries, but not their good gifts, fortunes, benefits, which they have, or ruminate on their adversity, but not once to think on their prosperity, not what they have, but what they want, to look still on them that go before, but not on those infinite numbers that come after, whereas many a man would think himself in heaven, a petty prince, if he had but the least part of that fortune which thou so much repinest at, abhorrest and countest, abhorrest and accountest a most vile and wretched estate, how many thousands want that which thou hast? How many myriads of poor slaves, captives, of such as work day and night in coal pits, tin mines, with sore toil to maintain a poor living, of such as labour in body and mind, live in extreme anguish and pain, all which thou art free from. O fortunatus nimium bona si sua norint, thou art most happy if thou couldst be content and acknowledge thy happiness. Rem carendo non fluendo cognoscismus. When thou shalt hereafter come to want that which thou now loathest, abhorrest, and art weary of, and tired with, when tis past, thou wilt say thou wert most happy, and after a little miss, Wish with all thine heart thou hadst the same content again, mightst lead but such a life, a world for such a life. The remembrance of it is pleasant. Be silent then, rest satisfied. Desine, intuensque in aliorum infortunia solare mentum. Comfort thyself with other men's misfortunes, and as the mouldwarp in Aesop told the fox, complaining for want of a tail, and the rest of his companions, tacete, quando me oculis captum videtis. You complain of toys, but I am blind, be quiet. I say to thee, be thou satisfied. 
it is recorded of the hares, that with a general consent they went to drown themselves out of a feeling of their misery, but when they saw a company of frogs more fearful than they were, they began to take courage and comfort again. Compare thine estate with others. Similes aliorum respice castus, mitius is the feres. Be content and rest satisfied, for thou art well in respect to others. Be thankful for that thou hast, that God hath done for thee. He hath not made thee a monster, a beast, a base creature as he might, but a man, a Christian. Such a man consider a right of it. Thou art full well as thou art. Quid quid vult habere nemo potest. No man can have what he will. Illud potest nolle quod non habet. He may choose whether he will desire that which he hath not. Thy lot is fallen. Make the best of it. If we should all sleep at times, as Endymion is said to have done, who then were happier than his fellow? Our life is but short, a very dream, and while we look about immortalitas adest, eternity is at hand. Our life is a pilgrimage on earth, which wise men pass with great alacrity. If thou be in woe, sorrow, want, distress, in pain or sickness, think of that of our apostle. God chastiseth them whom he loveth. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Psalm 126, 6 As the furnace doth prove the potter's vessel, so doth temptation try men's thoughts. Ecclesiastes 25, 5 Tis for thy good. Periisis nisi periisis. Hadst thou not been so visited, thou hadst been utterly undone, as gold in the fire. So men are tried in adversity. Tribulatio ditut, and which Camerarius hath well shadowed in an emblem of a thresher and corn. Si trura absit palius sunt abdita grana, nos crux mundanis separat a palius. As threshing separates from straw the corn, by crosses from the world's chaff are we born. Tis the very same which Chrysostom comments, homily two in three Matthew. Corn is not separated but by threshing, nor men from worldly impediments but by tribulation. Tis that which Cyprian ingeminates, Servius for de immortalitate. Tis that which Hieron, which all the fathers inculcate, so we are catechized for eternity. Tis that which the proverb insinuates, Nocumentum documentum. Tis that which all the world rings in our ears. Deus unicum habet filium sine peccato, nullum sine flagello. God, saith Augustine, hath one son without sin, none without correction. An expert seaman is tried in a tempest, a runner in a race, a captain in a battle, a valiant man in adversity, a Christian in temptation and misery. Basil, homily 8. We are sent as so many soldiers into this world, to strive with it, the flesh, the devil. Our life is a warfare, and who knows it not? Non est ad astra mollis et teres via, and therefore, peradventure this world here is made troublesome unto us, that, as Gregory notes, we should not be delighted by the way, and forget whither we are going. Ite nunc fortes, ubi celsa magni, ducet exempli via, cur inertis terga nudatis, Superata tellus, sidera donat. Go then merrily to heaven. If the way be troublesome and you in misery in many grievances, on the other side you have many pleasant sports, objects, sweet smells, delightsome tastes, music, meats, herbs, flowers, etc., to recreate your senses. Or put case thou art now forsaken of the world, dejected, contemned, yet comfort thyself, as it was said to Agar in the wilderness, God sees thee, he takes notice of thee. There is a God above that can vindicate thy cause, that can relieve thee. And surely Seneca thinks he takes delight in seeing thee. The gods are well pleased when they see great men contending with adversity, as we are to see men fight, or a man with a beast. But these are toys in respect. Behold, saith he, a spectacle worthy of God 
a good man contented with his estate. A tyrant is the best sacrifice to Jupiter, as the ancients held, and his best object a contented mind. For thy part then rest satisfied, cast all thy care on him, thy burthen on him, rely on him, trust on him, and he shall nourish thee, care for thee, give thee thine heart's desire. Say with David, God is our hope and strength, in troubles ready to be found. Psalm 46, one. For they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed. Psalm 124, 1, 2. As the mountains are about Jerusalem, so is the Lord about his people, from henceforth and for ever. End of section 19. Section 20 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 2, by Robert Burton. Section 20. Partition 2, Section 3, Member 2, Part 1. Deformity of body, sickness, baseness of birth, peculiar discontents. Particular discontents and grievances are either of body, mind, or fortune, which, as they wound the soul of man, produce this melancholy, and many great inconveniences, by that antidote of good counsel and persuasion, may be eased or expelled. Deformities and imperfections of our bodies, as lameness, crookedness, deafness, blindness, be they innate or accidental, torture many men. Yet this may comfort them, that those imperfections of the body do not a whit blemish the soul, or hinder the operations of it, but rather help and much increase it. Thou art lame of body, deformed to the eye, yet this hinders not but that thou mayest be a good, a wise, upright, honest man. Seldom, saith Plutarch, honesty and beauty dwell together, and oftentimes under a threadbare coat lies an excellent understanding. Saipe sub atrita latita sapientia veste. Cornelius Musus, that famous preacher in Italy, when he came first into the pulpit in Venice, was so much contemned by reason of his outside, a little, lean, poor, dejected person, they were all ready to leave the church. But when they heard his voice, they did admire him, and happy was that senator could enjoy his company, or invite him first to his house. A silly fellow to look to may have more wit, learning, honesty, than he that struts it out, ampulis yactans, etc., grandia gradiens, and is admired in the world's opinion. Wilis saipe cadus nobile nectar habet, the best wine comes out of an old vessel. How many deformed princes, kings, emperors could I reckon up, philosophers, orators, Hannibal had but one eye, Appius Claudius, Timoleon, blind, Mullias, king of Tunis, John, king of Bohemia, Tiresias the prophet. The knight hath his pleasure, and for the loss of that one sense such men are commonly recompensed in the rest. They have excellent memories, other good parts, music, and many recreations. Much happiness, great wisdom, as Tully well discourseth in his Tusculan questions. Homer was blind, yet who, saith he, made more accurate, lively, or better descriptions with both his eyes? Democritus was blind, yet, as Laertius writes of him, he saw more than all Greece besides, as Plato concludes, Tum sane mentis oculus acute incipit cernere, cum primum corporis oculus deflorescit. When our bodily eyes are at worst, Generally, the eyes of our soul see best. Some philosophers and divines have avirated themselves, and put out their eyes voluntarily, the better to contemplate. Angelus Politianus had a tetter in his nose continually running, fulsome in company, yet no man so eloquent and pleasing in his works. Aesop was crooked, Socrates purblind, long-legged, hairy, Democritus withered, 
Seneca, lean and harsh, ugly to behold, yet show me so many flourishing wits, such divine spirits. Horace, a little blear-eyed, contemptible fellow, yet who so sententious and wise? Marsilius Picinus, Faber Sapulensis, a couple of dwarfs, Melanchthon, a short, hard-favoured man, Parvus erat, sed Magnus erat, etc., yet of incomparable parts, all three. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, by reason of a hurt he received in his leg, at the siege of Pampeluna, the chief town of Navarre in Spain, unfit for wars and less serviceable at court, upon that accident betook himself to his beads, and by those means got more honour than ever he should have done with the use of his limbs and properness of person. Vulnus non penetrat animum, a wound hurts not the soul. Galba, the emperor, was crook-backed, Epictetus lame, that great Alexander, a little man of stature, Augustus Caesar, of the same pitch, Agesilaus despicabili forma, Bocaris, a most deformed prince as ever Egypt had, yet, as Diodorus Siculus records of him, in wisdom and knowledge far beyond his predecessors. Uladislaus Cubitalis, that pygmy king of Poland, reigned and fought more victorious battles than any of his long-shanked predecessors. Nullam virtus respuit staturam, virtue refuseth no stature, and commonly your great vast bodies and fine features are sottish, dull, and leaden spirits. What's in them? Quid nisi pondus iners stolidaeque ferocia mentis? What in Ossus and Ephialtes, Neptune's sons in Homer, nine acres long? Qui ut magnus orion cum pedes incedit, medii per maxima nerei stagna, viam findens humero supereminet undas? Like tall Orion stalking o'er the flood, when with his brawny breast he cuts the waves, his shoulder scarce the topmost below laves. What in Maximinus, Ajax, Caligula, and the rest of those great Zanzumins, or gigantical Anakims, heavy, vast, barbarous lubbers? Si membra tibi dant grandia parcae mentis eges? Their body, saith Lemnius, is a burden to them, and their spirits not so lively, nor they so erect and merry. Non est in magno corpore mica salis, a little diamond is more worth than a rocky mountain, which made Alexander Aphrodisius positively conclude the lesser the wiser, because the soul was more contracted in such a body. Let Bodine plead the rest. The lesser they are, as in Asia, Greece, they have generally the finest wits. And for bodily stature, which some so much admire, and goodly presence, tis true, to say the best of them, Great men are proper, and tall, I grant, caput inter nubila condunt, hide their heads in the clouds, but belli pusilli, little men are pretty, sed si bellus homo est cotta, pusillus homo est. Sickness, diseases, trouble many, but without a cause, it may be, tis for the good of their souls, pars fati fuit, the flesh rebels against the spirit, that which hurts the one, must needs help the other. Sickness is the mother of modesty, putteth us in mind of our mortality, and when we are in the full career of worldly pomp and jollity, she pulleth us by the ear, and maketh us know ourselves. Pliny calls it the sum of philosophy. If we could but perform that in our health, which we promise in our sickness, cum infirmi sumus optimi sumus, for what sick man? as Secundus expostulates with Rufus, was ever lascivious, covetous, or ambitious. He envies no man, admires no man, flatters no man, despiseth no man, listens not after lies and tales, etc. And were it not for such gentle remembrances, men would have no moderation of themselves. They would be worse than tigers, wolves, and lions. Who should keep them in awe? Princes, masters, parents, magistrates, judges, friends, enemies, fair or foul means, cannot contain us, but a little sickness, as Chrysostom observes, will correct and amend us. 
and therefore with good discretion jovianus pontanus caused this short sentence to be engraven on his tomb in naples labour sorrow grief sickness want and woe to serve proud masters bear that superstitious yoke and bury your dearest friends etc are the sources of our life if thy disease be continuate and painful to thee it will not surely last and a light affliction which is but for a moment causeth unto us a far more excellent and eternal weight of glory two corinthians four seventeen bear it with patience women endure much sorrow in childbed and yet they will not contain and those that are barren wish for this pain be courageous there is as much valour to be shown in thy bed as in an army or at a sea fight out winketur out winket thou shalt be rid at last in the meantime let it take its course thy mind is not any way disabled bilibaldus pircimerus senator to charles v ruled all germany lying most part of his days sick of the gout upon his bed the more violent thy torture is the less it will continue and though it be severe and hideous for the time comfort thyself as martyrs do with honour and immortality that famous philosopher epicurus being in as miserable pain of stone and colic as a man might endure solaced himself with a conceit of immortality the joy of his soul for his rare inventions repelled the pain of his bodily torments end of section twenty